Chapter 35 Sarah It was hard for me to believe that two more years had passed and I still had not become pregnant. Bo and I had made love several times a week during all that time. We had almost given up hope. But Daddy's long face and the way he got misty-eyed around other people's grandchildren was the main reason we kept trying so hard. My last two periods had been very light, and I'd been feeling lightheaded and weak a few times during those two months. But I had experienced similar symptoms before, even when I wasn't sexually active, so I hadn't given it much thought. My annual visit to my OBGYN for a routine checkup was coming up soon, so I made a mental note to mention my symptoms to him. On the day of my appointment, I treated my friend Mabel Cundiff to lunch at the E&O restaurant, one of the best places in town when it came to exotic Asian cuisine. Mabel and I had attended the same boarding school. She had recently married and moved to the Bay Area. You look so tired and puffy, she said as we enjoyed our fried rice, veggies, and blackened prawns and white wine. Mabel's husband was a doctor, so she paid close attention to things like how other people looked. Are you all right? I hope I am, I replied as I speared another prawn with my fork. But if something is wrong, I'm sure Dr. Parker will tell me when I see him this afternoon. I have been feeling funny, though. It seems like no matter what I do, I ache somewhere. I said, chewing on the prawn, even though my jawbone was aching now. I've had this weird, sharp, burning pain in my stomach for the past two days. Mabel's big brown eyes got even bigger. Her sharp little nose began to twitch like a rabbit. She gave me such a mournful look. You would have thought that I just told her I was dying. Uh-oh, that's the same kind of pain my mother had just before she died. She warned. I feel sorry for you. I froze. I suddenly lost my appetite, so I set my fork down and pushed my plate to the side. I thought your mother died of cancer. She did. That weird, sharp, burning pain in her stomach was cancer of the intestines. Nobody in my family has ever had cancer, I pointed out. So? Mabel shoved a huge forkful of bok choy into her mouth. I couldn't believe she was still able to eat like a hog and at the same time talk to me like I was about to be embalmed. That doesn't mean anything. Nobody in my family ever had cancer either before my mother. You know us black folks. With all the greasy pork and cow parts our ancestors ate, we are bound to inherit some of the ailments that killed them. Yeah, I mumbled. I was glad I had ordered a huge glass of wine. The buzz I had made it easier for me to listen to Mabel's morbid comments without going into panic mode. Like I said, my doctor will tell me what's wrong with me. I couldn't eat anything else, but I ordered another glass of wine. After we left the restaurant, Mabel hugged me like it was for the last time. It was the middle of July, and the weather was so nice, I walked the four blocks to Dr. Parker's office. I was extremely nervous throughout the exam. When it was over, I got dressed so fast, I put my pantyhose on inside out. Dr. Parker entered the room, and he was not smiling. But he didn't have the typical grim look you'd expect to see on a doctor's face when he was about to give you a death sentence. I didn't know what to expect. Congratulations, Mrs. Harper, he said, rubbing his hands together. You're going to be a mother. A huge smile formed on his weather-beaten, fake tan face. I was so elated, I almost kissed him. I regretted drinking the wine with my lunch. I didn't want to do anything that might hurt the baby inside my belly. I was even afraid to walk the six blocks back to the lot where I'd parked, so I took a taxi. I couldn't wait until everybody was in the house. I wanted to tell Bo the good news first— but getting him alone was not easy. 
I had called him at his office from my cell phone before I left the parking lot. And even though I had left a message that I had something very important to tell him, he hadn't returned my call by the time I decided to head for home. I'd left the same message on Daddy's voicemail, and he had not returned my call either. The closer I got to home, the more I didn't want to be in the house alone with Vera. I was afraid I'd break down and tell her I was pregnant, and I certainly didn't want to tell her before I told Bo and Daddy. I was too excited to go shopping, so I just drove around for a while. After about an hour, I reluctantly headed home. Costa was in the driveway waxing our rarely used town car. I parked beside him. When I got out of my car, he nodded and tipped his black chauffeur's cap. Costa, we may be using the car this evening, I told him. As well, Senora Harper, he replied with another nod. I was hoping that we'd all pile into the town car and go out to dinner to celebrate. When I got inside the house, I stopped in the foyer and took a deep breath. I moved quietly toward the entrance to the living room. I peeped in before entering, expecting to see Vera slumped on the couch or on a bar stool with a drink in her hand. She was not in the living room, but before I could breathe a sigh of relief, she came swishing in from the kitchen. Her eyes got wide as soon as she saw me standing in the middle of the living room floor. How was your visit to the doctor? She asked. She had her purse and car keys in her hand, so it was obvious she was on her way out. That made me happy. I wanted to savor my feeling of elation about the baby. That would have been hard to do with Vera lurking around the house. Is everything all right? I'm just fine. I answered with a smile I couldn't hold back. Hmm, that's nice. But that pinched look that's been on your face for the past few days is still there. You look constipated. Uh, I am constipated, but Dr. Parker gave me a prescription to take care of that. Good. Now I have to run. I'll be back in time for dinner. I told Delia to cook lamb. I'm looking forward to it. It didn't look like the family was going out to dinner tonight. Vera ran out of the room like a dog was chasing her. I prayed that Bo and Daddy would get home before I went to bed. Dinner was served at 7 o'clock p.m. I was glad Daddy and Bo had come home early enough to eat with the rest of us. Moving like robots, we seated ourselves and began to fill our plates with some of the lamb concoction Delia had prepared. Sarah, how did your appointment go today? Daddy asked, using both of his hands to break a roll in two. I tried to call you this afternoon, I told him. Then I looked at Bo. I tried to call you, too. Bo opened his mouth to speak, but Daddy beat him to it. Oh, is there something we need to know? Uh-huh, I said, deliberately taking my time now. I could feel the sudden tension and anxiety in the room, and I enjoyed watching Colette and Vera shift in their seats. I looked from one face to the other. I didn't speak again until I was looking directly into Bo's worried eyes. I found out something today that you all need to know, I announced, looking around the table some more. Colette glanced at me with her eyes narrowed. Vera's face froze. Cash didn't even look up from his plate. Bo began to blink rapidly. His lips curled up into a smile that seemed like it had been waiting all day to form on his face. He reached across the table and grabbed my hand. Baby, are you? He didn't even finish his sentence. I nodded. What is it, honey? Daddy asked, looking from me to Bo and back. I'm going to have a baby, I gushed. My eyes were still on Bo, but I heard Daddy let out a gasp. When I looked at him, he was beaming like a flashlight. My doctor confirmed it this afternoon. If it's a boy, I'm going to name him Kenneth Bohannon Harper. Bo dropped his fork and reared back in his seat.
Then he looked at me with his eyes bugged out and his mouth hanging open. Daddy choked on his wine. Bo slapped him on the back a few times. After Daddy stopped coughing, he wobbled up out of his seat and stumbled over to me, leaning on the table like a man with one leg. You could name my grandchild Donald Duck for all I care, and I'd be just as happy. He managed, looking so overjoyed, you would have thought that he was the one pregnant. When are you due? Colette asked stiffly, giving me a look I couldn't describe. After all these years, we tolerated each other at best. I was convinced that she resented me because she still thought my presence was a threat to the sweet position she and Cash occupied. Now that I was pregnant, my child and I would be a double threat. According to Dr. Parker, I'm due the 23rd of February. That is, if I don't have any complications. Daddy was still standing by my side with his hand on my shoulder. What kind of complications? Cash asked. You look as healthy as a mule to me. And as long as you lighten up on that wine and don't do nothing too extreme, having a baby ought to be a piece of cake for a young woman like you. Sometimes things happen to the healthiest and youngest women when it comes to having a baby. If I gain too much weight or lose too much weight, I could have some problems. My mama and grandmama told me they had all kinds of problems when they were pregnant. That's why they each had had only one child. Daddy started sweating and coughing again. Vera jumped up and guided him back down into his seat. Well, we are pleased to hear this wonderful news, baby. I'm sure everything is going to be just fine, he wheezed. After a few more comments about my condition, we finished dinner. Cash and Colette rushed off to go bowling. Vera told Daddy he looked like a wreck, so she escorted him to their bedroom where he could lie down for a while. Bo and I headed to the living room, holding hands all the way. I'm going to start working on the nursery tomorrow, I told him as soon as we sat down on the couch, still holding hands. And I think we should move into your old bedroom. We'll put the baby in the one we're in now. I'll have fun turning it into a nursery. But the room we're in now is the largest one on the second floor. A baby won't need that much room. Bo, I know that, but I would like a change of scenery, too. Do you want to move into one of the rooms on the third floor? I'm sure Vera and Kenneth won't mind us occupying a room that close to them. I'd rather stay on the second floor, but I do want to make our current bedroom into a nursery. I insisted. Suit yourself, honey. It's not that big of a deal, Bo said with a shrug. I was glad Bo didn't seem too interested in my sudden desire to change rooms. But I had a valid reason, and it wasn't only because I wanted to turn the room into a nursery. I wanted to make sure nobody else discovered the fact that if you got close enough to the air duct and opened the vent, you could hear everything going on in the kitchen. Last night when Bo dropped one of his cufflinks, he squatted down on the floor to retrieve it. It was just my luck that it had rolled dangerously close to the air duct, which I had forgotten to close after my last eavesdropping mission earlier that day. I scurried across the floor like a frightened cat and grabbed the cufflink before Bo could crawl too close to my secret intercom system. I knew that if he could hear people talking downstairs, he'd say something about it, and there was no way that Vera, Cash, and Colette would continue to run their mouths so freely then. Bo and I moved into his old bedroom a few hours later. The next morning... I was standing in front of Macy's when they opened. I purchased over a thousand dollars worth of baby clothes and items for the nursery. Chapter 36 Vera Now that Sarah was pregnant, she was downright giddy. But she was not any more annoying to me than she usually was. However, because her head was in the clouds... She was a whole lot easier to tolerate. 
I was convinced that I could make her putty in my hands as long as I kept my wits about me. But Sarah's pregnancy wasn't all peaches and cream. She quickly gained a lot of weight and didn't like the way she looked. I didn't like the way she looked either, for that matter. Her skin glowed and her eyes sparkled like jewels. Everybody, even strangers on the street, commented on how beautiful she looked. When I was with her, it was like I was invisible. Nobody noticed how beautiful I looked, so I didn't get the compliments that I had grown accustomed to. Sarah didn't know how to take compliments. She always said something stupid like, I'm so blessed, even with all this extra weight. I gloated in silence when she began to experience some of the discomforts of being pregnant. She had backaches, strange food cravings, and some days she would just bust out crying for no reason at all. By her sixth month, Sarah didn't feel so blessed. I'll be glad when I drop this load. I feel miserable, and I've been eating like a cow, she complained, gnawing on a smoked turkey leg. And I must look like one by now. That was true. She had already gained over 60 pounds. Most of the weight was in her stomach and ass, but her ankles and legs looked like tree stumps. I thought it was to my advantage to convince her that she was as beautiful as ever. No, you don't. You look just fine, honey. I wouldn't worry about gaining a few pounds if I were you. Besides, you're young. After you have the baby, you'll lose the weight and get your figure back in no time, I told her, rubbing her back as she sat humped over like a bear in hibernation next to me on the living room couch. I miss not being able to have a glass of wine or a margarita, she whined poking her bottom lip out so far it looked like a second nose on her bloated face. I hate all of these aches and pains that go along with being pregnant. Yesterday it was my neck. Today it's my back. Honey, you are still so blessed. In the long run, all of the discomfort you're experiencing now will be worth it. But I can't imagine how uncomfortable being pregnant must be. I'm so glad I never had to experience it. Sarah sat up straight and looked me in the eye. There was a look of sorrow on her face. I wasn't sure if it was meant for her or me until she spoke again. Is that why you never had any kids? Her question caught me completely off guard. I had to think hard because I wanted to make sure that what I told her was consistent with what I told Kenneth and everybody else. I tried for years, though, I said hoarsely. Unfortunately, the good Lord hasn't blessed Kenneth and me with a child of our own, yet. Oh? Maybe you can't have kids, huh? I gave Sarah a hopeless look. I've been to several doctors, and they've all told me there is no reason I can't get pregnant. Hmm. Poor Daddy. He loves kids, and I know he wanted more than one. He's told me so several times. Tell me about it, I muttered, staring at the wall. I was being sarcastic, but she was too dense to realize that. Oh, well, it's way too late for you now anyway. I whirled my head around so fast to look at Sarah that my neck felt like somebody had just tried to twist it off my shoulders. What do you mean by that? Aren't you, like, uh, in your 40s or 50s? I'm 60. That's like the new 40, I insisted. 60? You're that old? Sarah asked with a sharp gasp. You would have thought that I'd told her I had just sprouted a dick. Yikes. As much TV as you watch, and with all the reading you do, you should know that women my age, even though it is extremely rare, can still get pregnant. Medicine has come a long way. They've come up with some interesting new ways for older women to have babies. 
My voice was stiff and detached. It was a struggle for me to restrain myself because I wanted to slap the smug look off of Sarah's face. So me getting pregnant is not impossible in this day and age. Oh, yeah. I saw something in the Inquirer or one of those other tabloids that run weird stories about this real old woman that got pregnant. She was 55, I think. But she went through something like that in vitro thing or that artificial insemination thing. Whatever it was, she didn't get pregnant the normal way. Sarah paused and yawned. Then she gave me a look of such extreme pity, I wanted to slap that off her face, too. I was the last woman in the world who wanted to be pitied. Well, I wouldn't want to be walking around pregnant if I was even close to 40. An older woman has to deal with a lot of aches and pains and arthritis and shit anyway, so dealing with pregnancy pains would be too much. I'm glad I didn't wait too long to get pregnant with my first baby. I'm glad you didn't either, I thought. I had to remind myself that I was partially responsible for Sarah getting pregnant, and that was all part of my plan. The thought of all the benefits I would eventually reap made it easy for me to smile at her now. Well, to me, being a grandmother to your baby is almost as good as being a mother myself, I told her. Now let's go out and get some lunch. Barbecued ribs sounds good. Sarah had been complaining a lot about how little time Bo spent with her. Like Kenneth, he had begun to spend even more time at the store. The fact that I had tolerated that from Kenneth for so many years was one thing. I didn't want to be around him too much anyway. But I felt sorry for Sarah. She really loved Bo and wanted to be with him as much as possible. Every time she complained about it to me, I gave her my undivided attention because I didn't want her to take her complaints to her daddy. It was a major sacrifice for me not to spend as much time indulging myself with my usual activities so I could spend more time with Sarah. But that's just what I did. I had too much of a vested interest in her not to. Every chance I got to talk to Bo in private, I let him know in no uncertain terms how I felt about him being away from her so much. The girl is your wife now, and she's about to have your baby. The least you could do is spend more time with her. We have to keep her happy, I told him. We occupied the same table in the same neighborhood coffee shop I took him to when we decided to talk. It was a Saturday morning in mid-December. I know, I know. After the holidays are over, things will slow down and I can spend more time with her. But she knows how demanding my job is and how important it is to keep her daddy happy, Bo told me. You don't even call her up from work or invite her to come meet you for lunch that often anymore, I pointed out. A wife needs attention, you know. Oh, yeah? It's mighty strange I don't hear you complaining about all the time Kenneth spends away from you. I didn't like the smirk on Bo's face, but I chose to ignore it. He's with you less than I'm with Sarah. That's different. Kenneth is an old man, and we've been together a lot longer than you and Sarah. There was a time when I resented him working such long hours, but I'm used to it now. Bo suddenly gave me a conspiratorial look. What's the matter, Bo? Why are you looking at me that way? I fished my compact out of my purse and checked to make sure I hadn't smeared my lipstick or that a sesame seed from the bagel I'd just eaten was not stuck to my lip or between my teeth. Vera, I know you better than you think. I know you can find a lot of things to do with all the time you have on your hands, if you know what I mean. I rotated my neck and blinked hard. What do you mean by that? You know damn well what I mean by that, he chuckled. If I knew, I wouldn't be asking, I snarled. Are you going to take my advice and find a young stud and have an affair? Or have you already done so? He paused and snickered for a few seconds. 
Is that why it doesn't bother you anymore that Kenneth is gone most of the day? I stared at Bo in mock, slack-jawed amazement. I don't know what you're talking about, I squeaked. I was so flustered I caught my finger in my compact when I snapped it shut. And let's stay on the subject. We were discussing you spending more time with your wife. Maybe I don't want to spend more time with my wife right now. I like having my own space. Maybe that's why your ex divorced you. That remark really rattled Bo. He squinted his eyes in such an odd way, his eyebrows almost touched the top of his eyelids. Except for what I told you, you don't know a damn thing about me and my ex. I didn't mean anything by that. I'm sorry. I apologized, waving my hand. I know you are a good husband to her, and you're a good husband to Sarah. Bo swallowed hard and blinked a few times so that his eyes looked normal again. I'm a man who loves harder than the average man. Before I met Gladys, I'd only been with three other girls, and I never even thought about cheating on Gladys once we got together. There was a tight-lipped smile on his face now. It made him look downright shy, a characteristic he once told me was a weakness when associated with a man. I guess he must have suddenly recalled telling me that because a few seconds later, a much more serious look suddenly crossed his face. I was amazed at how fast he could shift from one display of emotion to another. A woman can cause a man a whole lot of grief. True. But that's only when a man picks the wrong woman. Bullshit. Women keep talking about not being able to find a good man. Well, not that I'm bragging, but I'm a damn good man. Not only do I treat my woman with a lot of respect, but I also don't cheat on her. Other than Nelda, the girlfriend I left back in Houston, the only other woman I've made love to since Gladys dumped me is Sarah. And I'll tell you here and now that I'm not going through another divorce. I don't care what I have to do. I'll never let Sarah go. Bo's ominous words sent shivers up my spine. Chapter 37 Kenneth Each day I felt a little more blessed. Now I had a grandchild on the way. On top of all my blessings, I had more money now than I could ever spend in my lifetime. And since I couldn't take it with me, I was going to leave my fortune to the people who deserved it the most. I had just set up an appointment with one of my attorneys to amend my will. I wanted to continue taking care of my loved ones from beyond the grave. I really loved my wife, and I wanted to make sure she was well provided for should I die before her. But without her knowing it, I had already decided to make some special provisions for my child and my grandchild and any additional grandchildren after my death. Most of my estate, including my beloved mansion and my business, would go to Sarah because I felt she was the one who deserved it the most. Even though I loved my wife with all my heart, I had made her very happy since we met. But my mama didn't raise no fool. I was particular about who was going to enjoy my money after I died. Even with my busy schedule, I kept up with what was going on in the world. In addition to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, I read the local newspapers. I watched the news on a portable TV in my office, and some nights, when I couldn't sleep, I watched some of those true crime TV shows. But I didn't need all those sources to tell me that some people were out for everything they could get. My wife didn't like being single, so she would remarry in a heartbeat upon my death. There were so many con men and tricksters on the loose, she'd be a sitting duck. I'd always been generous, even when I was a boy growing up with limited funds. 
I'd split a bologna sandwich out of my brown paper bag lunch with kids who didn't have any lunch at all. The more I gave, the more blessings I received. That was why I was more generous than ever now. And more blessings for me meant more blessings for my child. I prayed that Bo and Sarah would spend the rest of their lives together. However, praying about my daughter didn't stop me from worrying about her. But being a businessman, I had to be realistic. Anything could happen. Even in the strongest relationships, I was well aware of the divorce rate in America. There was no guarantee that my daughter and her husband would stay together. Bo had already been married once and had endured a very nasty divorce. That was something I thought about almost every day since he and my daughter got together. I was worried that Bo might have a flashback and take out his frustrations with his ex on my daughter and divorce her. Then she'd be up for grabs and the hounds would come sniffing. My daughter could be victimized by some gold-digging scoundrel and so could my grandchild. I'd seen it happen in other families. But the bottom line was, I had to leave my huge fortune to somebody. Had Sarah not come into my life, I would have left most of my estate to charity and enough to Vera for her to live comfortably. These were things that I didn't like to think about too often because they were too disturbing. So I concentrated on all the good things in my life. I didn't think anything could go wrong. Unfortunately, things were going so well that I got a little too comfortable too soon, and I should have known better. A man my age should always be prepared for the worst, no matter how well things were going. When I least expected it, I got a reality check that literally brought me to my knees. About six weeks before Sarah was due to deliver her son, she lost him, and she lost him in the most horrific way. It was a Friday evening, two weeks into the new year. Bo and I had taken an important client out for a two-and-a-half-hour lunch, and we had run from one meeting to another before and after that. When Sarah dropped by unexpectedly, we didn't even know she was on the premises. Bo and I had almost concluded our last meeting of the day with one of my senior sales representatives around 4 p.m. when one of my cashiers burst into my office. Sarah's in trouble, Tammy yelled. Bo and I reacted immediately. We sprang up out of our seats at the same time. My sales rep, a heavy-set female who got hysterical quicker than anybody I knew over the least little thing, fell to the floor trying to get out of her seat so fast. What the hell happened? Bo yelled, already running for the door. Some dude snatched a handful of batteries and ran out the door. Sarah was on her way out too, and he knocked her down, Tammy reported, talking as she ran along with Bo and me and my sales rep. It looks like she's hurt real bad. I was huffing and puffing so hard I could barely breathe. I held my hand over my heart. It was beating so hard, it felt like it was going to pop right out of my chest. A small crowd had formed by the time Bo and I reached the front entrance. Mr. Lomax, please don't go out there, yelled one of the floor salesmen as he parted the crowd for us. You don't want to see your daughter the way she is. Get out of the way. I'm going out there to see my child, I shouted. For an old man with a bad heart, I was very strong at times. I mowed down the salesman and two other employees who tried to prevent me from going outside. Sarah was stretched out on the ground by the entrance door with her eyes closed. She was writhing and moaning and rubbing her stomach. It was a sight that would haunt me until the day I died. The next thing I knew, I collapsed like a straw hut in a hurricane. My baby! My baby! I managed. My hand was still over my heart. 
Massaging it didn't do much good because it was still pounding like a drum. My blood pressure had shot up so high it felt like the blood was going to spurt out of my ears. Curtis Thompson, the new security guard that we'd recently hired, was leaning over Sarah, fanning her face with a magazine. The thief who had knocked her down trying to escape lay on the ground unconscious. A large, ugly black bruise had already formed on his knotty, bald head. I've already called for an ambulance, sir, Curtis hollered, looking at me, then at Bo. Bo stood rooted in his spot like a tree. It looked like he was in a trance. A split second later, he crouched down on the ground. He fanned Sarah's face with his hand, and Curtis continued to fan Sarah's face, too. She slowly opened her eyes, but she was still rubbing her stomach. My baby, my baby, she whimpered. These were the same words that I had just whimpered. A patch of skin had been scraped off one side of her face. Her shoes and the beret she'd been wearing, as well as her purse, had landed several feet away from her, right next to the batteries that the thief had attempted to steal. Tears were rolling down her face, and I could see the large red stain in the crotch of her white maternity pants, which told me that she and my unborn grandchild were in serious trouble. Curtis had cold-cocked the thief. Two other employees stood guard over him. If I had not been present, they probably would have roughed him up even more. The cops arrived a few minutes before the ambulance, one of the officers had to slap the thug's face to rouse him so they could cuff him and throw his sorry ass into the back of the squad car. Bo rode in the ambulance with Sarah, and I followed them to the hospital in my car. My heart felt like it was on fire, and I was so lightheaded I had to stop twice along the way. I knew that when and if I made it to the hospital in one piece— I was going to need some medical assistance, too. I prayed to God that I would live long enough to make sure my child was going to be all right. Now more than ever, I knew that if something really bad happened to Sarah, I would die of grief. Chapter 38 Sarah When I woke up, I thought I had died and gone to heaven because it was so quiet and the atmosphere was so serene and everything was white, the ceiling, the walls, and my bedding. I was lying on my side in a loose white hospital gown and two pretty white women dressed in white stood by the side of the bed looking down at me. From the sad looks on their faces, you would have thought they were viewing a corpse in a coffin which is why I thought I was dead at first. My mind was so jumbled, I couldn't even think or see straight. I blinked several times, but my vision was still unfocused. Then I heard Vera. Welcome back, she said in the gentlest voice I'd ever heard her use. I turned to the other side. Standing next to Vera was Bo. It was obvious he'd been crying, I could see the tracks of the tears on his face. Vera looked sad, but it didn't look like she'd lost too many tears, if any at all. Her eyes were as clear as a glass of mineral water. What happened to me? I asked. My head was throbbing. My cheeks ached when I spoke. You were involved in an accident, dear, one of the pretty nurses told me. I'm in a hospital? Is my baby? I didn't even have to finish asking my question. I could tell just from the sad looks on every other face in the room that I had lost my baby. My baby's dead, I stated. Then a doctor entered the room. He was so dark, I assumed he was black. But when I heard his accent and saw his name tag... I realized he was Dr. Ram Gupta, 
the same Indian doctor who had removed Grandma Lily's gallbladder 15 years ago. We did everything we could, he told me. I am so very, very sorry, Mrs. Harper. You're young and healthy, so you can have plenty more babies, Sarah, Vera assured me. I couldn't understand why she was the only one in the room with a smile on her face now. The expression on Beau's face was so grim, he looked like a pallbearer. Where's my daddy? I looked from Vera to Beau. Uh, he's at home resting, Vera answered. He, uh, he held out until you were out of danger, but the incident was real hard on him. His doctor told him to stay off his feet for a few more days. That's the only reason he's not here. How long have I been here? I asked, rising even though it was painful for me to make even the slightest movement. You were brought in five days ago, the doctor said. I've been unconscious all this time? Well, what kind of accident was I in? It was a criminal matter at the store, Bo said quickly. We'll tell you the rest of the details in time. And the culprit is in custody, Vera added. Somebody tried to kill me. Why would somebody want to kill me? That thought made me feel unbearably sad. Bo's mouth dropped open, and a look of horror appeared on his face. Kill you? Baby, why would you say something like that? There was a horrified look on Vera's face. Who would want to kill you, Sarah? She croaked. I shrugged and shook my head. So nobody tried to kidnap me or anything like that then? Bo and Vera looked at each other, then back to me. No, that's not what happened. We'll tell you everything you need to know when you're feeling better, Vera said. Now you need to get some rest. I nodded in agreement. Bo leaned over and kissed me. My lips were so numb I could barely feel his. Vera gave me a pat on the shoulder, and then they left the room. All I wanted now was to be alone. I found out the next morning from Vera exactly what had happened. I cringed and shuddered when I heard the details. By the time she got to the end of the story, she was in tears. If it hadn't been for that security guard, you might have been hurt even more. A witness said that that creep had grabbed you by the arm and was pulling you toward the parking lot. During the struggle, a gun fell out of his pocket. She sniffed, dabbed at her eyes, and blew her nose into one of her fancy monogrammed handkerchiefs. Well... Whatever that security guard's name is, I hope Bo and Daddy do something real nice for him. Cash and Colette came by while Vera was still with me. She was still boo-hooing a little. By now, her handkerchief looked like just another snot rag. Colette brought flowers, and she had to mention how much she'd paid for them. Cash brought me a green plant and a get-well card. Bless his heart, he had also smuggled in a bottle of beer for me in a brown paper bag. After he and Colette left, Bo returned, and Daddy was with him. Bo, I'm so sorry I lost our baby. I wailed. Honey, it was not your fault, he assured me. We can start on another one as soon as you get well. I looked at Daddy. Daddy, I'm going to give you more grandbabies than you can stand, I vowed. One a year until I'm no longer able to have children. I immediately realized just how ridiculous that sounded. Daddy laughed. I don't need that many. He moved closer to the bed. What's important now is you getting well. I've spoken to your doctor, and he's confident you'll be up out of here in a day or so. Baby, you're going to be just fine. He gave me a quick peck on the cheek. I looked at him and squinted my eyes so I could see him better. 
And what about you? I felt fairly well, but I was more concerned about him now. Me? I'm okay, I guess, he said hoarsely. He didn't look okay to me. There were deep, dark circles around his eyes and lines all over his face that I had never noticed before. Yep, I'm doing just fine. Fit as a fiddle. Daddy had spoken too soon because he suddenly bent forward and began to cough so hard, Bo summoned a nurse. In less than a minute, a large, pug-ugly nurse who looked more like a prison guard steamrolled into the room with a wheelchair and hauled Daddy away in it. Bo, I... I'm scared, I fumbled, clutching his hand. I can't lose my baby and my daddy at the same time. Honey, everything is going to be just fine. Your daddy got so upset about what happened to you, he's just having some bad flashbacks. But Vera has spoken to his doctor, and they've assured her that he's in good shape for an 80-year-old. An 80-year-old what? I asked. Horse, cow, goat, or what? Excuse me? Daddy looks way older than his age, and he's been having one health problem after another the last couple of years. A man his age can't be in good shape with all that going against him. Honey, I don't know what you want me to do or say. Things could be a lot worse. Just be thankful they're not. Yeah, I guess you're right. I exhaled and then sucked in some fresh air. Vera told me all about how that thug knocked me to the ground and how I passed out. I can't get that out of my mind. I just wish Daddy had not been there to see me lying on the ground unconscious and bleeding. Maybe he wouldn't have taken it so hard. I agree with that, Bo said, giving me an affectionate look. Well, I'm all right now. How is that security guard doing? Is he going to be okay, too? What do you mean? He didn't get hurt trying to protect me, did he? Oh, no. Curtis is a big, strapping dude. He's a young blood like you. It would take a lot to hurt him. He's just fine. Bo laughed. I sure would hate to tangle with that, brother. I'd like to thank him in person. I think that's a great idea. As soon as you get out of this hospital, we'll have him over for dinner. I couldn't wait to meet the man who had possibly saved me from a much worse fate. I didn't think I could wait until I got home, and I didn't have to. Shortly after Bo left, a nurse ducked into my room. Excuse me, Mrs. Harper, there's a gentleman here to see you, but he wanted to make sure you're up to more company today, she told me. Yeah, I guess. Who is it? I was almost feeling like my old self again, so I was sitting up in bed watching a Deal or No Deal rerun. I had finished the beer that Cash had snuck in for me, and I'd wrapped the bottle in some newspaper and dropped it into the trash can. I was glad I had rinsed my mouth out thoroughly with Listerine a few minutes ago. The last thing I needed was for the hospital staff to be buzzing about me having alcohol on my breath. It's the security guard who came to your assistance, the nurse told me, waving a tall, handsome black man in a gray uniform into my room. Hello, Mrs. Harper, he said in a voice that seemed too gentle to belong to such a husky man. He had gentle eyes, too, and he was built like Mike Tyson. His eyes were the most dazzling thing about him. They were almond-shaped, and a light shade of hazel with long, jet-black lashes. His beautiful smile revealed bright white teeth. With his wavy, dark brown hair parted on the side, he looked more like a TV soap opera heartthrob than a security guard. I'm Curtis Thompson. He set a vase of red roses on my nightstand. The nurse gave me a big smile before she left the room. Oh, I mumbled. Well, uh, 
I thank the good Lord you were at the store that day, Curtis. I thank the good Lord that I hadn't left at my regular time. He sucked in some air and then pulled a chair over to the side of my bed. My shift had ended and I was supposed to meet some friends for drinks, but Mr. Harper asked me to work a little later to help move some equipment around in the storeroom. Had I left at my regular time? His voice faded out. Thank you again, Curtis. I stared into those hazel eyes and felt warm all over. This man may have saved my life, so he would always have a special place in my heart now. Uh, you look real familiar. Have we met before? Curtis nodded. A real long time ago. We were both in Mrs. Grant's English class in ninth grade, Morgan High. Oh, yeah! You didn't come back after the Christmas holiday. Well, I had to drop out and go to work to help Mama with the bills. A lot of kids had to do that. I see you did all right for yourself, though. I used to wonder what happened to you. I guess I did do all right, I said shyly. Uh, my husband said we're going to have you over for dinner when I get home. We have a cook from El Salvador. My daddy, my husband, and my stepmother like to have her cook up a lot of weird exotic stuff. There's no telling what kind of bizarre concoction they'll have her prepare when you come to dinner. I smiled and gave Curtis a conspiratorial wink. You know how some black folks get when they get money. He nodded and snickered. Tell me about it, but I'm pretty flexible when it comes to food. When I was eight, the neighborhood bullies made me eat a live grasshopper, so I'll eat just about anything now. Curtis made a face, and then he snickered again. He had such a jolly laugh. Just being in his presence made me feel so much better. But if you don't mind, I'd like to treat you to a nice lunch or dinner on my own, too. I lowered my voice to a whisper. I hope you like that rib joint on McInnes. I do, he whispered back. Chapter 39 Vera Bo was really upset about the loss of his son, but Kenneth was almost inconsolable. It was bad enough he was on bed rest, but in some ways, he had become like a baby to me. He even had to be spoon-fed, and he didn't want me out of his sight for one minute. He balked when I told him that I was going to hire a temporary nurse, but I hired one anyway. There was no way I could do it all myself. Vera! Kenneth yelled my name every time I left his sight, even when the nurse was standing by the bed. I had just left the room to go use the bathroom. I had postponed all of my regular daily activities and a few appointments for the rest of the week, and I didn't like that at all. One of my breast implants had shifted and roamed almost up under my armpit. I had made an appointment for this Wednesday to have it repositioned. But because Kenneth had so many demands, I had to postpone that appointment, too. I was not happy about having to walk around with a lopsided breast. The bottom line was, when Kenneth was awake, the only place I could go without him throwing a hissy fit was to the hospital to visit Sarah. I finished my business in the bathroom and trotted back out into the bedroom. Vera, baby, don't leave me alone, he blubbered, drool sliding down the side of his mouth, tears rolling down his cheeks. Traces of fresh puke, snot, and tears covered the front of his nightshirt. I had already cleaned him up and dressed him in fresh bedclothes three times since I got out of bed that morning. I'm right here, I said with a heavy sigh, rushing over to the bed on wobbly legs. I was dog-tired, but I tried not to show it. I'd been running back and forth for one reason or another for hours. I opened my eyes and you were gone. I don't like being alone he wailed, ignoring the big Jamaican nurse I'd hired standing by the side of the bed looking bored. 
I won't leave you alone, baby, I assured him. I snatched a Kleenex out of the box on the nightstand and wiped his face. The weary look on my face was more for my benefit than his. I couldn't wait for Sarah to come home so she could help share the load. Since Kenneth didn't like the nurse and refused to let her bathe him or help him use the bedpan, I had to do it. I hadn't washed somebody's ass other than my own since I'd been forced to take care of my younger sisters. But bathing toddlers was nothing compared to bathing a grown-ass, overweight man who was as fussy as a toddler and as clumsy as an ox. My marriage had become a nightmare within a nightmare. A few minutes after I returned to the room, Kenneth motioned for the bedpan. The nurse and I managed to hoist him onto it in the nick of time before his bowels moved and all hell broke loose. I had to run back to the bathroom to puke. I had no idea how long the situation would last or how much more I could stand before I snapped. They released Sarah the following Wednesday. Just having her back in the house was like an elixir to Kenneth. That same day, he got up and took a shower on his own. That Thursday morning, he went back to the office and worked almost 10 hours. The only reason he came home at a decent hour on Friday was because that security guard who had helped Sarah was having dinner with us. I hope you like crab meat, I said, looking at Curtis. He occupied a chair next to Sarah. Bo was on her other side. One thing Kenneth and Bo apparently forgot to mention to Curtis was that we dressed for dinner. I wore one of my most beautiful and expensive hostess gowns. Curtis was still in the dull gray uniform Kenneth's security guards wore. A toothpick was dangling from the corner of his mouth. It didn't even move when he spoke. He tucked his napkin into the collar of his shirt, used the wrong utensils at the wrong time, and he chewed like a billy goat. The boy was ghetto to the bone. Oh, well, he didn't know any better. Despite his crudeness, I gave Curtis the benefit of the doubt. I liked him anyway, and since I would never have to socialize with him again, I figured I could survive this one event intact. My family is from New Orleans, so I grew up eating a lot of seafood. Curtis told us, looking around the table. He rested his eyes on Sarah, too long in my opinion. And it looked like Bo felt the same way. He raised an eyebrow and cleared his throat. Then he draped his arm around Sarah's shoulder, as if to mark his territory. Curtis, I can't thank you enough for coming to my wife's aid, Bo said putting so much emphasis on each word you would have thought he was reciting a speech. I've entered a letter of commendation in your file, and I've initiated a generous bonus that will appear on your next paycheck. Bo looked at Kenneth for approval. From the surprised look on Kenneth's face, I figured the bonus was a decision that Bo had made on his own. But since Kenneth nodded and smiled, he obviously approved of Bo's actions. Oh, shucks. I appreciate that, and I sure could use the money, but you didn't have to do all that. I was just doing my job, Curtis said, glancing at Colette. I didn't like the look in her eyes. She was looking at Curtis like he was something good to eat, and I could see why. He made my pussy itch, and I planned to sneak out of the house and get it scratched again as soon as Kenneth fell asleep tonight. Despite Curtis's crudeness, he still looked delicious, just the type I liked. But he was certainly off limits to me. Not only did I have too much to lose, but I was also happy with my current boy toy. I assumed Curtis had a few women already, and probably more babies than he could afford to support. I'm just sorry about Miss Harper losing her baby. I know how important a first child is. My son died with his mama during Hurricane Katrina. He was three. Everybody at the table gasped at the same time. 
My goodness, Curtis, that's a damn shame, I wailed, giving him a mournful look for good measure. Do you still have family down there? Sarah asked. Curtis shook his head. After Katrina, none of my folks wanted to stay in New Orleans any longer. They had lost everything anyway, so there was nothing to keep them there. They live all over the place now, Frisco, Detroit, Brooklyn. And one of my cousins even moved up to Vancouver, Canada. Do you like living in California, son? Kenneth asked. Curtis let out a loud sigh before answering. And then a look came over his face that I will never forget. He looked like a man who had lost his will to live. Yes, I do, sir. I've been here since I was nine. I'll like it even more when I can afford to move into a better neighborhood. He stopped talking long enough to let out another sigh. The next thing I knew, he began to regale us with some of the most frightening information I'd ever heard. I spent two years in Iraq when I was in the Army. I dodged a lot of bullets. One day, I almost stepped on a landmine, but a buddy pushed me out of the way in the nick of time. I saw men get blown to bits and pieces. Somehow, I made it back home in one piece. The same day I got back to Frisco, two dudes robbed me at gunpoint on the street right in front of the building I live in now. A month after that, somebody broke in on me and my mama in the middle of the night and pistol whipped me because I wouldn't turn over the drugs they thought I had, which I didn't have. I don't mess with drugs. Not long after that, somebody attacked me from behind with a blunt instrument that left me unconscious for two days. Curtis paused and looked around the table. I have a few enemies in the hood. I'm one of the few residents brave enough to speak out against the drug dealers and other criminals. I was a witness in a trial a couple of weeks ago. I testified against four brothers who had broken into the apartment of the young single mother next door to me. They shot and killed her dog locked her kids in the bathroom, tied sister girl up, and raped her. I was coming home from work as they were running out the girl's front door, laughing and covered in her blood. I was able to identify them, and I called the cops right away. From that day on, I received telephone death threats until I changed my number. Now I get the threats in writing. Two days ago, somebody slipped a note under my front door telling me my days were numbered. My Lord, Kenneth exclaimed. How can people live in an environment like that? Some of us don't have a choice, Curtis pointed out. I'm good with my hands when it comes to cars. I work a part-time job helping a friend who owns a body shop. Someday I hope to own my own shop and have a bunch of mechanics working for me. My mama works the night shift in a furniture warehouse. We're able to sock away a few dollars every week. Hopefully by this time next year we'll have enough to move to a safer location. When Curtis paused this time, he chuckled. If I live that long. What do you mean by that? Sarah asked. The boys in the Hunter's Point District don't play. Pissing them off is like signing your own death warrant. I've been to a lot of funerals for people who stood up against the gangsters like I'm doing now. Just last Friday night, after I called the cops and ratted out the dealers selling crack in front of my building, somebody slashed the tires on my car. And they wrote, you next, on the windshield in black spray paint. Sarah, I'm sure you haven't forgotten how it was when you lived out there. And I hope I never will forget, Sarah responded, blinking hard in Curtis's direction. I went to quite a few funerals of murdered friends myself. Hey, let me stop talking about all this gloomy stuff. I don't want to put a damper on this lovely dinner. I'm sorry. Curtis's decision came a few minutes too late. His grim report had already put a damper on our lovely dinner. I was sorry I had encouraged Kenneth and Bo to bring him to dinner. I decided right then and there that if Kenneth or Bo ever mentioned inviting this man into our home again, I would not allow it. The room had become uncomfortably quiet. From the expressions on each face, you would have thought we were at a funeral. I decided to steer the conversation in a more pleasant direction. How many other babies do you have, Curtis? I asked. He didn't waste any time responding to my question. None. 
Then he chortled. At least none that I know of. I feel you on that one, Cash said with a sheepish look on his face. Colette shot him a scathing look, but she wasted no time turning her attention back to Curtis and plastering a smile on her face. Are you married now, Curtis? Sarah asked. All eyes went to her. Why was she interested in his marital status was a mystery to me. No, not anymore, Curtis replied dryly. I'm single and looking. I didn't like the smug look on Sarah's face as she gazed at him. I could feel the vibes between the two of them. I had an ominous feeling about Sarah's obvious fascination with this man. Curtis was a nice enough young man, but he didn't have a goddamn thing to offer. He was just a security guard. A dead-end ass job if ever there was one. The man had no class, no money, and he lived in one of the most run-down and dangerous areas in San Francisco with his mama. He drove a Ford Escort that was almost as old as he was. I didn't know jalopies like that were still on the road. It was in the shop, so he had come over on the bus, and that was how I assumed he was going to go home. After we'd finished dinner and enjoyed a few highballs, Sarah volunteered to give Curtis a ride home, since she was the only one who hadn't drunk any alcohol. I was horrified. But for some strange reason, Bo and Kenneth thought it was a good idea. You need to get back into the swing of things, baby. The fresh air will do you good, Bo said, vigorously shaking Curtis's calloused hand like it was going to be the last time and thanking him again for being so helpful to Sarah. Yeah, you do need to get some fresh air in and get your bearings back. And Bo and I need to spend a couple of hours together in my study to go over a few new contracts, Kenneth said, coughing. He rose from the table and shook Curtis's hand, too, and clapped him on the back. You're a real asset to the store, son. I hope you'll be with us for a long time to come. Then Kenneth turned to Sarah. She looked as gleeful as a cheerleader. You drive careful now, honey. I'll go with her, Colette volunteered, jumping up out of her chair so fast it almost fell over. If you don't mind, Sarah. I was going to run out to Walgreens to get a few things anyway. No, I don't mind at all, Sarah grinned. Even though the baby was no longer in her belly, she was still quite round around her middle, and her legs and ankles were still kind of thick. But she looked good in her loose black dress with her hair in a French twist. The way Curtis was looking at her made me uncomfortable. But since Bo didn't seem to notice or care, I set my feelings aside. After everybody had left the dining room, I padded into the kitchen and dialed Ricky's number. He answered on the first ring. I'm coming to see you tonight. I need to pick up some condoms. In the store across town, of course. So give me an hour or so, I told him. I never asked him if he wanted company, or even if he had company already. When I wanted to see him, that was all that mattered to me. I always got what I paid for. I'll be naked when you get here, he told me. It was no wonder I loved this sweet young thing so much. We were always on the same page. I was going to hold on to this one for a little longer than I'd kept my other boy toys. Maybe even permanently. Chapter 40 Sarah there were several Walgreens between my house and Curtis's apartment, but I stopped at one downtown because it was big and always busy. Colette claimed she only needed to pick up a few items, but because of the mob of other customers and the slow cashiers, I knew she'd be in the checkout line for a while. That would give me more time to talk to Curtis without her listening in on our conversation. There were things I wanted to say to him that needed to be said in private. 
I waited until Colette had entered the store before I said anything to Curtis. He occupied the back seat directly behind me. So, I began with caution, turning around so I could see him better. When can I take you to lunch or dinner, Curtis? He gulped and gave me a surprised look. Huh? Oh, Mrs. Harper, you don't have to take me to lunch or anything else. I was glad to be of some assistance to you. Like I said, I was just doing my job. I know, but it would make me feel a whole lot better if you'd let me do something nice for you. I insisted. You've already done that as far as I'm concerned. Inviting me to have dinner with you and your family was more than enough. And the food was off the chain. I haven't eaten such a screaming good dinner since my grandmother died. I'm glad I spent the first half of my life with her. Oh, your grandmother raised you? Off and on. I should say. He smiled. Where were your mother and your daddy? Curtis stopped smiling. My daddy died of a stroke when I was four. Mama was around. Well, to be more specific, she was all over the place. Sometimes I wouldn't see her for weeks at a time. She was a pretty woman, so she had a lot of admirers, if you know what I mean. I didn't know what he meant, so I was glad he told me. We lived with her pimp for two years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Not only was I shocked, but I also felt truly sorry for this man. He had endured a rough life, just like me, and deserved so much more, just like me. She didn't stay in that life too long, Thank God she had enough sense to realize how destructive it was. Anyway, I didn't like the way my mama's men treated her, and they didn't like me. So my grandmother took over and moved me in with her. She passed when I was 12, and then I moved back in with mama. We have something in common. The man my mama married didn't like me, so my grandmother took me in. Hmm... Curtis gave me a strange look. Uh, why did you move in with your grandmother? I know it ain't my business, but your daddy is one of the richest black men in the state. Where was he at that time? I was ten when my mama married my stepfather. My real daddy didn't even know about me until my mama died in a car wreck a few days before the new millennium rolled in. I didn't know about him either. My mama had told me some off-the-wall bogus story about my daddy dying in a plane crash. Anyway, daddy came to my mama's funeral, saw me, and put two and two together. I looked just like his dead brother's daughter, but he still had a DNA test done to be sure. I snorted. He didn't waste any time stepping up to the plate. He started taking care of me and my grandmother right away. Old brother Kenneth Lomax sounds like a righteous dude. My daddy is an angel in my book. He was real generous to me and my grandma. Right after my mama's funeral, he moved us into a real fancy condo he owns near downtown. He took us to fancy restaurants with names I couldn't even pronounce. One time, he even picked us up in a stretched limo. My grandma died not long after he had moved us into his condo, so he brought me to live with him. He sent me to a real fancy boarding school in Iowa, where I learned good manners and how to speak better English than that gibberish most of those ignoramuses back in the hood use. And when I graduated from high school, he bought me my first car, a BMW, and a different new car every year. I looked toward the door again to make sure the coast was still clear. He bought me a Jaguar this year, it was real hard for me to go from living in the hood to living in Pacific Heights. I'll bet it was. Well, everything worked out for you anyway, Mrs. Harper. Curtis patted my shoulder. Please, call me Sarah, I told him. He smiled and gave my shoulder a firm squeeze. Sarah, he sniffed. We have something else in common. Sarah was my daddy's mama's name. I grinned. Look, I really would like to take you to lunch. 
It's always nice to connect with people who grew up the way I did. I looked away for a moment. Sometimes I feel so lonely. I spend so much time on my own. That's why I was in the store that day I had my accident and lost my baby. I just wanted to be around people. The mansion is so big, and sometimes the only people I talk to all day are the housekeeper, our chauffeur, or the maintenance people who come around from time to time. Hmm. What about your stepmother? Is she good company to you during the day, or does she go to a job every day? Please. I rolled my eyes so hard it hurt. Oops, excuse me. I didn't know it was like that. Curtis laughed. Vera's a hot mess, if you ask me. She has more on her plate than a glutton. She spends hours at a time, several days a week, shopping. She goes to the spa, the gym, the shows in Vegas, and buys $300 lunches. And she goes to the hairdresser and plastic surgeon so often... I'm surprised she hasn't turned into a bionic woman with all of the fake things on her body. She even goes around helping churches feed the poor, so she says. And even when she is in the house with me, we don't have that much to talk about. She's as shallow as a duck pond, so no, she's not good company to me. Don't you have any friends? Not really, I hung out with my homegirls from the old neighborhood as long as I could, but I got tired of them asking me for money or making stupid, jealous remarks about me living in Pacific Heights. Daddy sent me to that fancy boarding school so I could learn how to act like I had some class and fit in better with other wealthy people. But that didn't really help. I still feel like a fish out of water. You saw how dull the conversation was at the dinner table this evening. Now that you mention it, it was pretty boring. We both laughed. Pretty boring is right. I coughed to clear my throat. I felt so comfortable talking to Curtis. He seemed like the kind of man I could say just about anything to. You already told me you like barbecued ribs. Curtis laughed again. All right, Mrs. Hart. Uh, Sarah, I'll let you treat me to lunch. When? How about tomorrow? Curtis raised an eyebrow. I have to work tomorrow, and I don't get but an hour for lunch. We'd have to do it on one of my days off, which is Wednesday and Thursday. All right. We'll go to lunch next Wednesday. You tell me the address of the place, and I'll meet you there. I should have my car out of the shop by then. Oh, I don't mind picking you up, I said quickly. Why don't you give me your telephone number? I'll call you the day before just to confirm everything. Cool. Curtis pulled a pen out of his shirt pocket and eagerly scribbled his telephone number on a matchbook cover and handed it to me. If a woman answers, don't get nervous. Mama usually answers the phone. I glanced toward the store again. It was foggy now, and I couldn't see the door. A few seconds later, Colette slunk out of the fog and strutted toward the car with a pinched look on her face. Uh, I don't know if you realized it or not when we were eating dinner, but my folks are, uh, not normal. I mean, they don't get loose like I do. Oh, I picked up on that right away. Vera must have mentioned the names of all the high-end stores she shops in 20 times, Cash and Colette seem more like stowaways, and your husband, well, his mind seemed to be everywhere but at the dinner table. What a crazy setup you live in. Curtis let out a loud groan and rubbed his nose. And excuse me for saying this, but I couldn't wait for that dinner to end so I could get away from them. I feel like that every day. Some days I feel so uncomfortable at that dinner table I can barely get my food down. I complained. Curtis gave me a serious look. Other than your daddy, the only other interesting person at that dinner table was you. You are one special lady, Sarah. A compliment like that coming from a man like him made my head swell. Thank you.
I mumbled. By the way, I don't think they need to know about me treating you to lunch next Wednesday. I feel the same way, Curtis said with a nod. Just promise me one thing. What? I held my breath. Colette was just a few feet from the car now. After you treat me to lunch next Wednesday, the next time we get together, you let me pick up the tab. The next time we get together? Oh, yeah, that'll be fine with me. I gushed. Colette snatched open the front passenger door and plopped down in her seat, groaning like an old woman. You look like a cat that just swallowed a canary, Sarah. She gave me an accusatory look out of the corner of her eye. What's up with that big-ass smile on your face? Nothing, I replied, glancing at Curtis in the rearview mirror. I was not the only one who looked like I'd just swallowed a canary. He looked like he'd swallowed one, too. The man's face was glowing like a light bulb. What am I getting myself into? I immediately asked myself as I started the motor. Chapter 41 Vera The following Wednesday morning, Sarah pranced into the kitchen a few minutes before 11. There was such a smug look on her face you would have thought she was King Solomon's favorite mistress. She wore a pair of jeans and a t-shirt with the words Hot Stuff printed across the front in once black letters now faded by too many washings. She looked like she was on her way to a fashion show at the Salvation Army. Why are you dressed like that? I asked. The frown on my face got even bigger when I saw she had flip-flops on her feet. Showcasing ashy feet with toenails that looked more like bear claws. I'm going to lunch with Lupe Menendez, a friend that I haven't seen since she came out of her coma. Sarah's eyes glistened like raindrops. Excuse me? Lupe. She used to be one of my main homegirls. She got into a fight with a girl when we were in eighth grade, and the other girl had a gun in her backpack. She shot Lupe in the back of her neck. Lupe's been in a coma all these years until last week, she explained. To me, Sarah looked unusually cheerful for somebody whose friend had been the victim of such a cruel act of violence. The knowledge that Sarah still associated with people like this Lupe amazed me to no end. I hope the girl that shot your friend went to jail. No, she didn't. Before the cops could find her, Lupe's older brother, Javier, tracked her down and blew her face off with a sawed-off shotgun. He's in jail, though. My God, my God! Well, I hope your friend is going to be all right now and that she has family to look after her. Oh, Lupe's fine now. Her daddy got shot and killed a few years ago trying to rob a drug dealer in Mexico City. But her mama and her seven brothers and sisters still live in the building Grandma Lily and I used to live in. I groaned and let out a mournful sigh. If you're going to your old neighborhood, you're dressed appropriately, I guess. You don't need to wear any of your nice clothes and draw attention to yourself. Those desperate, broke-ass people over there are just waiting to cook a goose like you. Sarah didn't like it when I implied that she might become a kidnapping victim someday. The same disgusted look that always appeared on her face when I brought it up was on her face now. Vera, don't you think that if somebody wanted to kidnap me, they would have done it by now? Just be careful. Your daddy has enough to worry about. I shook my head in exasperation. I hope you're not driving your car over there. Let Costa drive you. No, I'm driving my car, she giggled. I really would draw attention to myself if I rolled up in front of Lupe's building in the town car with a chauffeur behind the wheel. Hmm. Just make sure that that can of mace I gave you is still in your purse. I left the house a few minutes after Sarah did. I had a lot of things on my agenda for the day, 
But the most important thing I had to do was go to the bank and open a new savings account in my name only. Kenneth and I had several joint accounts and numerous credit cards. Our accountant took care of our bills and other expenses related to the business, but I took care of our personal expenditures. I had opened several credit cards in my name that Kenneth didn't know about. With all the gifts I'd purchased for my lovers, some months I had to rob Peter to pay Paul. But as long as Kenneth didn't know how out of control I was when it came to money, I wasn't going to worry about it. I opened a new bank account with $5,000 that I had squeezed out of the monthly household expenses last month. My plan was to siphon out a few thousand dollars from the household money every month and funnel it into my new account. In a few years, I'd have at least a million dollars or close to it. So if Kenneth dumped me, and if I had managed my money well, I'd be all right until I landed another wealthy husband. Despite my increasing paranoia, I had no reason to believe that Kenneth was going to divorce me. However, I still felt more comfortable having something to fall back on in case he did. Would you like to add someone to this account, Mrs. Lomax? Asked Mr. Gara, a mole-like little man who looked more like an undertaker than a bank employee. I didn't answer right away. I was so busy organizing my thoughts that I'd almost forgotten where I was. I looked around the plush bank office, admiring the healthy-looking green plants in every corner. There was a file cabinet behind Mr. Gara's red oak desk. On top of the file cabinet was a framed picture of his family, two adorable children, and an attractive, decades-younger blonde wife. She probably loved the puppy her son was holding more than she loved her homely husband. She had the kind of smirk on her face that made me think she and I shared the same secret. And we probably did. Women like me can usually spot another woman with the same motives. Mr. Gara cleared his throat to get my attention back. Mrs. Lomax, will you be adding someone else to this account? Huh? Oh, no, not at this time, I smiled. You have a beautiful family, I commented, nodding toward the photograph. Well, there's nothing like family. Each day is better than the last. You're right, I nodded. There is nothing like family. I should have shut my big mouth while I was still ahead. I didn't like telling strangers too much of my business. I didn't realize I was doing just that until it was too late. I have a wonderful husband and a daughter and son-in-law. We're all very close. Mr. Gara lifted his chin and gave me a dry look. I see. In that case, you should definitely include a beneficiary on this account. Heaven forbid, but if something were to happen to you, the state will take over your estate unless you provide beneficiary information for this account in your last will and testament. Otherwise, your family will have to struggle through probate and other forms of red tape for years before they can gain access to whatever is still in this account upon your passing. Never mind all that, I snapped. I didn't like to get excited unless I was having sex. Excitement usually made me have a hot flash. One of the worst ones I'd ever experienced suddenly shot up from my feet to my face. It felt like somebody had just shoved me into an oven, face first. I gasped for air and fanned my face with my hand. Are you all right, ma'am? Would you like a glass of water? Mr. Gara was around my age, so I figured he probably thought I was having a senior moment and that was probably true. My memory had rapidly begun to fade. Last week, when I went shopping downtown, I couldn't remember where I parked my car. I had wandered around like an Alzheimer's patient for an hour before I located it. Getting old was a bitch. That was another reason why I had to ensure my future. And if Bo and Sarah had another child, and I prayed that they would make another one soon, 
At least I'd have a rich grandchild to fall back on. In the meantime, I had to do what I had to do. I'm fine, thank you, I insisted, rising. I stuffed my copies of the documents I had just signed into my purse and scurried out like a burglar. Chapter 42 Kenneth I was glad to be back to normal. Well, normal for me. I still didn't feel as well as I used to, but I felt well enough to return to work. It was a typical foggy Frisco morning when I left the house, driving with both hands on the steering wheel and squinting my eyes like that old cartoon character Mr. Magoo. Even though I stayed in the slow lanes all the way, impatient motorists behind me kept honking their horns for me to speed up, but I refused to do so. The last way I wanted to end my life was in an automobile accident. By the time I pulled into my personal parking stall behind the store, I was aching in several places on my body, short of breath and dizzy. I had to sit still for five minutes to compose myself. After I had taken several deep breaths, massaged my chest, and swallowed a few pills, I felt better. I wobbled out of my Lexus and stumbled into the building through the employee entrance. In spite of what I told people, I felt like a dead man walking, and I tried to hide it. I didn't want anybody to feel sorry for me, which most of them did anyway. People looked at me with pity, and a few held their breath when I approached them. The same day I returned to work, half a dozen people came into my office to check and make sure I was still breathing. No matter how many times I told them to stop worrying about me, a few continued to do so. Finally, I closed and locked my office door. And it was a good thing I did that. I fell asleep, sitting at my desk several times, and once I tumbled from my chair and hit the side of my head on the corner of my desk. Luckily, nobody noticed the small knot that had immediately formed on my head and remained there for three days. I went about my normal routine. Within a week, I had resumed all of the duties that I had put on hold during my time off. By then, people had stopped looking at me like I was already dead. They had even stopped asking me about my health. Life was good again. It had been a couple of weeks since we'd invited Curtis to the house to have dinner with us. In addition to the hefty bonus we'd given him for being such a hero, I'd taken him to lunch a couple of times. That Friday, I strolled out of my office and approached him at the front entrance, which is where he spent most of his shift. Hello, Curtis. I said, bumping his fist with mine. I'd love to take you to lunch again today, and you can pick the place this time. I pretended like I didn't see the relieved look on his face when I told him to pick the place. I assumed he was tired of eating at the sushi place and that Indian place I'd taken him to the other times. He was a country boy to the bone, and it was time for me to start treating him like one. How about a place that sells some down home grub. Yes, sir. I can go for that, he said with a hearty grin. Excuse me, sir. He looked off to the side of the front entrance and greeted an incoming regular customer with a nod. I admired how courteous he was, and I gave him a huge smile when he returned his attention to me. I love me some ribs. I still love me some ribs, too, I told him. My daughter loves them more than I do. I stopped talking and shook my head. That girl can eat half a slab in one sitting. Her favorite rib joint is Smokey Moe's Rib Palace. I know. You know what? Oh, your daughter did mention to me how much she enjoyed the ribs of Smokey Moe's that evening she drove me home after I had dinner at your house. She told me they were the best ribs she'd ever eaten. Well, the girl wasn't lying. Hold on. I'm going to call her up and ask her to meet us for lunch. 
I'm sure she wouldn't mind. After all, she owes you a lot. I stepped off to the side and whipped out my cell phone, hoping Sarah had not already left the house. She answered the telephone right away. Baby, would you like to have lunch with your old man today? I asked. I would, but I already made an appointment to get my hair done, she told me, sounding disappointed. How about tomorrow? I'm having lunch with some vendors tomorrow, I sighed, disappointed too. All right then, baby. I just thought you'd like to spend a little time with Curtis and me. That boy enjoys ribs as much as you do, so I offered to take him to that Smoky Moe's place that you go to all the time. Besides that, I thought you'd like to see Curtis again. Sarah must have loved those ribs more than I thought, because as soon as I mentioned them, she changed her tune real quick. Uh, yeah, I'd like to join you for some ribs, she said quickly. I can get my hair done another day. Sarah had already arrived at Smokey Moe's Rib Palace on McKenna Street by the time Curtis and I walked in the door. She was sitting in a booth facing the exit, sipping on a Coke and a glass that had once contained jelly. I shook my head when I noticed the large clock on the wall that stopped running and the calendar next to it was from last year. That was the kind of place this joint was. But since my visits were rare, none of that bothered me. This is the kind of place where you don't sit with your back to the door, I whispered to Curtis as we made our way to the booth. On a Friday night, this low-rent neighborhood is like the wild, wild west. And since the thugs got better firearms than the cops, the cops take their time coming out here when the gunfights start. I know. I live around the corner from here, Curtis said, with a look on his face I couldn't interpret. I didn't know if he was embarrassed or offended by my comment. Oh, well, I'm happy to hear that there are still some decent, law-abiding folks living out here. Sarah stood up and gave me a big hug. Even though my baby girl and I live under the same roof, we both thought it was important to display our affection for one another on a regular basis. As crazy as the world had become, I never knew when it'd be the last time I saw her. Death was a subject none of us could ignore, especially for a sickly old man like me. My failing health was one thing, but there were other factors involved. The murder rate in San Francisco was higher than ever. A lot of the crimes were random, and sometimes the shooter mistook one target for another. It got worse. One of my business associates had lost his wife to random violence. A drug-crazed boy had shot her just because he wanted to see what it felt like to kill somebody. Sarah didn't say it often, but I knew she was worried about me up and dying any day just as much as I was but I was even more worried about something fatal happening to her. Thanks for inviting me to join you guys, Sarah said. Her arms were still around me, but I turned my head in time to see her grinning at Curtis. He was grinning back at her. Curtis was one of my most well-liked employees. Even my most difficult staff members adored him. The men liked him because he was always willing to trade shifts or work an extra shift when one of them wanted to take off. It was obvious why the women liked him. The boy was handsome, charming, and single. And during a conversation last week when I took Curtis to lunch, he told me that he had not been involved with a woman in weeks. I laughed and gave him a dismissive wave when he assured me that he was not gay and was anxious to find a nice woman. Then you're ripe for the picking, I joked. I had several attractive cashiers, single and married, who were hot to trot. And a lot of bold women customers who came in just to browse only browsed Curtis. I knew that it was just a matter of time before one of those brazen man-eaters got her hooks in Curtis. Hello, Curtis, 
How have you been? Sarah released me and shook his hand. I've been just fine, Mrs. Harper. Thank you for asking. Curtis had good manners and a lot of class for a man on his level. I slid into the booth next to Sarah on one side and Curtis slid in on the other. The important thing was all three of us were facing the door. I had noticed some pretty shady-looking dudes meandering about outside, so this was going to be a quick lunch. I've already ordered, so our plate should be here in a few minutes, Sarah announced. Three rib orders with baked beans, coleslaw, corn muffins, and a pitcher of beer. The first couple of minutes were awkward. We took turns clearing our throats and making mundane comments about everything from the food to how proud we were of Obama. I took it upon myself to get the conversation up on its feet. Baby, did you know Curtis went to the same high school you went to? I said. I'm surprised you two didn't know each other. Uh, I had to drop out and go to work, Curtis said. That's a damn shame. It's almost impossible to get a job these days without at least a high school education. I got my GED, and I put that information on my job application. You can check, Curtis said defensively, with a frightened look on his face. <laughs> I know that. I went over your application with a fine-tooth comb. We did a background check, and we verified your references. I sniffed. I quickly redirected the conversation back to the original subject. You and Sarah are both so easygoing and likable. I'm sure you could have been real good friends back then in school if you'd gotten to know one another, I remarked. I loved my son-in-law, and I knew Sarah loved him too. Had Bo not entered the picture, I would have been proud to have Curtis in my daughter's life. However, I would have done something about his line of work by grooming him for a more prestigious position. I didn't see anything wrong with a man being just a security guard, but I was glad my daughter had not married one. For one thing, I wanted my baby to be with a man who could provide for her, and I wanted her to end up with a man who had a decent education and a bright future. As much as I liked Curtis, he was going nowhere. He had nothing to offer a girl like Sarah. She would have been better off with a cat. The thought of my daughter being with a man like Curtis or any other man living a life as dismal as his made me grimace. I was glad that none of her previous relationships had panned out. Bo got to her in the nick of time. Had he not, I might have ended up with a cab driver or a fry cook for a son-in-law. Daddy, I know that look on your face. You're constipated again. You haven't been taking all of your pills, Sarah accused. She looked more than a little concerned. Yes, I have been taking all of my pills, I defended with a laugh and a gentle tap along the side of her face. Curtis, this girl cares more about other people's health than her own. Sometimes I worry about her. I paused and got more serious. I bet she would take a bullet for one of her friends if she had to. Despite my southern roots and all of the ghost stories I had heard when I was a boy, I didn't believe in premonitions or any other superstitious riffraff black folks were known for. But right after I'd made that last statement, a cold chill crawled up my spine like a poisonous snake. Chapter 43 Sarah Daddy had called me up a little while ago and invited me to have lunch with him and Curtis, and I had accepted without hesitation. When I walked into the kitchen on my way out, Vera was on the telephone, giggling like a teenager to whoever it was on the other end. The things you say make my ears burn. You're spoiling me, honey, she said, still giggling. I cleared my throat to get her attention. When she whirled around and saw me standing in the doorway, her face froze. 
Her being so fair-skinned, she blushed like a white woman. Her face went from a light brown to a candy apple red. She blinked at me and then pointed to the telephone, frowned, and shook her head. I have to hang up now, and I hope I don't have to call you again or come down there in person. Now I expect you to have my dry cleaning ready by this coming Monday. Do I make myself clear? Then she slammed the telephone back into its cradle on the wall and turned sharply to face me. Those damn Jamaicans, incompetent to the bone. I'm going to start taking my dry cleaning to the Chinese people. They are the only ones who take cleaning clothes seriously. I gave her a puzzled look. Then how are the Jamaicans spoiling you? Her face froze again when she realized I'd overheard that part of her conversation. Oh, I was just being sarcastic. I could see that Vera was flustered. Beads of sweat dotted her forehead, and she started blinking like she had something caught in her eye. She looked me up and down. I had on my jacket, and my car keys were in my hand. You look like you're going somewhere. I'm meeting Daddy for lunch at that rib joint on McKinnis, I told Vera. You want me to bring you a plate of ribs? A plate of ribs? The way she said it, gasping and screwing her face up like she'd just tasted something bitter, you would have thought I just offered to bring her back a plate of shit. I cocked my head to the side and gave Vera a weary look. Next to Colette, Vera was the most exasperating woman I knew. I had been trying for years to like them, but so far, the most I could say was that I only tolerated them. Had it not been for Daddy, I probably would have moved out of the mansion by now. I'll see you when I get back. I couldn't get away from Vera fast enough. It was a short drive to the restaurant but I had enough time to think back to last Wednesday when I took Curtis to lunch at the same place I was on my way to now. I had told Vera that I was taking Lupe Menendez to lunch to celebrate her coming out of the coma she'd been in since eighth grade. Since Vera couldn't verify that, I wasn't worried about getting busted. Curtis had met me in front of the restaurant. He looked more handsome than ever, standing in front of the window where there was a crudely printed sign noting Smokey Joe's business hours, which they rarely stuck to. He looked as happy to see me as I was to see him. You seem nervous, I told him right after we'd received our orders and started eating. I am nervous. It's been a while since I was out in public with a beautiful woman he said shyly, sliding what was left of his ribs to the side of his plate with his fork. Thank you. I needed to hear something like that. After the comment he'd just made, I had to force myself to continue eating. He gave me a sideways glance. Come on now. I'm sure you hear things like that from your husband all the time. I shook my head. I don't remember the last time my husband told me I was beautiful. He spends more time at the store than with me, and... and it's beginning to get on my last nerve. I didn't know being married to a workaholic was going to be this... this bad. And not just that, but the man frustrates the hell out of me sometimes. My stepmother treats him like a puppy she trained personally for her benefit, and he just goes along with whatever she says. I'm sorry to hear that, but that's really none of my business. I'm sorry, Curtis. I don't mean to dump my marital problems on you. We didn't have much to say about anything else, and before I knew it, we had drifted back to the subject of my marriage. Sometimes I still feel like a single woman, I complained. I don't know how my stepmother can stand Daddy spending so much time at the store and leaving her by herself. Have you tried to talk to your husband about the way you feel? He's hardly ever around, I snapped. When he is, we rush through everything. Conversations, meals, and even sex. The last time we made love, 
He came before I even got out of my clothes. Damn. Curtis bit his bottom lip, and I think it was because he didn't want to laugh at what I'd just said. Let me hush. I'm embarrassing you. You feel me? Curtis stared at me for a moment, giving me a dreamy-eyed look. Oh, yeah. I feel you, Sarah. That look was still in his eyes. He tilted his head to the side and stared at me so hard, it felt like he was looking through me, not at me. Sarah, I wish I had met you before. Before what? Before Bo. I suddenly felt awkward, but I still managed to say, I wish you had too. Uh... I'm ready to leave when you are. I wiped the barbecue sauce and the juice from the baked beans off my lips and neatly folded the paper napkin. Curtis let out a loud breath. Then he gave me such an inviting look, which included a wink. I wanted to throw him to the ground and mount him like a horny dog. I think about you all the time. He sighed. I want you to know that. His confession stunned me, but it also made me feel warm all over. I smiled demurely and looked into his eyes. Curtis, are you hitting on me? I teased. He dropped his head and began to twiddle his thumbs. When he looked back up at me, he said very slowly, Yeah, I'd like for us to know one another better. A lot better, if you know what I mean. I'm glad to hear that, I admitted. I would love to know you a lot better, and I do know what you mean. So are we going to do anything about it? It took me a moment to compose myself and get the picture of me humping him on the floor out of my mind. I hope so, I said slowly. Look, baby, if you want me to stop, you'd better tell me now. Otherwise, I'm going to take you to my place, and once we get there, I won't be responsible for my actions. Curtis's threat intrigued me, and I didn't waste any time responding. I'd like to go to your place, and whatever happens, happens. Chapter 44 Sarah I hadn't seen Curtis since the day he had taken me to his apartment after our rib lunch. He'd made love to me on his mother's living room couch. He had held me in his arms and pumped into me until I was so overwhelmed with ecstasy that I screamed like a woman being murdered. That thought had been on my mind day and night ever since. No lover had ever made me feel so special, not even Bo. The fact that I was rapidly losing interest in my husband and developing more interest in Curtis was something I could not ignore. I knew I had to do something about it. But what? Bo had told me more than once that he would never let me go. He had come home early yesterday, and right after dinner, we went up to our room and made love at his insistence. Despite my relationship with Curtis and the fact that my marriage was probably on its last leg, I still wanted to give my daddy at least one grandchild. Also, I thought that a baby by Bo would please daddy a lot more than a baby by Curtis. That was the reason I had made Curtis wear two condoms at the same time when we made love. Instead of Bo falling asleep right away, he propped his head up on some pillows and watched two of his favorite episodes of The Sopranos that he had previously recorded. The only time he spoke to me the rest of the night was when he told me to get him another beer. Now I was about to see Curtis again. With Daddy present this time, I had to make sure I didn't say or do anything stupid— and it was not going to be easy. Curtis was irresistible. I sat in my car a few minutes after I had parked. 
I could smell the aroma of barbecue wafting out of the cracks in the wall and the windows in the building where Smokey Moe's was located. I took a deep breath and entered the restaurant and placed our orders. The way some of the other patrons were staring at me made me uncomfortable, especially the one sitting at a table by the window who had seen me roll up in my Jaguar. I felt a lot more comfortable when Daddy and Curtis showed up about 15 minutes later. The patrons stared even harder at them. And it was no wonder. Daddy wore one of his Italian suits, and Curtis was still in his uniform. I was glad to be in Curtis's presence again so soon, especially since we were in the same place where we'd had our first lunch together and decided to get to know each other better. Daddy dominated the conversation. He loved to tell people how hard he had worked to become a multimillionaire. Hard work, perseverance, and being in the right place at the right time, that's all it takes to succeed in this country he said, winking at Curtis. And having a beautiful woman by your side. I hear that, Curtis said with a nod. I didn't even bat an eye when he reached under the table and massaged my knee. Curtis was probably thinking the same thing I was thinking. I wanted to make love again. Him rubbing my knee was making me squirm, so I had to say something to keep my thoughts under control. Daddy, your hair looks like the crown on a woodpecker, I said. You should either keep it cut shorter or start wearing some of those hats you own. The way it's sticking up and pointing away from your head now, it looks like you've been flying. I gently kicked Curtis's foot, hoping it would make him move his hand away from my knee. It didn't, so I shot him a hot look. He gave me a sheepish grin, but he did stop teasing me with his hand on my knee. I didn't realize it was that windy outside. Daddy patted the sides and top of his head and nose. I'm going to step into the men's room. I hope there's a clean mirror in there, he added, still patting the side of his head as he walked toward the door in the back of the room with a sign that read, Toilets, no smoking, no drugs, no weapons, no sex. Curtis, I've been thinking about you a lot since the last time I saw you. I said in a low voice. I've been thinking about you too. He growled. I hope that wasn't a one-time thing. I don't know yet. Let me rephrase that. Is there a possibility that I will see you again? My mind was a ball of confusion. I didn't want to say the wrong thing and hurt Curtis's feelings and discourage him from wanting to see me again. At the same time, I didn't want him to get too hopeful about us getting serious. What about my husband? <sighs> what he doesn't know won't hurt him. What about your job? If we get caught... You'll be looking for another job. I can get another job. I looked Curtis in the eye and asked, I'm not just another piece of ass to you, am I? His eyes got big and his mouth dropped open. He looked angry and sad at the same time. Listen to me, Sarah. You mean more to me than a piece of ass. I can get that anywhere. But I care about you. If you were my woman, I wouldn't trade you for five of the other women I've been with. He stopped talking and sucked on his teeth for a few seconds. He surprised me by what he said next. But since you mentioned it, you are a pretty nice piece of ass. I knew he was being funny, but I was not the least bit amused by what he'd just said. I hope you don't think that I'm the kind of woman who will jump into bed with other men as quick as I did with you, because I am not. I hope you're not that kind of woman. But if you are, that's your business. He winked at me. I'm just glad that you hopped into bed with me. Or onto my mama's couch, I should say. He laughed. But I was not amused by that, either. I've never... 
I never thought I'd cheat on my husband so soon into our marriage, and especially with somebody like you. Somebody like me? I didn't mean that in a bad way. It's just that you're so down to earth and I can relate to you. I enjoy your company more than the people I spend time with now. A few moments of silence passed. I didn't know about him, but I was racking my brain trying to decide what to say next. In cases like this, I usually said something stupid. This time was no different. I had a crush on you in school. One time, I even copied your answers on a test that I hadn't studied for. Oh? That's interesting. I didn't think you even noticed a thug like I was back then. I noticed you. I eagerly admitted. But not enough to even talk to me about it? I gave up my cherry to a guy whose name I don't remember. Hmm, I guess he didn't make much of an impression on you, huh? I shook my head. I only went with him because he looked a little like you. That comment made him grin like a Cheshire cat. Baby, you just made my day, he told me. Curtis glanced around again. Some nosy-ass, backstabbing individuals hung out in this restaurant— it was no wonder that the neighborhood drug dealers and other criminals were always killing a few for snitching. I recognized a heavy-set married woman who lived on the same block that my grandmother and I used to live on. She occupied a table against the wall. The man she was with was not her husband, and by the way he kept squeezing her hand and tickling her three chins, he was more than just a friend. Every time I looked in her direction, she was looking in mine. I knew a lot of unhappy wives cheated on their husbands. In the cases I knew about firsthand, the women had husbands who didn't appreciate them or have time for them. I had become one of those women. What would you say if I told you I wanted to come back to your place tonight? I asked. My knee was shaking, and not because Curtis had begun to massage it some more. I told myself that I was enough woman for Bo and Curtis, hoping it would make me feel less guilty. It did. You won't have any trouble getting out of the house? I don't live in a prison. I can come and go as I please. I would like to see you again. Curtis gazed over my shoulder, then back at me. What time can you make it, baby? I shrugged. You tell me. I didn't look around, but I heard Daddy complaining to one of the waitresses about how foul-smelling the bathroom was. Nine o'clock? I said quickly. Nine o'clock. Curtis confirmed. He raised his hand and crossed his fingers. Don't be late. I won't. I assured him with a slow lick of my bottom lip and a naughty grin. Oh, what about your mama? Will she be home? She works a night shift. She won't be home until seven in the morning. When nine o'clock rolls around, I want you knocking on my door. You feel me? I nodded so hard my neck ached. Daddy plopped back down onto his seat with a groan. That toilet was filthy. The stench was so unholy it would gag a mule. Flies as big as shot glasses buzzed around my head like a halo. Sitting on that commode was like sitting on a hole in the ground. Daddy mopped his brow with one of the few napkins on the table that he had not saturated with barbecue sauce. I don't like to rush, but I need to get up out of here. I need to get back to my office so I can use a decent restroom and spray my hind parts with some butt spray. Lord, I hope I didn't catch anything off that toilet seat. Daddy looked from me to Curtis, then at our plates, which still contained several ribs. I can't eat anything else in this place, he declared, signaling for the waitress to bring the check. Daddy paid the check, leaving a huge tip in spite of his complaints about the restroom accommodations, and we left. I parked on the street right in front of the restaurant's entrance. 
Daddy had parked directly behind me. I shook Curtis's hand again and gave Daddy another hug before I got into my car. It was a good thing we had decided not to stay any longer. A group of rough-looking young men stood a few yards away from Daddy's Lexus and my Jaguar, looking at both vehicles like they wanted to eat them. Baby, we are going to follow you until we make it out of this jungle, Daddy told me, making sure my doors were locked. I don't want you cruising around over here by yourself. A few minutes before 9 o'clock p.m., I drove back into the same neighborhood. I parked in a lot a block from Curtis's building. I eased out of my car, looking around to make sure nobody was lurking too close. And then I bolted. I sprinted all the way to his building. When I got inside and made it to his apartment on the fourth floor at the end of the hall, I pounded a tattoo on the door. He snatched it open immediately and gave me a long, hard kiss. I couldn't wait to get here, I said hoarsely, leaning my head away from his. He had kissed me so hard my lips were aching. With a grunt, he scooped me up into his arms and carried me to the living room couch. Chapter 45 Vera I was in the living room, sprawled on the couch, relaxing with a glass of wine. My feet were on the coffee table. It had been a strenuous day for me, so I deserved to kick back. I'd spent an hour on the treadmill at the gym, something I didn't do often enough. A lot of parts on my body felt like they had taken on a life of their own. So I had to do all I could to keep myself looking and feeling good. The plastic surgeons couldn't do it all. My last liposuction procedure eliminated 20 pounds off my body a few months ago, which made me look almost like a supermodel. But the loss of weight had also made other areas on my body suffer. My breasts had a slight droop to them now. I didn't even want to bother getting them lifted again, even though that would have corrected the problem. But since I wanted to go from a C cup to a D cup, getting a brand new pair was a better solution. While I was enjoying my solitude, Cash moseyed in and plopped down on the wing chair facing the couch. He had come home from work early that Friday, around four. Kenneth and Bo were still at work, as usual. Girl, you look like you don't have a care in the world, Cash teased. I don't, I said with a smirk. That's what happens when you keep up with your game. I got up and padded over to the bar and poured him a glass of wine. As soon as I handed it to him, he took a long swallow and belched like an ox. I feel you. Cash looked at me and smiled. He paused long enough to finish his wine and let out another loud belch. I remember when we were young kids. You always looked ahead. If it wasn't for you, there's no telling where me and Colette would be now. Cuz, I know you said we don't have to pay any rent or anything else to stay here, but sometimes I feel like a freeloader. I know I probably don't say it enough, but you're a beautiful person, inside and out. You got Kenneth to hire me and my woman so we can pay our way, if we have to. Why are you bringing this up? Did Kenneth say something about you and Colette living here rent-free? No, he didn't. But lately, Sarah keeps reminding me and Colette how lucky we ought to be living in this beautiful place rent-free. Her cheesy black ass is living here rent-free, too, I hollered, drinking more wine. I just don't want you to think we don't appreciate your generosity. I mean, if you ever want us to move out, all you need to do is let us know. Look, one thing you need to get in your thick skull is that you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. As long as I'm controlling the situation, you don't have to worry about anything. Fuck Sarah, that heifer. But just to be on the safe side, I hope you and Colette are banking part of your paychecks. Oh, we put aside most of our money every time we get paid. I know all good things eventually come to an end. 
We've been worried ever since Sarah got here that if something happens to Kenneth, she might get all legal and shit and derail our gravy train. And that's why we all need to milk the cow as long and as hard as we can. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Once Kenneth kicks the bucket, there's no telling how Sarah's going to behave, I said. With me being related only by marriage, I have no idea how she'll treat me. She might even get crazy enough to mess with the business, sell it or something. Kenneth keeps changing his will, and even I don't know how generous he's going to be to me and the rest of us now that he's got a blood relative in the mix. He just might leave everything or most of it to her. I'm not counting on Sarah to do the right thing and split up that money fair and square. Neither am I. If you, the wife, ain't even sure what Kenneth is going to leave you, me and Colette can't even guess how generous he'll be to us. He's not the same man he was before Sarah came. And since we're on the subject, what's the word on Sarah these days? I hope she's not putting bugs in Big Daddy's ears, encouraging him to change his will in a way that'll shortchange us and set it up so we don't get nothing. Are you keeping your eye on her? And what's she doing when she's around him? As much as I can, I sighed, shaking my head. Some days that little fool is like a fart in a windstorm, so keeping an eye on her can be a lot of work. I blew out a disgusted breath. My life was so much easier before she came here, and it doesn't seem like she's ever going to produce a baby by Bo that'll save our asses. At least since Bo married her, she's been a little easier to digest. By the way, where is your lovely wife? You two usually come home from work at the same time. She dropped me off, then took the car and went to some girl's house to get her hair braided. Listen, uh, I've been meaning to mention something that's been on my mind for a little while. Cash began to fidget like a cornered roach. That made me think that he was doing something he shouldn't be doing. Since we shared the same DNA which was thick with high levels of deceit. There was no telling what he was doing on the sly, but as long as it didn't interfere with my game, I didn't care. What's that, cuz? Have you noticed how odd Sarah's been acting all this month? Cash looked relieved. Oh, is that all that's been on your mind? He chuckled. Sarah acts odd all the time. What's your point? I think she's up to no good, I said, drinking more wine. Maybe she's pregnant again, I said hopefully. I just hope she's not having an affair. Cash whipped his head from side to side. When he looked at me, he looked scared. I sure as hell don't think that the stupid girl is that stupid. After what Gladys put Bo through... He would never get over Sarah putting him in the same trick bag. She's asking for trouble if she's fucking another man. I just hope she isn't. You better do more than hope. Bo would have a fit that would never end, and only God knows what he might do to Sarah. I snapped my fingers. Calm down. Let's not jump the gun now, I suggested, holding up my hand. I said she might be having an affair, but I'm probably wrong. If you think you're wrong, why did you even bring it up in the first place? Has she given you any reason to think she might be fooling around? Not really. But since she's been acting so strange lately, I just thought I'd mention it. Oh, well. Even if she is, most married people who have affairs don't leave their spouses, I declared. Especially if their marriage is as solid as mine. Now look at Kenneth and me. When he told me about his affair with Sarah's mother... I got mad, but I didn't get mad enough to cut off my nose to spite my face. I beat his ass, but I got over it. And he's been going out of his way ever since to make it all up to me. Looking back, I wouldn't change a thing. I'd never tell him, but his affair made me stronger and more aware and smarter. If something happens, say he leaves me for another woman. I will land on my feet no matter what. 
Cash looked even more relieved now. Vera, you are one amazing woman. Kenneth had his fun and made a baby with another woman, but you forgave him and stayed focused on your marriage. The world would be a much better place if all women were as sensible and loyal as you. I hope Sarah is learning how to be as phenomenal a woman as you are, don't you? Mm-hmm, I said. I'm doing my best to help her keep her life on track. Chapter 46 Sarah I couldn't believe I'd fallen in love with Curtis in just one month, but I had. He was the first thing on my mind when I woke up each morning and the last thing on my mind before I went to sleep every night. I loved Curtis, but I still loved my husband, too. I didn't want to hurt Bo or Curtis— I wanted all three of us to be happy. I didn't see why I couldn't have them both as long as I didn't get caught. I knew that it was wrong for me to be cheating on my husband, but it was easy for me to justify my actions. I wasn't the first married person to cheat, and I wouldn't be the last. Cheating was all around me. Bo's first wife had cheated on him. Daddy had cheated on Vera with my mother, most of his married friends had cheated on their spouses. And the way Cash stared at women's butts and titties when they were out in public, I knew he had probably had an affair or two. He could have been involved with another woman now, for all I knew. And Colette was so sneaky, she was capable of doing just about anything. I had seen her checking out other men in public. The only person that I was sure had not had an affair and probably never would, was Vera. She seemed to have eyes only for my daddy, and I knew she really did love him. With the exception of her devotion to daddy, Vera was too much in love with herself to share any more of her affections with another man. There were times I actually envied her. I wished that I could be more like her when it came to being a faithful wife, that way, having a part-time husband wouldn't have bothered me so much. Bo left me alone too often, and I was one woman who didn't want to be ignored by her man. Yesterday, Daddy and Bo left the house to go to the office before Vera and I even got out of bed. I had no idea where Vera had spent her day, but I'd spent some time with Curtis after I'd shopped at the Dollar Tree and Target for a couple of hours. I had picked him up on his lunch hour in the alley behind Daddy's main store. I forced myself not to look at Daddy's and Bo's cars in the employee parking lot as I barreled past them toward the freeway. We stopped at a liquor store and picked up a bottle of wine and some condoms. There was a McDonald's close by, so we picked up two Big Macs. We checked into the first motel we came to, which was only half a mile away from Daddy's store. After our little rendezvous, I dropped Curtis off where I'd picked him up. Then I drove to the Mission District to get my nails done. I left the nail shop about an hour later and went to a movie. When I got home that evening around six, Bo and Daddy had already come home. I was shocked when I saw both of their cars parked in the driveway. My first thought was that something had happened to Daddy. I parked my car behind Bo's silver Range Rover and jumped out. I ran into the house with my heart racing about a mile a minute. There was nobody in the living room, so I started yelling out names. Daddy? Bo? Vera? Where is everybody? I checked the dining room next. It was empty. I almost collided with Delia as I ran down the hall toward the kitchen. She must have been cooking up a storm. She smelt like onions and baked chicken, and there was flour all over the crisp white apron that hugged her barrel-shaped body like a second layer of flesh. Where is everybody? Did something happen? I asked. Delia was not the kind of servant like the ones on TV. She usually knew everything that was going on in the house, but she never stuck her nose into the family business. She knew better. She was careful not to say or do anything to jeopardize her job. 
She and her crusty old husband, Costa, and a few of her relatives who came to help out on an as-needed basis, had been with Daddy ever since he'd moved his business to California. Um, everyone is in kitchen. I believe they wait for you, Delia told me, her voice cracking. The worried look on her face caused me to worry. I continued down the hall. When I got to the kitchen doorway, I stopped in my tracks. Bo, Daddy, Vera, Cash, and Colette were sitting at the breakfast table. It looked like they were about to have a seance. They all looked up at me at the same time. I moved toward them with caution. What's going on? I stopped a few feet from the table and looked from one face to the other. Why all the long faces? Did something bad happen? That's what we'd like to know. Daddy snapped. Huh? What do you mean? I asked dumbly. I had made sure nobody saw me pick Curtis up and drop him off, and there was no way in the world they could have found out already that I'd spent time with him in a motel a few hours ago. Sarah Louise, what have you been up to? Daddy asked, his voice cracking. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could get a word out, Cash yelled, What's wrong with you, girl? What? I asked dumbly. Karen Gorman braids my hair, Colette offered. So? I said with a shrug. She does a good job. Karen lives in Hunter's Point, Bo said quickly. His eyes were red. I have a feeling somebody's trying to tell me something and I don't have any idea what it is, I said, glancing at Daddy. I didn't like the somber look that was on his face now. Sarah, why were you seen coming out of Curtis Thompson's apartment last night? Vera asked in a low voice. My jaw dropped. Who said I was at Curtis's place last night? I wailed, rotating my neck and waving my arms defensively. I had spent time with Curtis in his apartment the night before today's motel tryst. When I left Karen's place last night, I saw a car exactly like yours parked on the street in front of her building. I didn't think it was your car because, as far as I knew, you were supposed to be at a bingo game in Oakland. Anyway, I decided to check it out. For all I knew, somebody could have carjacked you. I peeped in the window, and on the back seat, I saw that red windbreaker you wear sometimes. I went back into the building lobby and saw Curtis's name and apartment number on his mailbox. I was about to leave when the elevator door opened and you walked out. I didn't want you to see me, so I ducked into the stairwell. So what if I was over there? I snapped. I still visit people over there all the time. If you saw me last night, how come you waited until now to say something about it? I wasn't going to say anything at all until... Colette stopped talking and looked directly at Bo. When I saw Curtis piling out of Sarah's car in the alley behind the store on my way back from lunch this afternoon, I got real suspicious. I don't want the wrong person to see her coming out of a man's place and get the wrong idea. I was tempted to say that the wrong person had already seen me coming out of a man's place and got the wrong idea. Colette could stir up a hornet's nest quicker than anybody I knew but I decided to remain as calm as I could. I had lunch with Curtis today, I said, looking to Daddy for support. How come you didn't mention that to anybody? Bo asked, glaring at me. If looks could kill, I would have dropped dead on the spot. I had never seen such a severe look of disgust on his face before. I go to lunch with my friends all the time, and I don't mention it to anybody, I said. I, uh, chat with Curtis when I visit the store. I'm still thankful for what he did for me. What's wrong with me taking him to lunch? 
I looked at Daddy again. Daddy, you enjoyed lunch with Curtis that day we went to the rib place, didn't you? You said you liked him. He's a good old boy, Daddy said with some hesitation. I wondered how come Vera was being so quiet now. Each time I looked at her, she looked away. But what about you coming out of his building last night? Bo barked. What were you even doing in that neighborhood by yourself at night? I wasn't by myself, I lied. I had run into Lorna Moss, the girl who used to braid my hair. She asked me to give her a ride home. I didn't even know she lived in the same building as Curtis. She insisted on giving me some gas money, but she had to collect the $10 Curtis owed her first. I went to his place with her. That's why I was coming out of Curtis's building last night. I still don't understand why you didn't mention it to me, Bo said. I was asleep when you got home last night. I was still asleep when you left for work this morning. When you called around 10 this morning, you were in a meeting. When could I have told you? Sarah, we don't want anything bad to happen to you. Curtis is a nice dude and a good employee, but you and he are from two different planets. Daddy said in a gentle voice. I could not believe my ears. What's that supposed to mean? I asked. Daddy looked so miserable, and that bothered me. He was the last person in the world I wanted to hurt. It's okay to be friends with people like him, but it's not too smart to be too friendly. He's got too many enemies. There's just no telling what one of them might do to you if you happen to be with him the next time he gets attacked. And when that happens, and if those people know whose daughter you are, you'll really be in a pickle. I've been telling Sarah that for years, Vera muttered, talking to me but looking at Daddy. I'm 26 years old, I reminded. And you're my wife. Bo said sharply. Besides, none of us really know Curtis that well. Who knows what is really on his mind? He could be cooking up all kinds of schemes to get his hands on your money. Curtis doesn't want any money from me. I guess that was the wrong thing for me to say. Vera gasped. Colette snickered. Daddy's jaw dropped. But Bo's reaction concerned me the most. He just stared at me with a blank expression on his face. If Curtis doesn't want money, maybe he wants something else from you. Cash suggested with a sneer. I don't know what's gotten into everybody. I stopped talking in mid-sentence, threw up my hands and shook my head. What the hell? I'm going to bed. I started to leave the room, but I stopped when Daddy rose. Sarah Louise, I don't want you going out in public with Curtis. Do not go to lunch with him again unless Bo or I... Daddy paused and looked from Vera to Colette to Cash. Or somebody else goes too. Oh, so now I need a babysitter? Nobody trusts me anymore? Sarah, if Curtis tries anything with you... I'm going to hurt him. Bo's words gave me a chill. It wasn't just what he said. It was also the cold, threatening tone of voice he used. He'll regret the day he was born. Bo was normally a mild-mannered man. I had never seen him angry except when his ex-wife's name came up in a conversation. That was why what he just said disturbed me so much. You don't have to worry about that. I won't even speak to the man again, even when I come by the store. I blinked. That is, if he still has a job with you now. He's still got a job. I always give people the benefit of the doubt, and that includes Curtis. Daddy said quickly, As long as nothing inappropriate is going on between you and him, he can work for me as long as he does his job right. Okay, I sighed. I don't want to get the man in any trouble, 
and I don't want him to lose his job. He's got enough problems, so I hope this conversation stays between us. I don't intend to mention anything about our concerns to him, Daddy said. Then he looked at Bo. I think we've made our point. Uh-huh, Bo nodded. This case is closed. I breathed a long sigh of relief this time, but because Bo and Daddy had come home from work early and confronted me as soon as I walked in the door, I knew this was more serious than it looked, and I sure didn't like everybody talking to me like I was a rebellious teenager. Living in a house with nothing but folks over 45 had turned into a nightmare. Maybe my home was a prison after all. It suddenly felt that way. Well, I had weaseled out of a tough spot this time. My explanation had sounded believable, even to me. But I had to do something, and I had to do it before somebody got hurt. If I continued to see Curtis, sooner or later, Colette or somebody else would see us together, and I might not be so lucky the next time. Now I knew what I had to do. I had to make a choice between my lover and my husband. Chapter 47 Kenneth I knew that no matter how well you thought you knew a person, you could never know everything there was to know about him or her. The fact that I had cheated on Vera for years without her suspecting anything was a good example. I knew that Sarah was not perfect, and I expected her to make mistakes, just like everybody else. On one hand, I wanted her to learn from her mistakes, like I had. On the other hand, I didn't want her to make mistakes that she would regret, and ones that would hurt other people. Bo was a good husband, and as long as he remained a good husband, I was going to do whatever I had to do to keep them together. I didn't like to meddle in other people's business, but... When it involved my child, I made an exception to that rule. She didn't have to know about me keeping an eye on her. Well, I keep my eye on her as much as I could, but I had suddenly decided to move it up a notch. The Monday after we'd had that discussion in the kitchen about her prowling around Curtis's neighborhood, I left my office around noon. I told my secretary I had an appointment with my tax attorney, but the truth was I had an appointment with a private investigator named Tim Larkin. I want you to follow somebody. I told him after he had shut the door to his office and motioned for me to sit down. As soon as my butt hit the chair facing his desk, I got so anxious, my knees began to knock against each other. I had never hired an investigator before in my life, and it was something I didn't feel comfortable doing. But I had decided that if I wanted to stay on top of things, I needed to know what was going on around me, especially when it involved my only child. You've come to the right place, big guy. Tim Larkin was a slightly built white dude I met at a reception back in November of 92 to celebrate Bill Clinton's win. We had a lot in common. He and I both loved our work and families more than anything. We played racquetball together every now and then, and we attended a lot of the same social events. Tim had a baby face and curly blonde hair, so he looked a lot younger than 72. Unlike me, he worked out several times a week. He was a vegetarian, and he only drank in moderation. I assumed that was what helped keep him looking and feeling so much younger. I should be so lucky. Tim knew all about my past, and he had never attempted to get in my business like some of my other male friends had. His office was on the 20th floor of a high-rise in the financial district where the rent was extremely high. With a beautiful young secretary sitting in front of his office, dressed to the nines, all the fancy furniture and exotic original paintings on the walls, a brand new Cadillac every two years, I knew that Tim was doing better than some of the other private investigators in town. For one thing, he didn't play by the rules, whatever they were. Some of the things he did were probably illegal, to say the least. 
but he'd been highly recommended to me by a colleague who had hired Tim to spy on his mistress, a predatory she-devil who had once made eyes at me. Who was the subject? Tim asked, handing me a cigar, which I eagerly accepted. I didn't light up around Vera because she hated the smell of any kind of smoke. But when I was with Mayo buddies, I was happy to indulge myself. I want you to keep an eye on my daughter, I said quickly, bile rising in my throat. The cigar smoke floating into my mouth helped hold it back. Your daughter? I nodded. Sarah Louise. Is she mixed up with the wrong crowd or something? Drugs? I don't know about any of that. If she is, I want to know that too. But right now, I'm more interested in her other activities. She's got a damn good husband, and I don't want her to lose him. Hmm, Tim paused and scratched his chin. Is there another man involved? Yes and no. Can you be a little more specific? Is she involved with another man, or is she not? It can't be both. Remember that incident at the store when one of my security guards intercepted an assault on my daughter by a would-be thief? Oh, I remember that all too well. That hit you pretty hard. Your daughter lost her baby, Tim said with a nod and a grimace. He took a drag from his cigar and flipped the ashes into a gold-plated ashtray on his desk next to a picture of his beautiful red-headed wife, his two divorced sons, and his three teenage grandchildren. Is the man involved the one who attacked her? Uh, no. She and the security guard who assisted her, they have become quite friendly. I see. Is it possible they become too friendly? Or that they might become too friendly? Tim paused again and shook his head. If you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean, and that's what I need to know. I love her to death, and I'm quite fond of her husband and the security guard. I don't want to see either one of them get hurt. I don't know if I can help keep that from happening, but I can guarantee you that I will get all the necessary information and photographs that you and your son-in-law will need to take whatever action you have a mind to. That's another thing. What's another thing? I don't want anybody to know about this. My wife, and especially my son-in-law. I don't want to look like an overprotective father, even though that's exactly what I am. I laughed, but Tim didn't. You can rest assured that whatever business we conduct is confidential, unless you advise me otherwise. Now that that's out of the way, tell me. Do you think your daughter is capable of cheating on your son-in-law? That's what I need to know. The more I know, the more I can do to keep her from ruining her life. I know she's a grown woman, but, well, you know, our babies will always be our babies, and it's our nature to protect them from harm. As a father and a grandfather, I agree with that assessment 100%. If I had my way... I'd still be tucking both my middle-aged sons into bed each night. Tim rubbed his nose and snorted and then gave me a tentative look. Is there anything else I can do for you? I know you've had to fire a few dishonest employees over the years. You want me to tail any of your current staff or anybody else? Tim cleared his throat and shifted around in his high back leather chair, which looked way too big for a dude his size. He looked to be only slightly larger than my daughter, and she was a size eight. This is a crazy world we live in, my friend. I hope I don't come off sounding like Big Brother, but men like us, we can't afford to be made a fool of. Had I been more diligent, my wife would still be with me. Oh? You and Sherry are no longer together? Tim shook his head. There was an unbearably sad look on his face. She's probably the finest Caucasian woman I've ever seen in my life. She reminds me of my beautiful bride. When did you separate? 
last month. I was so distraught, I couldn't even talk about it to my friends. Otherwise, you would have been the first to know. She moved out while I was in Baja on a weekend fishing trip with my grandsons. She served me with divorce papers a few days ago. I gave Tim a sympathetic look. From the way he was looking, I could tell that he was still distraught. The bitch, he blazed. He slammed his fist down so hard on top of the desk, everything on it rattled. Man, I am so sorry to hear that Sherry left you. What does she catch you doing? Tim's mouth flew open, and his small blue eyes rolled up in his head. Me? What does she catch me doing? She didn't catch me doing a goddamn thing. I found a package of condoms in her purse one day last month. Well, it didn't take long to find out the reason she needed them, and it wasn't for me. She's banging her masseuse, and has been for years. That, that bitch! And the killer thing is, I found out the day of our anniversary. I devoted 40 years to that woman, and look how it ended. Now that's some cold shit, Tim. I'm so sorry for you. I'm sorry for me, too. Sorry I didn't find out a lot sooner. I'd be a lot richer. I had just bought that whore a brand new Cadillac two days before I busted her. Tim held his breath and gave me a wan look. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. Now, let's get back to you and Vera, all right? Now, don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way but no woman can be trusted these days. I pursed my lips and gave Tim a stunned look. Hold on now, buddy, I shouted, holding up my hand in protest. I disagree with you on that point. I know I can trust my wife. Tim nodded and gave me a tight smile. I trusted my wife, too. Both of my sons trusted their wives, all the way up until they caught them with other men. I looked at Tim and blinked. My wife has no reason to cheat on me. Uh-huh. Let me ask you this. Did you have a reason to cheat on Vera with the woman who gave birth to your daughter? I shrugged. I didn't need a reason to cheat. Exactly. Tim had just given me another disturbing situation to think about. What was the world coming to when a man couldn't trust his wife? I had felt like hell when I first arrived at Tim's office. Now, I felt even worse. Well, now that you mention it, I think I'd like for you to keep an eye on my wife, too. Chapter 48 Vera Kenneth was in a strange mood when he got home from work that evening around 7. He offered me a half-hearted greeting and told me he wouldn't be having dinner. Baby, is everything all right? I asked, my arm on his shoulder. Yeah, why wouldn't it be? He mumbled, removing my arm as if it had the cooties. He quickly turned his head when I attempted to kiss him on the cheek. Then he brushed past me like I was some bothersome sales clerk and went upstairs to our bedroom. The way he was dragging his feet, I was worried about him walking up two flights of steps to reach the third floor. No matter how much I fussed about him exerting himself, he didn't want to relocate to one of the bedrooms on the second floor. One of his arguments was that other than sex, climbing two flights of steps each day was the only regular exercise he got these days. He used to be a lot more active. He'd always enjoyed playing golf or racquetball with some of his friends and business associates, but he rarely did those things anymore. This was the first time he'd gone to bed without dinner in years. Bo was still at the store, so it was just me, Cash, Sarah, and Colette at the dinner table. What's up with Kenneth? He's been acting strange most of the day, even stranger than usual. 
He stayed in his office alone for hours after he came back from lunch and even missed that inventory meeting, Colette said, spearing her prime rib with her fork. She was the only one enjoying the dinner that Delia had prepared. He's got a mighty big plate, and there's a lot more on it these days, I said. A lot of his loyal customers have been going to Best Buy for their electronic needs. So what? Our sales are still going strong. We don't have to worry about Best Buy, Cash said. I bet Circuit City said the same thing a few years ago, and then they shut down all of their stores, Colette pointed out. And don't forget about how Blockbuster Video came along and ran a lot of little mom-and-pop video rental stores out of business. Now that Netflix and Redbox have come along and put such a dent in Blockbuster's business, I'm surprised they're still open. Kenneth is not worried about being run out of business by the competition. But he has to really stay on top of things to make sure that doesn't happen. And he's got other issues to deal with. He's concerned about the state of his health, and I don't blame him. Some nights he thrashes around in bed like a seal and moans and groans in his sleep for hours on end. And a few relatives back in Houston keep hounding him for more loans. I paused and looked at Sarah. That niece he hasn't seen in years, the one who looks like you, she's been calling him begging for money so she can buy a beach house in Cabo St. Lucas. With everything that's going on in his life right now, I'm not surprised. Kenneth doesn't act strange more often. Kenneth is not the only one acting strange, Colette commented, grabbing her third roll off the platter next to the prime rib. Sarah, you're acting mighty peculiar this evening, too. You must be depressed about something. Did all the rib joints close down or what? She snickered. I wouldn't know, Sarah hissed. I haven't been near the rib joints lately. We finished our meal in silence. Cash and Colette moved to the living room. Sarah went upstairs to her room, I assumed. I checked on Kenneth, glad to see that he was asleep. One thing I liked about him was that when he turned in for the night and went to sleep, he slept like a log and usually didn't wake up until morning. He'd been feeling fairly well lately, but he hadn't attempted to make love to me in over a week, and that was fine with me. I desperately wanted to visit Ricky, but a sharp pain in my lower abdomen had been bothering me all day, and even though I was as horny as a blue goose, I didn't think that one of Ricky's vigorous sex workouts was in my best interest. As a matter of fact, I was worried about the pain I was experiencing. It was something that I had never felt before. Last year, during my routine visit to my gynecologist, he told me that I had a few medium-sized fibroid tumors, which were common among black women, especially in my age group. These little boogers are nothing to be concerned about, Dr. Lott had assured me. But I was mildly concerned anyway. I swallowed a couple of Advil, and the pain eased up considerably. Then I took a long, hot bath and gave myself a douche. After I dried myself off and was about to put on a clean pair of panties, I noticed blood on my thighs. It wasn't the first time, and I wasn't really that concerned about it. Dr. Lott had told me that it was because of the fibroids. He also advised me to refrain from sexual intercourse whenever I saw blood. That was the only reason I didn't pay Ricky a visit that night. Cash and Colette had gone to bed by the time Bo came home around 10 p.m. I had returned to the living room and curled up on the couch with a glass of wine. What's up, cuz? Bo asked, entering the living room with a bouquet of roses. He looked toward the stairs. Is Sarah home? Yes, yeah, she's home. She's been in her room since she ate dinner. What are the flowers for? I feel bad about the way we all came down on her the other night about her relationship with that security guard. I stood up and slapped my hands onto my hips. 
you feel bad. She's the one that fucked up. She ought to be bringing you flowers, I yelled, glancing at my watch. And where have you been all this time? It's 10 o'clock. What the hell is it to you, Vera? You're not my wife, Bo snapped. You better be glad I'm not your wife, I shouted. I asked you a simple question, and the least you can do is give me a simple answer. People do worry about you, and you could have called to let somebody in this house know where you were. Bo gave me a wide-eyed look. You know damn well where I was. I was at work. What's gotten into you? He dropped the flowers onto the coffee table. I followed him as he made his way to the bar and poured himself a double shot of Jack Daniels. Shit, I have enough problems as it is. I don't need you riding my ass, too. I'm sorry. I was just worried about you. I got another drink, and then I returned to the couch, dropping back into the same spot I'd been occupying most of the evening. Well, you don't need to worry about me. Bo sipped his drink, loosened his tie, and flopped down on the couch. Did Sarah leave the house today? He asked, crossing his legs. I don't keep tabs on your wife, I replied. If you care so much about her comings and goings, how come you don't spend more time with her? Especially now that you know she might be getting too friendly with that security guard. We're going through inventory at the store all this week. You know that either Kenneth or I need to be present at all times during this procedure. I was surprised that Bo had ignored my last comment. Well, I doubt if inventory is more important than your marriage. I'm telling you that if you want to keep your woman, you better find out what she's up to or else... I didn't like the way Bo was looking at me. His eyes had darkened, and the way he furrowed both his eyebrows, they looked like two sleeping caterpillars. I knew what was on his mind before he even said it. Or else what? She'll become like you? His comment compelled me to drink some more wine. Become like me? What do you mean by that? I asked wiping wine off my lips with the back of my hand. If you are insinuating that I'm fooling around with another man, you are wrong. I love my husband too much to cheat on him, and I don't appreciate you saying some shit like that to my face, and to think that one time you even suggested I have an affair. Bo gulped down the rest of his drink and gave me a look that I would never forget. His face tightened, and it looked like he was in pain. That's why I was surprised by what he said next. Vera, what if Sarah is fucking another man? If she is, you better do something about it, but quick. I would hate to see you melt down the way you did when you found out Gladys was playing you for a fool. Bo's eyes darkened even more and his jaw began to twitch. I know it sounds like I'm getting all up in your business. Sounds like. He leaned his head back so far I was surprised it didn't roll off his shoulders. Then he had the nerve to give me an amused look. If you got up in my business anymore, we'd be conjoined twins. I had to laugh at that myself. I cleared my throat and shook my head. Let's get serious. Come into the kitchen, I suggested. I don't like to say too much in here. You never know when somebody's going to sneak up on us. We set our glasses on the coffee table, and Bo followed me to the kitchen. As soon as we got there, I whirled around and said to him, By the way, since we're on the subject of Gladys again, she called. We stood by the back door with our eyes on the entrance. If somebody came toward the kitchen from another part of the house, we'd hear their footsteps approaching on the hardwood floor in the hallway. I liked having my most sensitive conversations in this location, 
because it was the most private room on the first floor. Gladys called. When? How did she get this number? Bo asked anxiously. She called Cash's number at the store. When? Today. He was out of the office when she called, so your nitwit secretary called here looking for him. Madeline didn't give Gladys the number here. Madeline is a dingbat sure enough, but she knows better. Did Gladys leave a phone number for Cash to call her back? Yeah, she left a phone number. Madeline said she'd give it to Cash when he returned to the office. And that's not all. What else? A little while ago, when I told Cash she called, he came clean. Came clean how? He told me he had called her back before he left work. Then he told me that he had received a letter from her also today, and in it she begged him to tell you to call her up. She included a note in the envelope for him to give to you. She sent a mail out here? Don't worry, she didn't send it here. She doesn't have our address. She sent it to the post office box, cash rents. I didn't know how to interpret the look on Bo's face. His eyes were glassy, and his nostrils were twitching. Let me go talk to Cash. I noticed his hands were shaking. Excuse me, he said in a scratchy tone of voice. He wobbled across the floor toward the door like a man who'd had a few drinks too many. Then he stopped and turned back around and looked at me. He looked so helpless and confused I felt sorry for him. He kept glancing toward the door and shifting his weight from one foot to the other. I need to know what's going on. I guess I won't find out unless I talk to her. I'm going to go upstairs and talk to Cash. I want to see that letter. Bo, you know as well as I do why Gladys is trying to get in touch with you. I'm sure she knows you've remarried, but she doesn't give a damn about that. She still wants you back. You better watch your step now. You've got a good thing going with Sarah. Don't mess it up. You forget about Gladys. And I'm sure Sarah has already forgotten about that security guard. She looked like a scared rat that day in the kitchen. If she was considering doing something inappropriate with him, she won't now. Not now that she knows all eyes are on her. We left the kitchen and returned to the living room. I sat down on the couch while Bo paced back and forth in front of me a few times. I love Sarah. If she ever leaves me, I'm a killer. Don't talk like that. Take it back. Take it back right now, Bo. You're scaring me. All right, I take it back, he muttered. Then he laughed. I laughed along with him. When he left the room to go upstairs, I put what he'd just said about killing Sarah out of my mind and fixed myself another drink. I remained in the living room for another hour, wondering exactly what Cash and Bo were talking about upstairs. When I finally went to my room, Kenneth was snoring like a moose with asthma. The next morning, when he nudged my rump with his knee, I ignored him. Baby, you still sleep? He whispered, coughing to clear the phlegm out of his throat. How about a little squeeze? It's been a while, and I know you need some good loving as much as I do. His foul morning breath on the back of my neck made me cringe. I held my breath and continued to play possum until he got up and went into the bathroom to take his shower. I wasn't going to go downstairs until I was sure Kenneth had left the house. I needed more time to think and organize my thoughts. There were a lot of things rolling around in my head that morning, especially what Kenneth had said before he left the room. He was right. It had been a while, and I did need some good loving, and I was going to do something about it real soon. 
Chapter 49 Sarah I had started on my way back downstairs to see if any of that prime rib we'd had for dinner was left when I heard Bo's voice. He and Vera were in the living room. I had no idea what they had been discussing before I got to the stairs, but when I heard her tell him to go into the kitchen with her, I whirled around and made a beeline to my old bedroom. All of the nursery items I had put in there were still intact, awaiting the baby I still hoped to have someday. As I shut and locked the door, I ran to the air duct and opened the vent. I was horrified by what I heard this time. I was not surprised that Bo's ex wanted to get in touch with him. She had probably finally realized what a good man she had lost. But I was surprised that he seemed so interested in what she had said in the letter to him that she'd sent to Cash. And whatever it was, I needed to know. For one thing, if Bo was not going to let another man cause problems in our marriage— I was certainly not going to let another woman, especially Gladys, do it. Every doggone thing I'd heard about the woman was nasty. She had treated Bo like a dog. Why would he even want to talk to her again? I had not seen Curtis since the day Daddy busted me in the kitchen in front of everybody. I had called him up the next day, though. I'm really sorry, but I don't think I can see you again. I had told him. Somebody saw me coming out of your apartment building. Do they know anything? No. All they know is that I was there. I told them I'd been over there dropping off a friend. But they are not stupid. I have a feeling they know we're sleeping together. I see. Well, the last thing I want is for you to get in trouble, Sarah. I care too much about you to let that happen. It's not worth it. And anyway, it really bothers me having to sneak around to be with you. I know. I don't like sneaking around either. And I know you need your job. I just wish... I just wish things were different. Different how? Like, if Bo gave me a real good reason to see you, I mean. You're married to the man. If you don't love him, you need to leave him. If he's good to you, well, good men are hard to find. You women have been saying that loud and clear for as long as I can remember. Don't throw all that away from me. But I care about you, Curtis. When I'm with you, I feel like a different woman. A woman who is appreciated. I don't feel that way with Bo anymore. A long, uncomfortable silence passed before either of us spoke again. I only want the best for you, he told me. Do you want to see me again? Sarah, be serious. You know how I feel about you. If it was up to me, I'd move you in with me today. I'm happy to hear you say that. We can still see one another and just be more careful. We were being careful, and some busybody still saw us. What do you think would happen if your old man found out for sure that we've slept together? I don't know. Well, I don't want to know. Now, if things change, maybe we can see each other again someday. Curtis's last statement brought tears to my eyes. I knew I had to hang up before I broke down and cried. I guess there's nothing else to say, so I'll let you go. Good night, Curtis, I said quickly. Good night, Sarah. If things change, let me know. I will, I managed. When Bo and Vera left the kitchen, I closed the vent and ran back to my bedroom, praying I wouldn't bump into Bo on his way to Cash's bedroom at the end of the hall. I was in bed when Bo came into our bedroom about 15 minutes later. My last conversation with Curtis was still on my mind, as well as the conversation I'd just heard between Bo and Vera in the kitchen. So I felt like shit. I would have pretended to be asleep if Bo had not leaned over and tickled my neck. 
Hi, baby, I said with a fake yawn. I heard your car pull up a while ago. What took you so long to get up here? Huh? Oh, um, as soon as I got in the house. Uh, Vera hung me up for a few minutes, and then I had to discuss some business with Cash. What kind of business did you have to discuss with Cash that couldn't wait until tomorrow? Bo removed his jacket and placed it at the foot of the bed. He took his time answering my question. Uh, some inventory issues, that's all. Kenneth and I will be visiting the other four stores tomorrow, and after that, we'll be in meetings the rest of the day. I needed some information from Cash beforehand. I could see that he was nervous. He kept scratching his neck and clearing his throat. I'm going to take a quick shower and get some of this funk off me, he said, smelling under his arms. I waited until I heard him turn on the shower. Like a jackrabbit, I hopped off the bed and ran to his jacket. I found the letter from Gladys in the first pocket I checked and read it in record time. I couldn't believe how corny her words were. My dearest Bohannon, I really would like to talk to you. I know you're not happy with that cow you married, and from what Cash has been telling me, how pitiful you look without me. I know I hurt you, but you didn't let me explain my actions, so that's why I left when I did. And I was afraid that if I stayed, you would have hurt me like you had threatened to do so many times before. I still work at the same place, and you know the number. I can meet up with you next week if you go to L.A. with Kenneth for that software conference that Cash told me about. My cell phone number is still the same, so I'd like to hear from you. I love you, Bo, and I always will. With all my love and blessings, your Gladys. What the fuck? Who signs a letter, your Gladys? It was obvious that Cash had been telling this witch all kinds of shit about me. How else would she know enough about me to call me a cow? And Cash, with his two-faced backstabbing self, had bashed her in my presence as much as Bo and Vera had. I was tempted to rip the letter to shreds, but I didn't. I folded it up, tucked it back into Bo's pocket, and climbed into bed. He came out of the bathroom a few minutes later with a towel wrapped around his naked body. Vera decided she is not going to L.A. with Daddy for that software conference next week, I said, waiting with bated breath to hear his response. She told me. He sniffed and then started drying his wet hair with the towel. Seeing his naked body didn't excite me the way it used to. It only made me cringe. I'm worried about Daddy going off for almost a whole week by himself, so maybe I'll go with him. Oh, no. You don't have to do that. I know how much you hate things like those damn conferences. Bo protested. He sat down hard on the bed, pulling me into his arms. Uh, well, I've decided to go after all. The way his voice cracked and the way he was sweating after just coming out of the shower was enough to convince me that he was up to no good. For one thing, he had already told me that the last thing he wanted to do was attend another conference so soon. He and Daddy had spent four days in Vegas at another one two months ago. Now here he was telling me he was going to another anyway. If it's all right with you, he added. Uh-huh. Well, you go on to L.A. then, I said stiffly. Our marriage was already in the toilet bowl. I just didn't know which one of us was going to flush it down. I hope you have a lot of fun. Bo made love to me that night. His body was so stiff and tense it felt like I was fucking a tree. He didn't even kiss me like he usually did when we made love. 
When I looked into his eyes, he didn't even acknowledge me. It was like he couldn't even see me. That made me think that Gladys was the woman on his mind when he rammed into me so hard, my head hit the headboard. If so, that made us even, because when I came, Curtis was the one on my mind. Bo and Daddy left for L.A. the following Monday morning. They were supposed to be gone for five days. That Monday evening, I called up Curtis again. I almost hung up the phone when a woman with a husky voice answered. Hello, is Curtis available? Speak up, I can't hardly hear you. And hurry up, I got things to do. I thought I dialed the wrong number. What number did I reach? I asked. <laughs> What's wrong with you, girl? You reached the number you just dialed. Is Curtis available? I asked again, and much louder. No, nah, he ain't here. I had encountered a lot of angry black women in my life, but this one sounded like she was on fire. Do you think he'll be home soon? He might be, and he might not. You have to call back if you really want to know. Shoot. She hung up before I could tell her who I was. I called four more times that day until Curtis answered. Hello, Sarah. Mama told me you called. I didn't even leave my name, I gasped. How did she know it was me? She didn't. You're the only woman who calls me here these days, he laughed. When Mama said some proper-sounding gal called, I knew it had to be you. Can I come see you? Sarah, we've talked about this. Have you already forgotten our last conversation? You said that you didn't want to see me again because of your husband. I might not be with Bo too much longer. You what? He's probably going back to Houston to get back with his ex. Probably? So you don't know for sure if he is or not? No, I don't know for sure, but there is a chance that he will. So it's just a chance that he might be moving back to Houston. A chance is better than nothing. Look, Sarah, I don't know what's going on between you and your husband, but I don't want to get caught in the middle. He's been giving me some mysterious looks lately, so I need to watch my step. Well, I don't know why he's been giving you mysterious looks. I don't want to find out. The thing is, I don't think we should see each other again especially now that you think Bo suspects we're involved. All right, I replied slowly. As much as I knew I needed to end this call, I still wanted to prolong it as long as possible. If that's the way you want it, I won't call you again. Wait, don't hang up yet. I just thought about what you said about Bo possibly going back to his ex-wife. What makes you think that? He loves his job, so why would he want to give it up to move back to Houston and start over again? I don't know. Has he been talking to his ex? She sent him a letter through cash. Oh. Did you see the letter? Yes, I did. I think Bo changed his mind about going to L.A. so he could meet up with her there. I'm surprised to hear that. You told me she had been the wife from hell to him. Going back to a woman like that is not something a smart man like Bo would do. Maybe Bo's not as smart as you think he is. I sighed. Well, I'll let you go now. And you don't have to worry. I won't bother you anymore. Sarah, wait. Don't hang up yet. Um... You know, I want to continue seeing you, but things are kind of hot right now. It wouldn't be cool for you to come over here. I have some nosy-ass neighbors, and the less they see you over here, the better. So, do you still want to be with me? I do, he muttered, releasing a long, drawn-out sigh. 
Do you want to meet me someplace else other than your apartment? I didn't give Curtis a chance to answer my question. We can get a room across the bay. He took his time responding. That made me even more anxious to see him. If he still wanted to see me. Uh, let me think about it. Don't make me wait too long, Curtis. I've waited long enough. I won't, he assured me. I've waited long enough, too. Chapter 50 Vera Even though Dr. Lott had told me not to worry about the bleeding, I was worried now because I'd been bleeding every day for a week. I'd already gone through menopause and hadn't had a period in over ten years. I hated walking around with a bloody pussy again after so many years, so I was anxious to have something done to end it. The main reason was I wanted to get on with my sex life. I believed that the longer I let this unpleasant issue go, the worse it would get. Yesterday I had bled so heavily the tampon I'd inserted had been useless. I found that out at the most inconvenient time. I had gone to a specialty market in Chinatown to pick up a few gourmet items, like some black goat cheese and caviar. While I was standing in the checkout line, I got this funny feeling between my thighs. It felt like I was peeing on myself. Anyway, I looked down and was horrified when I saw blood dripping onto my handmade Italian sandals, not to mention my silk-wrapped toenails. I almost fainted. I didn't even wait around to pay for the items I'd picked up. I dropped them onto the counter and flew out the door like the place was on fire. I didn't want to mess up the seat in my spotless Ferrari, so I ran to a newspaper rack on the sidewalk and got four copies of the San Francisco Chronicle. I used the newspapers as padding on my car seat. I made it back home and into my bathroom by the skin of my teeth. Not only had the blood soaked through my tampon, it had pushed the tampon completely out. It sat in the crotch of my panties along with a blood clot the size, shape, and color of a plum. I immediately called my doctor's office. Dr. Lott was on a conference call, but I made such a fuss, his receptionist put me on hold, and a minute later, Dr. Lott was on the line. Look, Dr. Lott, I've been bleeding like a damn hemophiliac all day, I roared. I'm scared to leave the house or sit on anything for more than a few minutes because I'm flowing so heavily. Blood dripped through my underwear and down my legs while I was in the checkout line a little while ago. Hmm. Well, in addition to a tampon for more security, try wearing a maxi pad as well, the good doctor said in a calm voice, which was easy for him or any other man to do. There was not a man alive who could truly understand what we women had to go through with our bodies, not even the men who had undergone that sex change operation that turned them into women. That should take care of the problem. If it doesn't, we'll consider other protective options. Other protective options? Bah! If you're talking about adult diapers, no way. Now, there has to be something you can do to end this mess. I need to take care of this problem immediately. Mrs. Lomax, calm down. I've explained to you that this is a very common problem among women your age. Bullshit! I don't care if it is. I want it to end, and I want it to end now. As I've told you, we can do a minor procedure to eliminate the problem. I can remove the fibroids that are causing the bleeding. But that would be like going after a fly with a shotgun. I've also told you that because you're at the postmenopausal stage, all of your fibroid tumors will eventually shrink to a point where they'll hardly even be detectable. As a matter of fact, the last time I examined you, I noticed they'd already shrunk considerably from their original size. However, if the bleeding becomes more serious within the next day or so and begins to disrupt your usual activities, including ones of uh, 
uh, sexual nature, let me know. My sexual activities had already been disrupted enough. I wanted to see Ricky as much as he wanted to see me. And the one thing I knew about young men was that if they got too horny and couldn't control themselves, they'd stick their dick into the first available female if they had to. The bleeding got so bad after I got off the phone with Dr. Locke. I called him back 20 minutes later and told him he had to do something or I was going to change doctors. He modified his schedule and arranged for me to have an emergency surgery the following day, which was a Wednesday. I'd check into the hospital in the morning and be out by the middle of the afternoon. Kenneth and Bo had left for L.A. the day before. I saw no reason for me to tell either one of them, or anybody else, that I was going to have the surgery. My numerous and frequent cosmetic surgeries were no secret. But when I had to deal with a female-related issue, I chose to keep that information to myself. For one thing, I didn't want Kenneth to cut his trip short and come back home. And I didn't want Colette to know because I didn't like the way she always brought up my age whenever I had a medical issue, even my cosmetic surgeries. Despite the fact that having a few fibroid tumors removed was a minor surgery, Dr. Lott had made it clear that afterward, I couldn't drive myself home or be sent home in a taxi. Our chauffeur was on vacation, so he couldn't drive me to and from the hospital like he did when I had my cosmetic procedures. Since I didn't trust any of my few female acquaintances, Sarah was the only person I could turn to. She had nothing but time on her hands these days, and I knew she'd keep her mouth shut if I told her to. Are you sure you don't want Daddy to know about you having surgery? she asked as she drove me to the hospital that Wednesday morning. What if something goes wrong? You could die like James Brown's wife did during her minor surgery. Kanye West's mama died during surgery, too. And what about Usher's ex-wife? She almost died, too, when she... I am not going to die, Sarah. I've been having surgeries done most of my life, and I'm still here. Besides, Kenneth has enough to worry about without me adding to it. My surgery went well. As soon as the anesthesia wore off, I tumbled out of the hospital bed and hobbled to the bathroom. I was delighted not to see even a speck of blood. I was as good as new. Sarah picked me up a little after 4 p.m. and drove me home. As soon as I got inside, I scrambled up the stairs to the third floor, puffing like a dying horse. I scolded myself because I hadn't insisted on Kenneth having an elevator installed so we wouldn't have to climb so many damn steps to get to our bedroom. Sarah was right behind me yelling, Sarah, stop running! Take it easy before you hemorrhage or something! I ignored her command. I didn't stop running until I reached my bedroom bathroom. You can have these, I said to Sarah with a chuckle, handing her what was left in the box of tampons and heavy-duty Kotex I had purchased. I exhaled and was smiling until I saw my reflection in the mirror over the sink. I didn't like what I saw. Without makeup, I looked like an old hag. I was anxious for Sarah to leave my side so I could resume my normal daily activities. And the first thing I wanted to do was take a long, hot shower and put on some makeup. I probably won't need any of those things for a while, she told me with a faint smile. I had started to walk away, but Sarah's words made me stop in my tracks. Why not? Are you pregnant again? I asked, wanting to cross my fingers. No, I just got off my period yesterday. But when Bo gets back home, I want to get started on getting pregnant again. Oh, I said, smiling to hide my disappointment that she was not pregnant. I hope you'll get pregnant again real soon. 
Dr. Lott told me I had to wait a whole month before I could have sex again. It was going to be one of the most difficult things I ever had to do in my life. And since Ricky was so damn irresistible, I knew I couldn't even be in his presence without wrestling him to his bed. I decided to not even visit his apartment for that month. Aw, shit, baby. What am I going to do for a whole month? It's already been too long since the last time we had some fun, he whined, when I called him up and told him. I had called him from my cell phone in my bedroom. Can't you even come by and just play with me a little bit? When it came to sex, I didn't play. I didn't do hand jobs because I decided when I was a young girl that that was beneath me. That was for teenage boys, inmates, and perverts. I gave a mean blowjob, but I didn't even want to visit Ricky tonight if that was all I could do. There was nothing in a blowjob for me, and my pussy was too sensitive from the surgery for me to let him eat me out. It would be hard, but I could survive for a month. Then I would make up for all the lost time. The very thought of all the fun I was going to have made me tingle. I'll see you in a month, I promised, spreading my thighs and gently fingering myself to make sure I was still dry. But I'll call you up every day. Will you talk dirty to me when you call? That was another thing. Talking dirty was beneath me, too but I didn't mind doing it if it turned my man on. I especially didn't mind doing it when Ricky was on top of me, but I couldn't see myself with a telephone in my hand talking trash. I hadn't done anything that vile since some of my desperate girlfriends and I had worked as telephone sex operators in high school. I'd find something to keep myself busy for a month, which meant I'd do some serious shopping. An hour after Sarah had brought me home and fixed me some hot green tea, she left the house to go get her nails done, or so she claimed. I prayed for her sake that she was not still sniffing after that low-life security guard or anybody else. I didn't know what kind of sex life she had with Bo these days, but if she was half as frustrated as I was, I could understand her going outside of her marriage. I just hoped that she was as sly as I was and didn't get caught. I couldn't stop thinking about something Bo had told me after we'd confronted Sarah about getting too friendly with Curtis. If she ever leaves me, I'm going to kill her. I didn't think he'd go that far. But if he did, we would all be up shit creek without a paddle. Chapter 51 Sarah A couple of hours had passed since I'd brought Vera home from the hospital. Since she was in the living room at the bar, and had been for the past hour, I assumed she was doing just fine. I wasn't, though. I needed to go somewhere I could be completely alone. My head had so many disturbing thoughts and questions floating around in it, I had to sort them out as soon as I could before I lost my mind. I couldn't even think clearly with her lurking about. And I didn't want to hole up in my bedroom or any other room in the house. Vera saw me leaving, but from the way she kept her cell phone glued to her ear as she waved me toward the front door... I had a feeling she wanted to be alone for a while, too. At first, I just cruised along, meandering from one street to another, thinking about one thing after another. I couldn't stop thinking about the letter Gladys had sent to Beau and how he had not told me about it yet. Was he going to meet with her in L.A.? If so, would she talk him into reconciliation? And even if they didn't get back together... What if he made love to her while he was in L.A.? If he did and I found out, I was going to be pissed, and our marriage would be over for sure. If he didn't, 
the respect and trust that I had lost for him in the last few months would somewhat be restored. And then there was Curtis. Despite his apprehension about continuing our relationship as long as I was still with Bo, he had admitted that he wanted to see me again. I hadn't spoken to him since our conversation Monday evening, right after Daddy and Bo left to go to L.A., but I planned to call him up again real soon. I needed to know for sure if there was a chance that we'd have a future together. If I lost Bo to Gladys, would Curtis still want to be with me? I wanted to keep Curtis so I'd have him to fall back on in case Gladys took Bo away from me. On the other hand, if Curtis decided he didn't want to continue his relationship with me, I wanted to have Bo to fall back on. In the meantime, I'd continue to be with Bo and Curtis as long as I could get away with it, like I had originally planned. And there was another important factor in this equation. I had to produce a baby by Bo to keep Daddy and Vera happy. And to keep Bo happy, too, in case I ended up settling for just him and severing my relationship with Curtis. Besides, I really did want a child. I thought that motherhood might help me decide exactly what I wanted to do about my future and which man I wanted to share it with. Finally, I got tired of driving and decided to get my nails done. As I sat in Maria's nail shop on Valencia Street in the Mission District waiting my turn, I fished my cell phone out of my purse and called the Marriott Airport Hotel that Daddy and Bo had checked into. Since it was so late in the day, I assumed they'd be out of their meetings by now. Daddy answered his line right away. It's me, Daddy. I was thinking about you and decided to call so I could hear your voice. I sniffed. How's the conference going? It's going just fine. The speaker, a gentleman from Harvard, is a real visionary when it comes to being more innovative in the world of business. I'm glad I brought my tape recorder with me. I wish you could have come with us. Hmm. Well, maybe next time I'll go with you. Baby, is everything all right? You sound sad. Is something the matter? No, everything is just fine, Daddy. I bit my bottom lip. Where's Bo? He's in his room, I guess. Has he been with you all the time? Are you keeping an eye on him? Daddy hesitated and grunted under his breath before he answered my questions. Girl, why are you asking me something like that? Bo is a grown man, so why do I need to keep an eye on him? I was just wondering if you and him were spending a lot of time together. We're not on a vacation, honey. We're down here on business. I see him during the sessions, of course, but after each one ends, it's every man for himself. I'm having dinner with an old friend from college who lives in L.A. now. Don't go to an Italian restaurant. Bo will be farting for days. Bo's not going with us. I invited him, but he's going to hook up with an old friend, too. An old friend? I knew that if the old friend was Bo's ex, he probably would not have mentioned it to Daddy. But I had to ask anyway. Who is the old friend Bo's going out with? He didn't tell me. He just told me a little while ago. All I know is that it's an old friend of his from Houston. But if I see him in time, I'll tell him not to do Italian. I do enough farting for the both of us. Daddy chuckled. I slid my tongue across my bottom lip, fuming. The old friend from Houston had to be Gladys. My lips began to quiver while I tried to decide what to say next. Hello? Sarah, are you still there? You got mighty quiet all of a sudden. I'm still here, Daddy. Will you tell Bo I called? Baby, he's your husband. Why don't you just call his room and tell him yourself? I'm sure he'd love to hear your voice. Okay, I will. Sarah, is there something going on that you don't want to tell me about? No, nothing is going on. 
Then why did you call me before you even called up your husband? He told me he left you two messages yesterday, and so did I for that matter. And you're just now calling back. But you should be calling him instead of me, don't you think? I figured he was probably busy. Well, I could have been busy too, but you still called me. Daddy laughed again. Honey, there's a lot you need to learn about marriage. He paused, and then all of a sudden, he sounded like a love-struck schoolboy. By the way, where is my beautiful bride? Lord, do I miss that sweet little woman. Vera? She was watching television when I left the house, Daddy. I, I hate to rush off the phone, but the girl is ready to do my nails. I'll talk to you later. The girl was ready to do my nails, but I signaled for her to give me a few more minutes. I immediately called the hotel operator again. I had her patch me through to Beau's room. He didn't answer, and I didn't leave a message. I hung up and dialed the hotel operator again. Can you tell me if a Gladys Harper has checked in yet? One moment, please. The operator put me on hold for about ten seconds. Yes, she checked in last night. I'll transfer you to... That's okay, I yelled. Then I hung up. I didn't really want to talk to Vera, so when I called the house and she didn't answer, I was glad. I left a voicemail message and told her I was going to the movies. I even drove to the Metreon Theaters downtown and bought a ticket for a movie I'd already seen, so I'd have a stub in case I needed it. I returned to my car, hopped in, and barreled toward the freeway that would take me to Curtis's neighborhood in less than ten minutes. I was going to call him up first to make sure he was home and alone. The last thing I wanted was to drop in and find him with company, especially a female. Even his mama. When I got to his block, I pulled into the parking lot of a nearby liquor store and dialed his number. His answering machine was supposed to pick up on the fourth ring, but it didn't. On the seventh ring, his mother answered, sounding as hostile as ever. Hello, she growled. Who is this? I was tempted to hang up without saying anything. Curtis had caller ID, so she would know who was calling, if she could read. I'm a friend of Curtis's, I said in a meek voice. Is he home? Nope, he gone somewhere. Do you expect him to return soon? I don't expect nothing but to take my bath like I was fixing to do when this phone rung. I'm sorry I interrupted your bath, ma'am. It took all of my strength for me to remain civil. Would you please tell him that Sarah called and I'll call back again? Just don't call back here while I'm taking my bath. This is my only night off this week and all I want to do is relax. The woman slammed the telephone down so hard I heard a popping noise in my ear. After I got my nails done and left the shop, I did some window shopping along Mission Street. It was after nine, so most of the businesses had closed for the day. I called Curtis's number two more times on my way home. Each time, I was harshly told by his mother that he was gone somewhere. I turned my telephone off. When I got home and into my bedroom, I turned it back on. There was a message from Bo. He had also left a message for me on the landline. He was the last man in the world I wanted to talk to at the moment, but I called his room anyway. He didn't answer, so I called Daddy again. Have you seen or spoken to Bo since I talked to you today? I asked. I ran into him in the elevator on my way up a little while ago. He was on his way back out to meet his friend from Houston again. Boy, was he in good spirits. He was grinning from ear to ear. I heard some muffled voices on Daddy's end. Baby, I have to go. I'm supposed to meet a few folks for drinks downstairs, and I'm already late. 
I didn't even bother to look for Vera. Her car was in the garage, so I assumed she was in her bedroom. I went back downstairs, and Cash and Vera were in the living room watching some reality show. I returned to my room, took a hot shower, and climbed into bed. Now that I knew Gladys was in L.A., my thoughts were not as unclear as they'd been earlier in the day. I pretty much knew what I wanted to do now. Because of Bo's actions and the way he was keeping important information about his ex-wife from me, it was going to be easy for me to choose. If he wanted to get back with Gladys, I was not going to stand in his way. I didn't believe in fighting for a man. If he didn't want to be with me, I didn't want to be with him. It looked like Curtis was the man I was going to be with after all. Chapter 52 Kenneth The next month went by quickly. I was glad I hadn't heard from Tim, but I was tempted to call him just to make sure he had nothing to report on Sarah or Vera. But the fact that he had not called me told me all I needed to know. I told myself that if either of them was guilty of anything, they would have slipped up by now. Or so I thought. I was in my office at the store, relaxing after a three-martini lunch with my accountant. I had a meeting to attend in a few minutes, and I was going to make sure it was a short one. I planned to leave the office early so I could pick up some flowers for my lovely bride and take her to a French restaurant in Sausalito that she liked so much. It was a Friday, and I planned to spend the weekend doing as little as possible. I was in such a good mood. I was whistling. When my private line rang and I saw Tim's name on the caller ID, I stopped whistling and answered the call immediately. Thank God I caught you, Tim began. Tim, hey, buddy, good to hear from you, I greeted in a tentative tone of voice. What's up? I unbuttoned the top button on my shirt, slid my hand inside, and placed it over my heart. It had already begun to thump like mad. Can we talk? he asked. Is this a convenient time for you? I have a meeting to go to, but... I can spare a few minutes. I glanced at my Rolex. I was already late for the personnel meeting I had had my secretary schedule, but that was of no importance to me right now. Even though Tim and I were close friends, he usually didn't call me up unless he had something important to talk to me about. Since I had retained him for his services, I knew that was the case. I had been dreading a call from him because... I was afraid he would tell me something I didn't want to hear. I presume you have some information for me? I asked with my heart beating about a mile a minute. I took my hand from my chest and balled it into a fist. Yes, but not much. I was relieved to hear him say that. Oh, that's good to hear. My heart immediately slowed down, and I was even more relieved. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. Shit. Just hearing him mention bad news got my heart to beating like hell again. Tell me the good news first. The good news is, I don't have anything on your wife. She's been a very good girl. Other than some serious shopping and some expensive lunches, that's about all she's been up to this past month. She made a few trips to City Hospital, and whatever goes on there is highly guarded. But I don't think there's anything to worry about there. I caught a glimpse of her physician, and I don't think she'd get involved with a gnome like him, Tim laughed. She spends a lot of her time and my money on plastic surgeries, I chortled. I know all about her frequent trips to various hospitals and clinics. Hmm... Two days after you and your son-in-law left for L.A., she checked into San Francisco General Hospital in the morning and checked out in the afternoon. Your daughter took her there and picked her up. Tim paused and shuffled some papers. That's the good news? I'm not sure if it is or not. 
When she exited the hospital, she was in a wheelchair. Apparently, she'd had another procedure performed. Whatever it was, it couldn't have been too serious. She would have told me about it. She probably had her titties tuned up again with another lift. Otherwise, they wouldn't have released her the same day. Right? Right. Now, what's the bad news? Your daughter made several trips to an address on 3rd Street this week. Tim shuffled papers again. The apartment, a dump I wouldn't house a dog I didn't like in, is leased to a Maggie Mae Thompson. According to the information I was able to obtain, this woman is quite the battle axe. Always in a dispute with her neighbors. Does her name mean anything to you? Maggie Thompson. Hmm. You got me. I don't know a woman by that name. She's probably one of Sarah's friends from back in the day. And she must be a pretty ferocious battle axe if Sarah hasn't brought her to the house like her other old friends. Well, this Thompson woman is a lot older than Sarah, so it's unlikely she's a friend. But Thompson has a son the same age as your daughter. Oh? He's the same security guard who works in your main store who assisted Sarah the day she lost her baby. Do you think she may be going there to see him? Oh, Lord, it's Curtis. I knew it. I knew it in my heart. I think she's fooling around with that boy. I don't know about that. Each time she visited this address since I got on the case, she knocked, but no one answered the door. Either the gentleman in question refuses to see her, or he's out and about more than most people. He works the day shift at my main store, so he's been off for a few days. Some elderly uncle or cousin or something in Detroit passed, and Curtis and his mama had to go take care of the funeral and sort out his business. That's about all I have for you right now, my friend. Your wife is not fooling around, and I don't have any concrete proof that your daughter is either, at least not at this time. Let's give it one more month, but I'd appreciate it if you check in with me on a weekly basis. You got it, buddy. I was happy to hear that Vera was not cheating on me, not that I even remotely thought she was anyway. My main concern was Sarah, especially since I knew she'd been back to Curtis's residence. I was already late for my meeting, so I didn't think another few minutes would matter. I locked my office door and called the house. Vera answered. She promptly informed me that she was late for an appointment and was on the way out the door. So I only chatted with her long enough to tell her I needed to speak to Sarah. Sarah came on the line about a minute later. Yes, Daddy? What's up? I like to write up a little report to keep in my files about that incident that happened. You mean about that jackass who made me lose my baby? Yes. That happened weeks ago. Why don't you wait until now to write up a report? And what about the police report? Can't you just copy it from them? I could, but I'd rather get something directly from you. I'd also like to get a few words from Curtis. You want me to come down to the store and dictate something to your secretary? Or do you want me to throw something together on the computer here? You can compose something for me at home. When and if Curtis comes back to work, I'll get something from him then. Just as I expected, Sarah remained silent longer than she should have. I knew she was thinking about what I had just said about Curtis. To my surprise, she didn't react to that. Oh, okay then. I'll type up a few pages and have it ready when you get home this evening. Thanks, baby. Like I said, I'll get something from Curtis when and if he comes back. She took the bait this time and ran with it. When and if he comes back? Where is he? Sarah was sly, but she could not hide the curiosity and concern in her voice. He's in Detroit with his mama. Some relative passed away. I think he told me it was his elderly uncle. He's supposed to return to Frisco this evening, 
But before he left work the other day, he told me his mama is thinking about moving to Detroit to be closer to her family. If she goes, I wouldn't be surprised if he packed up and followed her. He's real close to his mama. Oh, that's nice. I was surprised that Sarah didn't have more to say about Curtis possibly moving away, but I could still hear the curiosity and concern in her voice. So Curtis might be moving to Detroit. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry his uncle died. Yeah, I'm sorry too. Listen, sweetie, I have to run off to another meeting now. I'll see you when I get home. I called Tim back. I want you to keep a real close eye on my daughter for the next few days, I told him, starting tonight. Five days later, Tim called me again. We need to talk. He hollered into the telephone. His voice was so loud, it sounded like he was standing right next to me. You got something for me? I had a dreadful feeling that he was really going to tell me something I didn't want to hear this time. So I braced myself by taking a deep breath. Dude, I'm sorry to tell you that I do. Hmm. My daughter is fooling around with my security guard, isn't she? I'm afraid so. Is she sleeping with him? Excessively. Tim let out such a disgusted snort, you would have thought Sarah was his daughter. She entered his apartment three nights ago while the mother was working a night shift at a warehouse in Alameda. She stayed for two hours. When she exited, he walked her to her car where they kissed very passionately before she got in and drove off. They got together last night at a motel near a truck stop where the rates are charged by the hour. The hookers do their business there with the truckers anyway. After they left the motel, they had a romp in the back seat of your daughter's car parked in an isolated spot behind the cow palace. Oh, hell no! Take it easy, dude. These things happen, Tim said calmly. How can I take it easy after what you just told me? I can't believe my ears. Well, you'll believe your eyes when I show you the pictures. Pictures? The word flew out of my mouth like a loose tooth. You've even got pictures of her with Curtis? Well, when I confront her, she won't wiggle her booty out of this one. I have pictures of them going into the motel and coming out a couple of hours later. I took some really good shots of them in an adult toy shop two days ago. You wouldn't believe the unique devices they purchased made me blush, and you know I'm not approved. Sarah didn't see you in that place taking pictures of her. Oh, I didn't go inside. My associate steps in when we need close-ups. I remained a safe distance the whole time. Oh, Lord in heaven. I had to stop talking long enough to catch my breath and rub my aching chest. I fanned my face for a few seconds, but I was still as hot as a six-shooter. I suspected she had a crush on Curtis, and I'd even confronted her about it not too long ago, right in front of her husband and the rest of the family. She denied that anything was going on. I should have known she was screwing that man even back then. Well, I'm going to put a stop to it for good this time. I am not going to stand by and let my daughter ruin her life over a security guard, that nasty heifer. Dude, I'm not finished. Oh? Is she giving that sucker my money too? Not that I can tell. His pockets are obviously not very deep. But he manages to cover the motel rooms and he pays the check when they go out to eat. It doesn't look like he's after her money. At least, not yet. But that's not something you should be worrying about right now. Tim paused and released a loud breath followed by a groan. Let's move on to your wife. What about my wife? Buddy, this is the part of my job I hate, especially when the client is a close friend such as yourself. Tim, what about my wife? Is she... Is she... Is she screwing around too? My head 
felt like it was going to explode. But I had not heard the worst yet. Tim didn't mince words or soften the blow. He hit me in the gut with a punch so brutal, I thought I'd pass out on the spot. Your wife's lover is a 22-year-old unemployed bartender and an ex-con. His name is Ricky Tate. Chapter 53 Sarah I was glad that Daddy had told me where Curtis was. It made me feel so much better. Since I had not been able to reach him by telephone or catch him at home, I thought he was trying to avoid me. And I knew that even if I went to the store, he wouldn't be able to talk to me. I didn't know what was going on with him until now. I had to call several airlines before I found the one he had booked his return flight on. He was scheduled to arrive around 6 o'clock p.m., but I gave him enough time to collect his luggage and get home. I called him up at 8. I was so glad his mean mother didn't answer the phone. Curtis, I've been worried to death about you. I've been trying to get in touch with you for almost a whole week. I didn't know what had happened until Daddy told me today about your uncle. Baby, things happen so fast. When my Aunt Nettie called and told us that my Uncle Marvin had died, me and Mama had to hop on a plane that same night. I didn't get a chance to get a message to you about me going to Detroit before I left, and I didn't have your phone number with me or I would have called you before now. I had called up your daddy at the store and told him what was going on. I'm surprised he didn't tell you right away. And why would he have done that? I have a feeling he suspects we're fooling around. And if that's the case, he wouldn't be telling me your business. I said, He's wrong, Curtis said in a low voice. He's wrong about what? About us fooling around. Oh? Are you telling me you don't want to see me again after all? I had been dumped by other men before, and I had promptly recovered. But now that I was older and risking my marriage for a man, this was one time I knew I would not recover so quickly. Sarah, I'd see you every day of the week if I could. But the thing is, I've been thinking about us a lot lately. It bothers me that we have to sneak around. I'm not used to that. I've told you that already. I swear to God, girl, having a relationship with you is stressful. I thought you cared about me. I wailed. I do care about you, and I'd love to see you again. But you're married. I, I've i never been involved with a married woman before. So? You knew I was married that day we had lunch when you lured me to your apartment and fucked my brains out. I was caught up in the moment. You were caught up in my ass, and I was caught up in your ass. Is it? Are you seeing another woman... Is that the real reason you don't want to see me now? I'm not buying this shit about me being married making you have second thoughts. Sarah, I love you. Curtis choked. I knew you were married, but I didn't care. I wanted to be with you that bad. We remained silent for almost a full minute. I was breathing through my mouth, and from the loud snorting noises coming from Curtis's end... It sounded like he was breathing through his mouth and nose. I'm not involved with another woman at the moment. And I want to see you too, baby. But while I was gone, I had a lot of time to think about some things. Things that I need to change in my life. Some things? And one of those things include me and you? Sarah, if you are not already married... I'd ask you to marry me. His last statement hit me like a ton of bricks. I didn't think a man who worked a dead-end job and lived with his mother thought about marriage that much. You would? Honest to God, I would. I've been looking for a woman like you all my life. And now that I've found you, I don't like sneaking around to be together and not being able to show you off to my friends. Well, you know I don't like sneaking around either, but what else can we do? 
That's up to you. You have to decide if you want to be with me or your husband. Are you asking me to choose? I gasped. Yes, I guess I am. I'm telling you, you need to choose who you want to be with. It's either him or me. When you do that, let me know. Uh, that might be real soon. I... I think Bo's thinking about getting back with his ex. You've told me that before. If you think that, why are you still with the dude? Why don't you have it out with him and move on? It's not as easy as you think it is, baby. I'd be hurting my daddy as much as I'd be hurting Bo. I try to do things to make the people in my life happy. Well, all this pressure and sneaking around is not making me happy— and I'm sure it's beginning to take a toll on you, too. Curtis paused. I was just about to speak again, but he cut me off. Sarah, let me make myself real clear. Baby, you have to decide if you want to be Bo's wife, your daddy's little girl, or my woman. Do you hear me? I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. I pouted. You know it's been quite a while since I saw you, and I'd rather finish this conversation in person. Are you going to be home for a while? Is your mama there? Yes, I'm going to be home for a while, and no, my mama is not here. She didn't even have time to unpack because she had to go back to work tonight. She's got to work a double shift to make up some of the time she took off. Do you want to come over here? I'd like to do that, Curtis. I have a hard time controlling myself when I'm alone with you, girl. You know what's going to happen if you come over here. I know. Whatever happens, happens. Well, you know. And we'll do whatever. I said with a submissive sigh. I've missed the hell out of you. I want to... I need you. Oh, shit. What the hell? I need you too, baby. I was in Curtis's arms for three hours that night. Bo barely crossed my mind when I was with Curtis. Lately, he barely crossed my mind even when I wasn't with Curtis. And I wondered if Bo spent much time thinking about me and my feelings. Other than to have me scratch his back one night after he got out of the shower— Bo and I had barely touched each other since he'd returned from his trip to L.A. a month ago. From the way he avoided me when he was in the house and the short conversations we had when we did talk, I had a feeling something or somebody else was on his mind. And it was not hard for me to figure out who that somebody was. Gladys. It didn't matter to me if he had made love to her in L.A. or not, just knowing that he'd agreed to see her made him guilty as hell in my book. I didn't want to stay with a man who wanted to be with another woman, and I wasn't going to. I had decided that I was going to take birth control pills again, and I would stay on them until I left Bo. When I produced a grandchild for Daddy, it would be by Curtis. Before I left Curtis's place, I promised him I would tell Bo I wanted a divorce. Are you sure this is what you want, Sarah? You're going to divorce Bo from me? Curtis asked, his arm around my shoulder as he escorted me to my car. I'm sure, I told him. I can't go on like this. When I got home, Daddy was in the living room sitting on the couch, and he was alone. The television was not on, and he didn't have a drink in his hand, this was very peculiar behavior for him. I had no idea what was going on. Before I could speak, he cleared his throat and spoke first. Where have you been, honey? He asked, looking at his watch. This time of night. I went to the movies with a friend, I said, standing in the doorway with my car keys still in my hand. Is that right? Which one? Rhonda Porter. I meant which movie? Huh? Uh, Tyler Perry's latest. 
I looked around the room. Why are you sitting down here by yourself? I asked, diverting the attention away from me. I just wanted to be alone for a few minutes so I could think about a few things, he mumbled. From the weary look on his face, I was afraid to hear what those few things were, so I decided not to ask. Oh, where is everybody? Everybody's retired to their bedrooms. After all, it is after midnight. Yeah, and that's where I'm going. If you don't leave for work before I get up in the morning, I'll see you at the breakfast table. Yeah. Daddy's voice sounded almost like a growl. I turned around when I got to the stairs. He was still looking at me and with the oddest look on his face. But I wasn't going to worry about that for now. I had other issues to attend to. When I entered my bedroom, Bo was sitting on the side of the bed with a puppy dog expression on his face. Well, there was no telling what kind of expression he was going to have on his face in a few minutes. I need to talk to you, I told him as soon as I closed the door. Not only was I going to tell him that I knew his ex had met up with him in L.A., but I was also going to ask him for a divorce. I need to talk to you, too, he told me, perking up. There was an amused look on his face now. He patted his lap and motioned for me to sit on it, but I didn't. I plopped down onto a spot at the other end of the bed. I'm not going to bite you, he chuckled. I was glad to hear him laugh, because after he heard what I had to say, it was going to be a long time before he laughed again. You might bite me when you hear what I have to say, I warned. Oh, and why do you think that? He no longer looked amused. Now he looked alarmed. I'd rather hear what you have to say first. Bo blew out some air and released words that irritated my ears like a torch. I saw Gladys when I was in L.A., he confessed. I know. I've known all along. His mouth flew open, his eyes widened, and he looked thoroughly surprised. You do? You knew all this time, a whole month, and you didn't say anything? Who told you? That blabbermouth Cash? Cash didn't tell me. I, uh, I saw that letter she sent to you that you left in your jacket pocket. I called the hotel, and they told me she had checked in. I see. Bo stared at the wall for a few moments. I bet you couldn't wait to get to L.A. to fuck that bitch, I accused. I was not just angry. I was also relieved. Bo's infidelity was all I needed to justify mine. No, I didn't. He held up his hands and shook his head. I swear to God I didn't. We just talked. That's all she wanted to do. Then how come you didn't tell me she sent that letter and that she came to L.A. just to talk to you? I was going to... Oh, yeah? When? You've had a whole month. Look, I know she's been trying to get back with you. If you don't care about her and don't want to be bothered with her, why did you agree to meet up with her in L.A.? I told you, she just wanted to talk. Oh, really? She just wanted to talk? She flew all the way from Houston to L.A. just to talk? Well, I've got news for you, brother. You are not that hot, and I am not that gullible. I don't believe that bitch traveled that far just to talk, goddammit. I know you fucked her. No, I didn't. I did have a real long talk with Gladys. I made it clear to her that I have no desire to be with her again, and I begged, no, I ordered her not to ever attempt to contact me again. I told her that if she called, I wouldn't talk to her. And I told her if she sent any more letters, I'd return them to her unread. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth. You can sit here and swear all you want to. I don't believe you. Look, baby, 
I'll call her right now and let her tell you herself. Bo leaped up from the bed and shot across the floor to the dresser where he had left his cell phone. He grabbed it and turned it on. She'll tell you. I don't want to talk to that damn woman, I hollered. I ran over to him and snatched the cell phone out of his hand and turned it off. I don't care at this point. All I care about is the fact that you lied to me. I didn't lie to you. Well, since you didn't tell me you were going to talk to her in person, that's as good as lying. I dropped his cell phone back onto the dresser and turned to walk away. Bo grabbed my hand and pulled me into his arms. Before I knew what was going on, his lips were on mine. As soon as he reared his head back, he said, Sarah, I do love you. I don't want to lose you. And that's all that really matters to me. His embrace was so tight I could barely breathe. No matter how hard I tried to get loose, it did no good. He even tightened his grip to a point where I felt like we were part of the same body. I'm not going to let Gladys or anybody else come between you and me. It's too late. I managed. Those three words must have really had an impact on Bo, because he released me so abruptly, I almost fell to the floor. What the hell is that supposed to mean? The look he gave me was enough to frighten the devil. He narrowed his eyes and his nostrils and jaws twitched. A purple vein stood out on the side of his neck like a snake. I would have been a fool to tell him I wanted a divorce while he was looking so scary. I, uh, we just have to work on a few things, I said with a hollow grin. That's all. I was glad that I had taken a shower before I left Curtis's apartment. When Bo pulled me to the bed and climbed on top of me, he couldn't stop talking about how fresh I smelled. Curtis and I had used condoms, and I had not had time to get my prescription for birth control pills refilled yet, so I was worried about getting pregnant by Bo tonight. I needed to put having a baby on the back burner for a while, even if I did get pregnant by Bo now, I had made up my mind. I didn't know if he had told me the truth about his meeting with his ex. But it didn't matter if he had or not. I was still going to leave him. I realized now that I didn't want to stay married to him no matter what. Had he been the right man for me in the first place, I would not have gotten involved with Curtis. I didn't feel comfortable in Bo's arms now. But until I left, I had to endure his affection and make the best of it. To my surprise, Bo's lovemaking tonight was better than it had been in months. But it was too late. I didn't sleep much that night. When he made love to me again the next morning, I thought I would scream. For one thing, Curtis had made love to me with so much vigor the night before I was sore between my thighs, and I winced every time I urinated. Bo was just as rough as Curtis, so by the time he finished with me, I was walking like I had a stick up my ass. But being in pain didn't slow me down. I visited Curtis again that same night. When I got home, Bo made love to me again, and he did so for the next four nights. By then... I didn't know if I was coming or going. Ironically, I was enjoying all the attention, and it must have shown because a few days later, on a rainy Monday morning, Daddy cornered me in the kitchen. He was still seated at the breakfast table, finishing up his coffee. Bo and Cash had already left to go to work. That meddlesome Colette was still in her room, putting on her face, or I should say, her two faces. Vera had an early morning session with her trainer, so she had left the house before any of us got up. Good morning, Daddy, I said as I pranced into the kitchen, still in my bathrobe. Daddy stared at me for a few seconds. He had been giving me a lot of exasperated looks lately, especially this time. 
Once I gathered up enough courage to tell everybody I was going to divorce Bo, they would all give me exasperated looks. He set his coffee cup onto the table and folded his arms. Sarah Louise, what's going on with you? I've noticed how you've been walking around all week, beaming like you just won the lottery. What are you up to, girl? Nothing, Daddy, I said with a shrug. I'm just a happy woman. I wish I had some of whatever it is that's making you such a happy woman so I could be one too. Colette clucked, entering the room with an impish expression on her face. You haven't walked around with such a glazed look in your eyes since you were pregnant. Daddy's eyes got big and his lips curled into a smile that reached from one side of his face to the other. Baby, are you? No, I'm not pregnant again. I'm just happy, that's all. The exasperated look returned to Daddy's face. Colette tilted her head and looked at me out of the corner of her eye. Like I just said, whatever it is making you so happy, I wish I had some. Chapter 54 Vera Baby, I'm so glad you came over. Last night I dreamed I was making love to you. Ricky waved me into his posh apartment in the exclusive Knob Hill district that I had paid for and furnished with my money. He immediately gave me one of the longest, deepest French kisses I'd ever received. I could taste the toothpaste still on his teeth and gums. You are the sexiest woman alive and I can't get enough of you, he rasped. Then he lifted me into his arms and just stood in the middle of his living room floor looking into my eyes. This boy was too good to be true. Not only was he a damn good lover... He was too gorgeous for his own good. He wasn't as tall as I liked my boys, but he had a fantastic body, muscles in places where some men don't even have places. He had deep, dark brown skin that was so smooth and flawless, it looked like his complexion had been spray-painted on. His mother was Ethiopian, but he had no idea who or even what ethnicity his father was. He had bone-straight black hair, worn in a buzz cut, and high cheekbones, so he could have been mixed with just about anything. Don't tell me. Show me, damn it, you pretty motherfucker, you, I ordered. Oh, I'm going to show you all right. By the time I get through busting you down, you won't know what hits you, Ricky threatened. He walked toward his bedroom and kicked open the door with his bare foot. Then he strode across the floor and gently placed me on his bed. I'm sorry to be coming over here at 8 o'clock in the morning, but I wanted to see you so badly I couldn't help myself. I apologized. And I'm sorry I didn't call first like I usually do. Vera, you can come over here whatever time of day or night you want to. And you know you don't need to call before you come, he replied, unzipping his pants. He stepped out of them and removed his underwear in record time. You're right about that. I just needed to hear you say it. I didn't like to remind Ricky that I was his sugar mama. But just to keep things in perspective, I did every now and then. I didn't want to waste any more time talking. There were much more important things that I wanted to do with my mouth. With his eyes still on my face, he removed a package of condoms from his nightstand drawer and slid one on. I was still dressed, but I knew I wouldn't be for long. As soon as he eased down on top of me, I wrapped my legs around his waist and started taking care of business so fast I got lightheaded. After I had given him a thorough workout and a blowjob, he swooned like a Baptist preacher. Then he scrambled out of bed and danced a jig. Baby, that's the best head I've had in years. My dick felt like it was being sucked by a vacuum cleaner. Mm. I've had plenty of practice, I said proudly, as I rolled over onto my side. I need a drink after that, Ricky exclaimed. 
giving me one of the most satisfied looks I'd ever seen on a man's face. You want me to fix you one, too? He asked, trotting to the dresser where he had set a bottle of rum and a bottle of Coke. Not this early in the morning. I don't know if that fool husband of mine will still be in the house when I get back home. All I need is for him to smell liquor on my breath when I'm supposed to be at the gym working out. Speaking of working out, take off them clothes so I can finish my job. Ricky didn't give me time to undress myself. He did it, all the while whispering filth into my burning ears. The last thing he said before he tied my wrists and ankles to the bedpost with my stockings and two of his neckties was, Show big dick Ricky whose whore you are. After a fuckfest that made me squeal like a pig, Ricky untied me and got up to fix himself another drink. The telephone on the nightstand next to his bed rang, but he ignored it. I was glad he had turned off his answering machine, because if I heard a woman leaving a message for him, he would have had some explaining to do. Each of my boy toys was mine exclusively for the duration of our affair. If they even so much as looked at another woman, or man, without my approval, and I found out about it, I fired them. I'd only dismissed two for that reason so far. Baby, I don't know how you can still stand that old Jared tall guzzling geezer. Ricky blasted, shooting me a hot look as he returned to the bed. It was on the tip of my tongue to tell him that I guzzled just as much Geritol as Kenneth. I usually kept my mouth shut when it came to subjects that were offensive to me. And age was at the top of my shit list. But this sweet young thing was so incredible, I'd almost let him get away with murder. Dear, you are too beautiful and delicious to be with a gargoyle like Kenneth. I seen him up close when I was in his store one day, and he looked right beastly to me. Tell me about it, and it's really beginning to get on my last nerve. I hate the man, and I don't know how much longer I can put up with him. Yeah. Just the thought of making love to him turns my stomach. When he kissed me last night with his sloppy, wet, rubbery lips, it was like kissing a toilet plunger. I made sure I got up before he did this morning just so I wouldn't have to kiss him again. Baby, I'm so sorry you have to put up with some shit like that. Ricky took a long drink and let out a mighty belch. I know you signed one of them prenup things that state you won't get much if you divorce him, which is a bum deal if you ask me. Sister, what was you thinking when you done that? You must have been out of your mind at the time. Ricky paused and gave me a look that made me feel about two feet tall. He was right. I must have been out of my mind to sign that prenup. If I hadn't signed... He probably would have thought I was marrying him for his money, I whimpered. That is why you married him. You told me that to my face right after we first met. Yeah, I know. But it's all over and done with now, and there's nothing I can do to change it. Hmm. And you black women think you all are so smart. Ha! You sisters get the shortest end of the stick of all the women on this planet. I bet them white bitches don't be signing no prenups like the one you signed. I used to do this teeny-weeny Japanese chick before I met you. She's married to a fucking billionaire. The prenup she signed is banging. She'll get half of whatever he's worth if they divorce and everything if he dies before her. Well, maybe you should get yourself a white woman or another teeny-weeny Japanese woman, I said with a smirk. I gave Ricky a scowl, so he changed his tune when he saw how pissed off he was making me. Oh, baby, I'm just blowing off steam, he said in a much lower voice and a more sensitive manner. You're all the woman I need. I really do care about you, Vera. He was doing okay until his last sentence. You remind me so much of my grandmother. Hey, 
shut up. You hold on there right now, I hollered, my blood boiling like water for chocolate. I'd stop while I was ahead if I were you, I warned, shaking a finger in his face. Oh, well, you know what I mean. My granny is a real cool woman, and when it comes to looks, she's sharper than a serpent's tooth. And she looks way younger than she really is, just like you. That's better, I sniffed. Anyway, I don't like to see you fretting over what you're going to get from Kenneth. I feel that as long as you've been married to old dude, and as good as you've been treating his sickly black ass, that rich bastard would probably make it worth your while if you left him now. I mean, at his age, what do he need with all them millions? Shit. If he's any kind of man, he'll break you off a couple of million just for the hell of it. Shit. Be patient, sweetie. I'm not about to just up and leave a gold mine like Kenneth, unless it's for somebody with more money than him. But I've put up with him this long. I can hold on a little longer. He's got one foot and a big toe in the grave already. However, if I do decide to leave him, I know he'd probably be fairly generous to me, especially after all the years I've tolerated his gas and foul breath and sweat. But I deserve more than just a couple million. I'll come out a whole lot better if he dies while I'm still with him. I want it all. I'd want it all, too, if I was in your shoes. And you'll get it, because you're a real pro when it comes to getting paid. I bet there ain't a man alive who could shortchange you. Mm. It's a good thing his daughter is retarded. After he's out of the way, you won't have no trouble with her. Retarded? Sarah's not retarded. What made you say that? You did. You said she was a slow wit that didn't know her asshole from a hole in the ground. Oh, I laughed. I was just talking out the side of my mouth when I told you that. As a matter of fact, Sarah's pretty smart for an idiot. I laughed again, this time louder and longer. Then I got serious. I'm not really worried about her. Once her daddy's out of the picture, I'm sure I can keep her under control. With me and Bo working together, she'd be like putty in our hands. That's true. But Kenneth will probably leave her a bigger cut than you. Like I said, once Kenneth is out of the way, Bo and I can handle that ninny daughter of his. Shit. Uh-huh. Well, I just hope you get everything you got coming, baby. Don't worry. I have a feeling I will. Chapter 55 Kenneth Vera was going to get everything she had coming. I was going to make sure of that. I met Tim in his office two days after our last telephone conversation. He greeted me with a long face and promptly waved me to a seat. My legs were too stiff for me to cross them, but I shifted around in the soft leather seat and made myself as comfortable as I could. It was a gloomy day that had started out with rain, dark clouds, and thunder and lightning. I had encountered a traffic accident on my way to Tim's office, and I had almost run over a dog in the crosswalk. And if all of that had not been enough to get me off to a bad start, Vera had entered the bathroom while I was taking a shower and insisted on giving me a blowjob, which I had not enjoyed. I couldn't figure out why she was being so affectionate. She had not gotten that intimate with me in the shower all week. She was up to something, and I would have bet my bottom dollar that it had something to do with her and her lover. Maybe she was feeling sorry for me, and the blowjob was a gesture of mercy, or a display of guilt which was even worse. It didn't matter which one it was because that bitch was toast. Tim sat with his arms folded. He remained silent while I looked through a stack of photographs he just handed to me of Vera and her young lover. After I'd flipped through the first few pictures, I had to stop. 
I paused, loosened my tie, and took several deep breaths. Tim handed me a glass of mineral water, and I looked at the rest of the pictures. I was so visibly upset by the time I'd seen them all. Tim handed me a shot glass filled to the brim with scotch. I swallowed it all in one gulp. That woman is a straight-up whore, I roared. I was so angry, I could barely talk. I wanted to beat the shit out of Vera. But I had never struck a woman before in my life, and I was not about to start now. I had a better punishment in mind for her. I'd hit her where it would cause her the most pain, in her wallet. That woman worshipped the almighty dollar. I was going to teach her a lesson she would never forget. By the time I got through with her, she'd be so broke, even her cash would bounce. I'm fit to be tied. I know exactly how you feel. My wife is cheating on me with this sleaze ball. I hollered, fanning the air with the picture of Vera sitting on her punk's lap on a bench in Golden Gate Park, a place she had once told me she only enjoyed when she was there with me. Lord have mercy. This Ricky character looked like a typical thug to me with his beady black eyes and sharp weasel-like features. In almost every picture, he wore jeans and either a t-shirt or some plaid mess with the sleeves missing and the buttons undone, revealing his smooth chest that had the kind of ripped muscles I could have only in my dreams. I stared from one picture to another, with my mouth hanging open and my head pounding and throbbing like somebody was going at it with a drill. I'm meeting with my lawyer first thing tomorrow morning to modify my will again. I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, my man. Tim gave me a pitiful look. I mean, your daughter is having an affair. That's enough bad news for you to hear. But your wife... Man, it doesn't get any worse than that. After what Sherry did to me, I'm almost afraid to get involved with another woman. Tell me about it. I had to stop talking so I could catch my breath. I closed my eyes for a few moments and wheezed so hard I got lightheaded. Dude, are you all right? You want another shot of scotch? Tim asked, looking worried. He was already reaching for the empty shot glass I had sat on his desk. I'm fine, Tim. I don't need anything else to drink right now. I cleared my throat and looked through the pictures again. There were twelve in all. Glossy eight by tens, suitable for framing. In one picture, Vera and Ricky were strolling out of Neiman Marcus, grinning from ear to ear. He was holding more shopping bags than she was. I remembered that day well. It was last Saturday. I knew that because Vera wore a lime green dress that she had just purchased two days before, and she never wore anything twice. She had left the house in that dress to go shopping and had come home six hours later with just one bag. So all the other bags must have contained merchandise that she'd purchased with my money for that sucker she was fucking. That low-down, funky black bitch. Other photos showed her and Ricky coming out of a movie theater, a massage parlor, at La Scala, one of the most expensive restaurants in the Bay Area. And in the detailed report Tim showed me, Vera's lover had just quit his job as a bartender in the nightclub where Vera had met him. His finances had been as raggedy as a bowl of sauerkraut and his credit as spotty as a leopard when Vera first met him. But she had changed that. She had been covering his car note and other expenses from day one, even his rent. That was another thing, his residence. She had previously moved him from a flop house on 16th Street to an apartment in Knob Hill. A retired TV star I knew and one of my most expensive attorneys lived in this neighborhood. She'd bought him furniture and thousands of dollars worth of new clothes on a credit card she'd opened in her name. 
three days ago, she took him to the bank and opened a checking and savings account for him with a $10,000 initial deposit. Oh, I couldn't wait to confront her, but I didn't want to do it right away. I wanted to give her just enough rope to hang herself, and when she did that, I wanted that bitch to hang until the noose around her cheek neck rotted. Tim continued in a firmer tone of voice, which told me this mess was having almost as much of an impact on him as it was me. I have some lovely shots of your daughter and her friend, too. And boy, are they juicy. But maybe you should wait and look at them another time. You don't look well, dude. Tim, I'm fine. Let me see the other pictures, too. I may as well get all this shit dumped into my lap at the same time. He removed another stack of photographs from his desk drawer and handed them to me. I could only stand to look at the first few on top. I was horrified by what I saw. The way Curtis was holding on to my daughter as they strolled along Fisherman's Wharf like newlyweds. I knew her marriage to Bo was as dead in the water as mine was to Vera. I wobbled up out of my seat. I've seen enough, Tim. You can put this one to bed. How much do I owe you? I wheezed some more as I rubbed my chest, which had tightened up even more since I'd entered Tim's office. I'll send you the bill, Tim said, waving me back to my seat. I'm really concerned about how bad you look right now. Did you drive over here? I sat back down. I was dizzy, and my mouth was so dry it tasted like I'd been chewing on a sheet of old newspaper. I drove over here. I managed, blinking rapidly. My vision had become blurred and my left arm was throbbing and tingling. I'm fine, I insisted, rising again. You're not fine, my brother, and I'm not letting you leave here alone. I'll drive you home, and I'll have one of my assistants follow us in your car. Yes. Please do that for me, Tim. I really appreciate having a friend like you, I told him, shaking his hand. Thank you for all you've done for me. I let out an eerie laugh. You can scratch Vera's name off your next Christmas party guest list. It's already done, Tim gave me a sharp nod. I was glad that Tim had insisted on taking me home. I knew my body well enough to know that it was finally going to shut down for a while, maybe even permanently. I just had to hold on until I got all my affairs in order. I had a heart attack in Tim's car, just three blocks from my house. He made a U-turn and rushed me to San Francisco General. I passed out as soon as they loaded me onto a gurney. When I opened my eyes, the first person I saw was Vera, hovering over me like a vulture. Seeing her was so ironic, I wanted to laugh because she was the reason I was knocking on death's door. Had I been able, I would have sprung up out of that bed and choked her. Baby, you're going to be just fine, she told me, looking at me with her lying eyes blinking and her eyeballs rolling from side to side. As usual, her makeup was impeccable, which told me she had not shed a single tear. She was also dressed like she was on her way to a party at the White House. She even had on white gloves and some of her best jewelry. The doctor will be back in a few minutes, so you just lie there and rest. That heifer had a white silk scarf wrapped around her neck. But when she leaned down to kiss me, it slipped. She quickly adjusted it, but I had already seen the purple sucker bite on her neck. It looked like a goddamn tattoo. I couldn't get the images of her and her lover out of my mind. Where's Sarah? I whispered. She's on her way, Vera replied. Bo and Cash were here a few minutes ago, but they had to get back to the store to meet with those vendors from Sacramento. They'll be back in a little while. Colette called to say she was praying for you. 
so that all the rest of your staff and all five stores. Your friend Tim brought you in. I noticed how the worried look on Vera's face intensified when she mentioned Tim's name. She knew he had done a lot of investigative work for people we socialized with, so she was probably wondering why I had been with him. Tim said you got sick while he was having lunch with you, she told me, giving me a guarded look. And he also told me he had come to the store to get a birthday gift for one of his grandsons and invited you to have lunch with him. That's right. I went along with Tim's version of events. It sounded reasonable. Had he told Vera the truth, that I'd been in his office on business, she would have figured out what I had really been up to. Oh, what restaurant did he take you to? Um, some hole in the wall. I can't remember the name of. Those places all look the same to me. You know how cheap Tim is. Yeah, I know. I'll never forget that time he took us to Wendy's for lunch and paid for our burgers with coupons, Vera laughed. I didn't. Then she got real serious. Uh, he told me that he and Sherry are going through a divorce. She was cheating on him. What? Why, that's a damn shame. Tim was so good to Sherry. Yeah, he was good to her. I agree with a sneer. But to some women, being good to them is not enough. Uh, is he still doing private investigative work? Vera rotated her neck a couple of times and tied the scarf around it even tighter. Uh-huh. And he's got more business than ever. I blinked at Vera a few times. That must have made her nervous because she started to shift her weight from one foot to the other. She smoothed down the sides of her dress and clutched the handle on her purse like she was afraid somebody was going to run up behind her and snatch it. I couldn't remember the last time she'd looked this nervous. Well, like I just told you, you're going to be fine, and I can't wait to get you home, she squealed, forcing a smile. She lowered her voice to a whisper. I have a big surprise in store for you. Another surprise was the one thing I didn't need. I have one in store for you too, Vera. That slipped out, but it was very effective. She looked like she had just seen Caesar's ghost. That's nice, Kenneth. I can't wait to see what it is. I saw tears in her eyes for the first time since she had entered my room. I need to see my daughter, I said, attempting to sit up. Honey, be still, and please don't try to talk or stir around too much. Vera gently pushed me back down on the bed. I need to see my daughter, I said again in a much harsher tone of voice. And I want to see her alone. Chapter 56 Sarah as soon as I entered Daddy's hospital room, I could feel the tension. He lay on his back, looking up at the ceiling. Vera stood by the side of the bed with her hands on her hips. Hi, Daddy, I said meekly, still standing in the doorway. Daddy turned sharply and looked at me. Then he looked at Vera and snapped his fingers in her face. Vera, leave this room so I can talk to my child he ordered. What the f- she began, but Daddy cut her off. Get out before I have them throw you out, Daddy boomed, pointing toward the door. With a horrified look on her face, Vera scurried out like a scared rabbit. Sarah Louise, you get your tail in here and shut that door. I need to talk to you, he bellowed. I didn't like the tone of his voice and the angry look on his face. He had never spoken to me or looked at me this way before. I knew that whatever he needed to talk to me about, it was serious, especially since he'd ordered Vera to leave the room in such a brutal manner. I closed the door and walked slowly toward the bed, dragging my feet like I was on my way to my own execution. 
I swallowed hard and clutched the strap of my purse. What's wrong, Daddy? Are you mad at me? I asked, hoping I didn't look as dumb as I sounded. I know you've been seeing Curtis, he barked. I know you've been rolling around in bed with that man. That's what's wrong, Jezebel. Now, Daddy, just let me explain. Explain what? Don't even bother lying or trying to make up excuses. Daddy, don't holler like that. I don't want other people to know my business. I glanced toward the door, wondering if Vera was outside with her ear pressed against it. You didn't care about other people knowing your business before now. I've got pictures of you in public with Curtis, all hugged up with strangers looking at you from every angle. Shame on you, Sarah Louise. I almost choked on some air before I could speak again. You had somebody following me around? My voice sounded shrill and frightened. Yes, I had somebody following you around. Oh, I mumbled. I sighed and offered Daddy a weak smile, hoping it would diffuse the situation a little. My smile didn't even faze him. The angry look was still on his face. Well, I'm not going to lie about it. I'm tired of keeping it to myself. I love him, Daddy. I have never loved a man as much as I love Curtis. Not even Bo. Daddy looked at me like I was speaking Gaelic. He shook his head and clucked like a rooster. Why in the world do you want to hurt me and your husband like this? I don't think I love Bo anymore. What? What do you mean you don't think you love Bo anymore? When did you realize that? I looked away because I didn't want to see the pain in Daddy's eyes when he heard what I said next. I stared at the wall and said, I know Bo was with his ex when he went to L.A. with you. When I turned to face Daddy again, he looked like a pillar of salt. Say what? As weak as he was, he managed to sit bolt upright with his back as straight as a broom handle. Who told you Bo was with his ex in L.A.? I found a letter in his pocket that she had sent to him in care of cash, asking him to meet up with her when he got to L.A. Did he tell you he met with her? Bo was with me most of the time, so I don't know how he could have spent any time with her without me knowing about it. Did you and Bo sleep in the same room? Hell no. What's wrong with you, girl? You know I don't hang like that. Then how would you know what he did when he wasn't with you? I called the hotel, and she'd checked in. Daddy's jaw dropped, and the pupils in his eyes got so dark, they looked like ink spots. What are you telling me? Is Bo thinking about going back to that wench? He claims he only agreed to talk to her so he could tell her to her face that he didn't want to be with her again. Did you believe him? It doesn't matter now, Daddy. I'm going to divorce him no matter what. Lord have mercy. He can still work for you and he can still live in the house if you want him to. I'm going to move in with Curtis anyway. Have you lost your mind, Sarah Louise? No, I have not lost my mind. I want to be happy like everybody else. I want to have a long, strong relationship with somebody I love, just like you and Vera. Daddy started to laugh so hard, he choked. I slapped him on the back, but that didn't help. He was gasping for air so hard, I had to summon his doctor back into the room. Dr. Mason came right away, with Vera trotting along right behind him with a scared look on her face. What's the matter? She yelled as the doctor waved her out of his way. I'm fine, I'm fine, Daddy groaned, pushing the doctor's hand away. Mr. Lomax, I think you've had enough company for today. Dr. Mason said gently, adjusting his stethoscope and then feeling Daddy's pulse. 
What did you say to him, Sarah? He was doing fine until you got here. Vera snapped, wiping her nose with one of her dozens of monogrammed silk handkerchiefs. I just told Daddy that I'm leaving Bo so I can move in with Curtis. I told her, speaking in a firm, proud manner. I didn't feel scared anymore. As a matter of fact, I'd never felt bolder and more determined in my life. My words must have really slammed into them. I couldn't tell which one groaned louder, Vera or Daddy. Neither one said a word. They just stared at me and blinked, shook their heads, and groaned some more. Dr. Mason cleared his throat and looked from me to Vera, shaking his head. Okay, that's enough. You two are upsetting my patient, he barked, snapping his fingers. I insist that you both leave this room at once. From the stern look on his face, I knew this doctor meant business. The last thing Daddy needed to see was Vera and me being escorted out by hospital security. Daddy, I'll come back as soon as the doctor says it's okay, I sputtered. I gave him a quick peck on the forehead, and then I left. I had made it halfway down the hall when I heard the heels of Vera's Jimmy Choo's clip-clopping on the marble floor behind me. You wait a minute, she snarled, grabbing me by the arm as soon as she caught up to me. What the hell has gotten into you besides Curtis's slimy dick? What about all the dealers and gangsters and whatnot he told us about who want him dead for being such a snitch and a busybody? I'm surprised he hasn't already been snuffed out. Do you want to get caught up in his mess and get yourself hurt too? Curtis can take care of himself and me too if he has to. He's no fraidy cat punk, I strongly declared. Curtis kept a baseball bat, a stun gun, and a can of mace for protection in his apartment and had only had to use them a few times. If he wasn't too worried about getting snuffed out, I wasn't going to worry about it either. Vera was so exasperated she was trembling. What's wrong with you, girl? You can't leave Bo for that scumbag security guard. She made security guards sound like the two most obscene words in the English language. I can't? Well, you just watch me, I retorted, slapping and pinching her hand until she released my arm. Bo will never give you a divorce, Vera yelled. I'll see to that myself. He listens to me more than he listens to you. Yes, he does. I noticed that a long time ago, Vera. Maybe that's why it was so easy for me to get involved with another man. I sniffed and narrowed my eyes. If he had been more of a man, women like you and his ex couldn't have turned him into such a wimp, which is what he was by the time he got to me. Well, he can listen to you all he wants. Whether he agrees to a divorce or not, I'm leaving him anyway. Vera noticed how people were looking at us, so she lowered her voice. Haven't you caused everybody enough pain? And why now? What do you mean, why now? Now is as good a time as any for me to leave. Can't you wait until your daddy gets better? Can't you see what all this drama is doing to him? You are the most selfish bitch. Look, Miss Prissy. I don't have to stand here and listen to that kind of talk coming from you. I've tried to put up with your snooty ways since I was a teenager, and I'm tired of trying to be nice to you. And you have some nerve calling me selfish. You are the most selfish bitch I've ever met. No wonder you don't have any friends. What? I, I have plenty of friends, little girl. You don't know what you're talking about. Vera roared. Her eyes looked like two pieces of coal. Blood rushed up her face, settling mainly in her nose. It looked like a strawberry. It was a funny sight, but I was too angry to laugh. Then how come you asked me to take you to the hospital when you had to have that fibroid surgery? Vera looked so stunned and vulnerable at that moment, I was surprised she was still able to stand on her own. 
I couldn't wait to hear her response. I braced myself. But nothing could have prepared me for what she said next. I hate you, Sarah. I have always hated your ass. She told me with her lips trembling and her eyes pooled with tears. It took a few seconds for my brain to register what she'd just admitted. I had always suspected that Vera didn't really like me, but hearing her say she hated me made me feel unbearably sad. I don't hate you, Vera, but I hate what you say and do. I feel sorry for you. Oh, my God! She covered her mouth with her hand and shook her head. This time, the color drained from her face. Now, she looked almost like a ghost. I actually did feel sorry for her, but just for a few moments. I'm sorry I said that, she choked. You know I didn't mean it. It's just that I'm so worried about your daddy, and I'm so stressed out and confused. Let's try to be more civil to one another, sweetie. She grabbed my arm again and smiled. I slapped and pinched her hand again. People were still looking at us. She began to fan her face with her hand, but that didn't stop the sweat from forming on her forehead. Her thick makeup began to slide down her face like mud sliding down the side of a hill. We have to live under the same roof, so we need to try and get along. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm going to leave Bo. There is nothing you, Daddy, or anybody else can say to make me change my mind. A couple of nurses and a few other visitors walked by, looking and listening to our heated conversation. I was embarrassed, and I attempted to leave again, but Vera grabbed my arm and held me in place. I'm moving in with Curtis today. As soon as she heard that, she released my arm on her own this time. All right, bitch. You go on to that motherfucking security guard. But I can tell you now, Bo is going to make you regret it. I'll make sure of that. I know you will, Vera. I trotted on down the hall with her still following me, panting like a coyote. I bypassed the elevator and ducked into the stairwell. I had on my Nikes, so it was easy for me to run down three flights of steps. Somehow, Vera managed to run down the same steps, not even stumbling in her impossibly high heels. When I got to the ground floor, she was right behind me, holding her shoes in her hand. Sarah, we need to talk some more. Please let me talk some sense into your head. If you want to leave Bo, at least wait until your daddy is out of the hospital. Didn't you see how upset he was? All right, I said. I'll wait until Daddy gets well and comes home. And please don't even mention that security guard to Bo until then. Why? I think the sooner Bo knows what I'm planning to do, the better. He's not stupid. He knows I'm sleeping with Curtis and have been for a long time. And I know you know it too. Vera nodded her head hard. Then she swept her hair back with her hand so far, I could see the faint scars behind her ears from her last facelift. I suspected you were. Don't you know that's a sin and a shame, girl? I'm sorry I had to stand here in public and hear you admit that you've been cheating on your husband. Don't be sorry. Be glad that it's finally out in the open now, I said sharply. Lord, what a mess you've created, child. I'm, I'm feeling sicker by the second. Vera whimpered, gulping for air. She sounded like a sick puppy now and looked like the hag she really was behind the mask she wore. Despite all of the surgeries that had been performed on her face, the vigorous workouts with her trainers and the makeup, Vera looked like every minute of her 62 years now. Let me talk to Bo first so he won't take it so hard, she rasped. Even her voice now sounded like it belonged to an old woman. 
Woman, what's wrong with you? I don't need for you to talk to my husband. That's my job. You and Daddy have been running our marriage long enough. That's part of the problem. Yes, we did interfere more than we should have. We can't change that now, but I'd still like to prepare my poor cousin for the bombshell you're going to hit him with. He's still in pain from the breakup of his first marriage. I enjoyed watching Vera squirm, but I was anxious to end this conversation. Sarah, I helped raise Bo. I'm like a second mama to him. I know him a lot better than you do. Please let me talk to him before you do, for everybody's sake. I won't ever ask you for anything else as long as I live. All right, Vera. If it means that much to you, you talk to him then. But you better do it real soon, because as soon as my daddy is back on his feet, I'm hauling ass. Chapter 57 Vera I knew that Ricky was slightly thuggish from the day I met him. He had spent most of his life in the ghetto just like Sarah. Even though he lived in a much better neighborhood now and had classy neighbors, he was still just as ghetto as ever, just like Sarah. But in his case, it didn't matter. I didn't have to live with him or take him around any of the sophisticated people I associated with. But other than that long tongue in his mouth that he was so proud of and that big stick between his legs, he had other things I could use to my advantage, like criminal connections. Right after my run-in at the hospital with Sarah, I called Ricky up from my cell phone before I left the hospital parking lot. Can you get me an untraceable gun from one of your homeboys? I asked him. An untraceable gun? he asked with a loud gasp. Why do you need something like that? Don't ask questions. Just tell me if you can get me one or not. Yeah, I can get you one. It'll cost you a pretty penny, though. I don't care about that. You just get me a gun and make sure it's loaded. And if you can, get me one with a silencer. Look, baby, this ain't CSI, one of them other cop shows where a dude can get his hands on shit like silencers and whatnot at the drop of a hat. Now listen up. My cellmate was this Vietnamese dude, and he had a bag full of tricks. He might be able to put together a homemade silencer. But he won't get out the joint for another couple of weeks. I can't wait that long. I need it right away. I don't know what kind of mess you done got yourself into, but take some advice from somebody who spent time in lockdown. Prison ain't no place that a dainty lady like you want to be. You wouldn't last a week behind bars. If you didn't die from eating the prison slop, them husky bull dykes would eat you to death. Literally. I'm not going to prison. I'm not stupid enough to get caught. I hollered. That's the same thing I said, and the same thing every convict done said at one time or another. With DNA and forensics and all the shit they got now, there ain't no such thing as a perfect crime. They're catching folks for crimes they committed 30 years ago. Like I just told you, take some advice from somebody who's been in prison. When you commit a crime, there are dozens of ways you can fuck up. I don't care how smart you are. Ricky had just been released from Folsom two weeks before I met him. He had done time for car theft and a home invasion, crimes that he had committed when he was high on cocaine. He didn't tell me that until I'd known him for a couple of months. By then, I was so addicted to him, I wouldn't have cared if he'd just been released from an insane asylum. A few more weeks into our affair... He told me about some of the other crimes he had committed that he'd never been arrested for. He'd broken into several houses and taken whatever he could carry. One night after too many drinks, he'd beaten one of his partners in crime to death because he'd stolen the loot from Ricky's apartment that they'd stolen a few days before. Even though he'd never even been suspected of that crime, he was worried that someday he would turn himself in. 
not because he had found Jesus like so many other cons and ex-cons claimed, but because he had turned his life around. As far as I knew, I was the only person that Ricky had told about him killing his accomplice. Since I had that on him, I wasn't concerned about him tattling on me for coming to him for a gun, but I thought it would be wise for me to mention it anyway. Uh, on account of that thing you told me you did to your friend, I'm sure I don't have to worry about you telling anybody about this conversation. Hell no, he hollered. I ain't in no position to be ratting you out or nobody else. Shit. My glass house is way too fragile for me to be that big a fool. Good. Now you get me a gun as soon as you can. I'll come over and give you $5,000 today and another five when you get it. Use it to pay for the gun. I'm sure it won't cost ten grand. You keep the change. Do you hear me? I hear you. Especially the part about the ten G's. Ricky yelled. You know when money talks, I listen. But you'd better listen up, baby. I'm a little more experienced in certain areas than you. Do you want me to help you do whatever it is you're planning to do with this gun? I might even know somebody who would do the deed real cheap as a favor to me. Is that something you might want to consider? Apparently, Ricky hadn't turned his life around too well. The fact that he was so eager to backslide for me was touching. I appreciated his offer, but the problem I had to resolve was too personal and I didn't want to involve any more people than I had to. Didn't I tell you not to ask any questions? I don't want you to do anything but get me that gun. I'll see you later tonight if I can, or tomorrow morning for sure. That's fine, baby, I can wait. Ricky made a loud kissing noise. And don't forget to bring the money. I won't. I wasn't ready to go home and deal with Sarah, so I drove to Fisherman's Wharf. I pulled into the first parking lot I saw. I wasn't hungry, but I went into a nearby cafe that I often visited and ordered a glass of Merlot. I had a lot of thinking to do. I had to make sure I had all of my thoughts organized when I talked to Bo about what we had to do. Kill Curtis Thompson. After I'd drunk my second glass of wine, I called Bo's office. I was prepared to leave him a voicemail. He wasn't in a meeting or off somewhere else for a change. As a matter of fact, he answered his own phone. Bo, what time are you coming home this evening? I asked. I'm not sure, he told me in a cheerful tone of voice. Well, he wouldn't be cheerful for long. Why? What's up? Oh, I was going to swing back by the hospital to see Kenneth on my way home. Are you at the hospital now? I left there a little while ago. How is Kenneth doing? He looks like he could haunt a house. Mmm, that bad, huh? I have a feeling dude is not going to be with us too much longer. The other day he passed out while sitting on the commode in his office bathroom. It was a good thing I found him before somebody else did. You didn't tell me about that. You don't have to tell him I told you. He was embarrassed about it and tried to play it off. Did his doctor give you any hopeful news? That damn quack tells Sarah more than he tells me. All I know is this. Kenneth is worse off than ever before. One of the nurses took me aside today and suggested that when and if we do take him home, We should make him as comfortable as possible. To me, that's as good as her telling me to start planning his funeral. Is that serious, huh? This must be pretty hard on Sarah. Hmm. Well, I smell a rat, and it stinks to a high heaven. You do? Why do you say that? You think Kenneth and Sarah are cooking up something? And you know what? You could be right. His estate lawyer called here a little while ago, and when I told him Kenneth was in the hospital, he told me he was going to go see him immediately. 
well, the man has been a friend of Kenneth's for more than 20 years, and most of his other friends have already paid a visit. Vera, I know that. But the lawyer also told me that Kenneth had made an appointment with him for this morning. When Kenneth didn't show up or call, his lawyer called the store. Hmm. I wonder why Kenneth wanted to meet with Donald, you know? Oh, shit! I bet it's got something to do with his will. That's my guess, too. Did Kenneth say anything to Sarah about his appointment with his lawyer? I don't know. He made me leave his room so he could talk to her in private. Oh. Bo didn't sound the least bit cheerful now. And what did he want to talk to her about in private? How would I know if he made me leave the room? I tried to snoop around and listen at the door from outside, but too many people were walking by. That doesn't sound good for us. I'm worried. You think I'm not worried? Well, did you ask Sarah why Kenneth wanted to have a private conversation with her? Bo, well, if Kenneth wanted to talk to Sarah about something in private, what would be the point of either of them telling me what it was about? You're right. Well, I just hope it's nothing too serious. Any time a man's estate lawyer comes to visit him while he's in a hospital at death's door, it's serious. Especially if Kenneth had made an appointment to see him. Listen, I think we need to sit down and talk when I get home. Just you and me, and maybe cash. Afterward, I'll take Sarah aside, and I'll try to get as much information out of her as I can. Uh, there's another thing you need to know, and this can't wait. Oh, what is it? Sarah's gonna drop one hell of a bombshell on you, maybe even before the day is over, and you're not gonna like what she tells you. What are you talking about? You heard what I said. Well, what the hell kind of bombshell is Sarah gonna drop on me? Did she tell you that? I sucked in some air and held it for a few seconds. Then I let it out with a whoosh. Bo, your wife is fucking that security guard. No, she's not. Yes, she is. And that's not the half of it. She's gonna move in with him. She told me herself to my face before I left the hospital. I could hear my poor cousin breathing through his mouth. Bo, are you all right? No. 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 She can't do this to me, he cried. Nothing broke my heart quicker than a man in tears. I'm firing that happy son of a bitch as soon as I get off this phone. He boomed, choking on a sob. I don't know why you didn't do that back when we first found out that she was getting too close to that fool. Has she been seeing him since we confronted her? Looks that way to me. You should have heard her going on and on about how she was in love with that skunk. I can't believe that damn girl. I'll kill that motherfucker before I let him have my wife. Uh-huh. And I don't blame you one bit, cuz. I'd do the same thing myself. We'll talk about that tonight. Chapter 58 Sarah I had no idea where Vera was, but I wondered if she had returned to the hospital to try and kiss up to Daddy. He was mad at her about something, and it was in her best interest to resolve whatever it was. I decided to call and check on him, but I was also calling to be nosy about Vera. Donald Baskerville, his estate lawyer, answered the telephone. Sarah, it's so nice to hear your voice. You had just turned 21 the last time I saw you, Mr. Baskerville said. You were nothing but legs then. Well, I still have the same legs, I said, forcing myself to laugh. Is my stepmother there? No, she's not. Uh, is my daddy able to speak to me? Uh, hold on, sugar, I'll check with him. I heard some muffled talk in the background and a lot of coughing. 
It was a couple of minutes before Mr. Baskerville came back on the line. Your father will speak to you now. He's still fairly weak, so I advise you not to keep him on the line too long. I won't. I just wanted to check on him now before they give him a sedative or something. Um, I'm sure Daddy was glad to see you. I'm sure he was, and I was glad to see him. He missed an appointment with me this morning, so I decided to meet with him here. But I won't take up too much more of his time. You take care of yourself, and don't spend too much time worrying about your daddy. He's going to be just fine. I didn't believe a word of what Mr. Baskerville had just said about my daddy going to be just fine. Daddy was dying, and I think everybody knew that. Why else would his estate lawyer be visiting him in the hospital instead of waiting for him to get out and come into his office? I answered my own question. Daddy was making more adjustments to his will, and I had a feeling somebody was not going to be happy with the new changes. Hello, sugar. Daddy's voice was so weak I could barely hear him. How are you feeling? Tolerable, I guess. Are you at the house? Yeah, I came straight home after I left the hospital. Do you know where Vera is? Hell no! He boomed. His reaction stunned me. Daddy had never used such an angry tone of voice when Vera was the subject. She's so mysterious these days. There's just no telling where she is or who she's with. Something was going on between Vera and Daddy. His last comment sounded pretty ominous to me. I had no idea what he was implying, but I silently agreed with him. There was just no telling where Vera was and who she was with. That woman had always been a suspect in some regard as far as I was concerned. After all these years, she still had not given me enough information about all the charities she allegedly spent so much time working with so I could help, too. It was very suspicious, even more so now. That woman was up to something no good, but I had no idea what. But from the way Daddy was acting, I had a feeling that he had an idea what it was. I didn't like that Vera had stuck her cosmetically enhanced nose into my marriage. And since I didn't want to cause Daddy any more emotional pain than he was already in, I decided to keep my nose out of their marriage. I was not going to encourage him to tell me why he was upset with her. Me being nosy and meddlesome might make matters worse. Besides, I needed to stay focused on my own problems. Daddy, I'm sorry to let you down. I tried to be the daughter you wanted me to be, but I couldn't. I have to be myself if I want to be happy. I had to blink real hard to hold back my tears. And knowing how emotional Daddy got, he was probably doing the same thing on his end. I'm real sorry for all the trouble I'm causing you about Curtis. But I can't undo anything now. Yeah, I know. Neither can I. All I can say now is that you do what you want to do. I can't stop you. At the end of the day, all I really want is for you to be happy. Even if it means you leaving Bo for Curtis. It's your life, and I don't need to keep interfering. I realize that now. You're not interfering, Daddy. You're doing what every other Daddy who cares about his child would do. And just so you'll know, Curtis is not interested in me for my money. When I go out with him, he always pays the check. I've already told him that I'd give up the generous allowance you give me every week and my inheritance if he wants me to. Vera can have it all. Vera can have it all? Bah! Daddy roared. We'll see about that. Is that why Mr. Baskerville is with you now? You're changing your will again? Don't you worry about my will, Daddy said sharply in a very loud voice. When he spoke again a couple of seconds later, 
His voice was so weak and hollow, I had to press the telephone closer to my ear so I could hear him. Now, if you don't mind, let me finish up my business with Donald. I don't feel well, and I need to get some rest. Goodbye, Daddy. It was so hard for me to hang up. I was tempted to go back to the hospital and spend as much time with him as they'd let me. I even thought about spending the night in his hospital room. Since I had decided to delay my departure from the house and my marriage, I knew that it was going to be harder than ever for me to sleep under the same roof with Bo and Vera, especially after the way she had exploded when I told her about Curtis and me at the hospital today. If me ending my marriage was having this much of an impact on Daddy and Vera, I couldn't imagine how it was going to affect Bo. But I had made up my mind, and nothing was going to make me change it. Chapter 59 Sarah About two hours after my telephone conversation with Daddy, I heard Vera and Bo enter the house. A few minutes later, I heard Cash's voice. I happened to be standing at the top of the upstairs landing, so I couldn't really make out what they were saying until I eased down a few steps. Then I heard Vera say, I'll check on her. I knew she meant me, so I scrambled back up the stairs and sprinted down the hall to my bedroom. When Vera tapped lightly on my door a few minutes later, I was stretched out in my bed. Come in, I said, speaking in a voice that was as weak as I could make it sound. The door swung open immediately. I couldn't understand why she even bothered to be nice enough to knock, especially after our heated conversation today. She usually just barged in. Oh, I just wanted to check and see how you're feeling, she said, giving me one of her fake smiles. She had had so many facelifts and other procedures on her face. Sometimes it looked like she was smiling even when she wasn't. But this time, the ends of her lips curled up so high, her mouth looked like a horseshoe. I'm really sorry about what happened at the hospital. I was pretty mean to you, and I'm so sorry. You know that wasn't the real me. I didn't mean any of those nasty things I said. I didn't either, I said, sitting up on the bed. Uh, was that Bo downstairs, I heard? Vera glanced at the door and nodded. He and Cash were just pulling up as I arrived. We looked at each other for a long time. I'm sure he'll come up to see you in a few minutes. He swung by the hospital to visit Kenneth on his way home. Did Daddy tell him? That you're leaving him? Vera shook her head. I am sure Kenneth feels the same way I do. You should be the one to tell Bo you're leaving him for that security guard. I thought you wanted to prepare Bo before I told him. Well, I can still do that. I won't tell him exactly why you're leaving, just that you are. He probably knows the rest anyway, and the more I thought about that part, he should hear it from you. Uh-huh. Well, I will tell him when the time is right. Right now, I'm more concerned about not upsetting Daddy anymore. If Bo does something crazy when I tell him I'm leaving him, like punch me in the nose and Daddy finds out, Daddy will be even more upset than he already is. Vera sounded like she wanted to punch me in the nose herself. I doubt it'll come to that. Bo's not a violent man. He told me he wanted to kill his ex. That sounds pretty violent to me. He's a changed man now. Listen, sugar, you look so tired. Why don't you just get some more rest and I'll keep Bo occupied for a while? He had a rough day, so the first thing he did when he got inside was make himself a stiff drink. Just let him relax for a little while. Vera glanced at the door again and then back to me trying her best to look casual. Thanks, Vera. Are you hungry? 
Do you want me to have Delia bring you something to nibble on? Thanks, but I'm not hungry. I turned onto my side so that my back was to Vera. I hoped she would take the hint and get the hell out of my room. She did. I waited ten minutes before I eased off the bed and padded down the hallway to my old bedroom. It had been a few days since I'd eavesdropped through the air duct. As soon as my ear was in place, I heard the last thing in the world I expected to hear. He told us out of his own mouth that a lot of people want to see him dead. Nobody will suspect us. It was Bo talking. I couldn't make any sense out of what he just said. But when he spoke again, what he said chilled me to the bone. I just hope it doesn't hurt Sarah too much. She told me that funerals have a bad effect on her. What the fuck was he talking about? But the biggest question spinning around in my head was whose funeral he was talking about that would have a bad effect on me. And who was the person that a lot of people wanted to see dead? Curtis was the only person I knew who had enemies who wanted to see him dead. Oh, no. The thought that my husband was planning to kill my lover was so overwhelming I couldn't believe it. I had to find out what was going on, and I had to find out fast. I'm picking up the gun tomorrow, Vera said, speaking in such a hard voice, I could just picture the sneer on her face. You sure it can't be traced? Cash asked. We can't afford no slip-ups. If you don't want to get involved, don't. Bo yelled at him. I can take care of this issue on my own anyway. No, you are not going by yourself. Cash is still going with you like we originally planned. If somebody sees you coming or going by yourself, they might get nosy. If you and Cash roll up into that place, jive talking with each other, those lowlifes will think you're just another couple of middle-aged, broken-down brothers like they are. I'll pick up some cheap outfits from Goodwill tomorrow for you both to wear. Why can't we dress like we always do? Cash whined. I told you years ago, right after Kenneth gave me such a good-paying job, that I'd never wear no used or hand-me-down clothes again. Don't be a fool, fool. You can't go to Curtis's neighborhood wearing one of your Armani suits and your custom-made shoes. For one thing, you'd probably get jumped and robbed as soon as you get out of the car. And speaking of cars, leave your SUV at the house, Bo. I'll rent a Toyota or some other piece of shit cheap-ass car, Vera said. It sounded like she was the one in charge. But at this point, I was not sure of just what she was in charge of. All I could determine so far was that it had something to do with Curtis. She didn't make me wait long to find out the rest. I did some snooping around in his neighborhood. I went over there earlier and approached a few folks on the street near Curtis's building. I pretended to be a survey taker for Walmart. Those idiots are so dumb, I could have claimed to be working for the CIA and they would have believed me. Anyway, I told them that Curtis and his mama had randomly been selected to receive a huge prize. I had a clipboard in my hand and pretended to be writing down everything they told me. I told them it was a surprise deal, so I needed to get some information about Curtis and his mama's schedules from the neighbors without them knowing. Those nosy idiots were hesitant at first. The questions they asked me made me feel like a bill collector or process server trying to track down somebody. I'm sure that's what some of them thought at first. But as soon as I passed out a few bucks and a few $25 gift certificates, those fools started singing like a Christmas choir. Vera, you went over there snooping around? Woman, are you crazy? Bo hollered. No, I'm not crazy. You must be. Those porch monkeys are ignorant as hell. But don't you think that at least one of them will remember a woman like you asking questions about their neighbors? All we need is for the cops to talk to the wrong one after, after we do what we have to do. Bo, I'm disappointed in you. 
Do you think I'm stupid enough to go over to that place asking questions about Curtis without a disguise? I hope not. And I hope it was a damn good disguise. I know a lot of other black women are running around with blonde hair like you, but you dress as fancy as Michelle Obama and Oprah put together. You'd stick out like an elephant in a spa. Ha <laughs> ha! Vera roared with laughter. I wore a frizzy black wig, one of Sarah's old mammy-made dresses that she bought before I got her to stop shopping in discount stores, and some low-heeled pumps I picked up at Payless. And I wore some glasses that made me look like the kind of nerdy woman who'd be roaming around taking a survey. Anyway, the first old bat I approached told me that Curtis's mama leaves for work around six every evening except Saturday and Sunday. Another neighbor told me he's almost always home alone every Friday night watching Sanford and Son reruns. His mama works a split shift every Friday night and never gets off at the same time. He has to be available so he can pick her up when she calls. Can you imagine a man with such a dull life? Why in the world would Sarah want to be with such a straight-up loser? Cash wondered. She ain't just licking the jar. She's scraping the bone. Bo, my man, this must make you feel like a used ass wipe. I mean, having your woman choose a man as low on the food chain as Curtis Thompson over you must be hellish. I could understand if she was taken off with a banker or a rapper or at least a gangster. But she's leaving you for a hood rat that ain't got a pot to piss in. Don't you worry about how I'm feeling. You worry about yourself and keep an eye on your own woman. Bo boomed. Vera, your plan better work and you better pray that nobody suspects us. Be serious. Only a fool would think that somebody else but the thugs killed Curtis. Even a dumb bunny like Sarah. Remember how she told us about all the murdered friends' funerals she attended when she lived in that war zone? Vera hollered. Nobody in their right mind would suspect people like us of killing a hood rat. If anything, people will recall how this family tried to help Curtis improve his life by you and Kenneth giving him a job and making such a fuss over him in front of other employees. Now listen up. I think the sooner we get this done, the better. This coming Friday, I'm having my Botox treatment and a small blister removed from the back of my neck the following Monday, and I won't be in the mood to console Sarah. I'd like to do that on the weekend before, and get it over with. If she's still grieving Curtis's death longer than she should, she can cry on your shoulder, Bo. The Friday in question was two days from now. Shouldn't we wait until Kenneth leaves the hospital? Bo asked. It's bad enough we can't let the old goat in on our plan, but the least we can do is let him get his strength back. He'll need it when the time comes for him to placate Sarah after her lover boy gets what he's got coming. No, we can't wait. Kenneth might leave the hospital in a hearse. But if he's going to get well, when he hears the news that the gold-digging motherfucker that broke up his daughter's marriage got killed during a home invasion, it'll make him get well a lot quicker. Besides, we need to complete this project before Sarah bolts. Cash threw in. Project? These cold-blooded monsters had the nerve to call other people thugs and hood rats. And here they were, plotting to kill an innocent man and referring to their crime as a project? My ears were burning from what I'd heard so far. My head felt like it wanted to disintegrate. I was so stunned and angry that I wanted to kill somebody, and I was one of the good guys. If we don't, we'll have another mess on our hands getting her back into this house after her boo has been killed. Hell, she might even suspect us of being behind it. Bo guffawed. One more thing, Cash. Vera paused. I just want to remind you again not to let Colette know anything about this. She's got a mouth on her like a fishnet. I won't tell her nothing, Cash said hotly. For all I know, she could be messing around on me. I see the way she be eyeballing other dudes when we go out. 
If we pull this off with Curtis, then something might have to happen to the suckers Colette probably fooling around with. Let's stay on track now. We are not here to discuss Colette and her punks, Vera said calmly. We need to stay focused on Sarah. Now listen up. Shoot him in the head. That'll do the trick. In case Curtis's mama stays home from work Friday night and she's in the apartment, do her too. And a headshot for her too. That'd make it look even better. Competent thugs don't leave witnesses behind anyway. That's why only the incompetent thugs go to jail. The silence that followed for about ten seconds was excruciating. Cash broke it, speaking in a nervous voice. His mama? Oh, Lord, I don't know if I can kill an old woman. What if somebody else is there with him? I don't care if the Reverend Jesse Jackson is in the neighborhood on one of his brown-nosing, publicity-seeking visits. If he gets in the way, blow his ass to kingdom come, too. Don't leave behind any witnesses, period, Vera snarled. If we're going to do this thing, we might as well do it right. Shit. Okay. Vera, you pick up that gun from your contact tomorrow and the goodwill close, and it's on, Bo said. I can't wait to see that motherfucker's face when I blow his brains out. I didn't need to hear anything else. I wobbled up off the floor and padded back to my bedroom so I could organize my thoughts. I didn't know what to do next. I couldn't run downstairs and confront the people who were planning to kill the man I loved. And I certainly couldn't go to Daddy with this information or anybody else. I was back in bed when Bo entered our bedroom about 20 minutes later. He whistled as he undressed and got in bed. Still whistling, he nudged my shoulder and patted my butt, but I didn't respond. He stopped whistling. When he reached over and squeezed one of my breasts and then kissed me on the lips, I thought I'd vomit. It was pure torture, even being in the same room with the man who was planning to ruin my life. I didn't care how hard Bo tried to arouse me. I ignored him. He didn't try too hard or too long. He gave up 15 minutes later. He was snoring like a moose. I waited a few minutes more and then eased out of bed and went into the bathroom and had myself a good cry. I was up against a brick wall. Cash, Vera, and Bo were on one side, and Curtis and I were on the other. What was I supposed to do now? I couldn't prove what I had just heard, so I couldn't go to the cops. I knew enough about them to know they wouldn't do anything until a crime had been committed anyway. Warning Curtis by telling him everything I'd heard was out of the question. So was begging him to leave town. For one thing, he was not a coward. If the thugs who had been taunting him had not scared him off, he wouldn't leave town to avoid a confrontation with Bo and Cash. Knowing Curtis, he would be prepared for their attack with a gun of his own. As an ex-gangbanger, he'd grown up fighting battles with men a lot more vicious than Bo and Cash. If Curtis did get a gun to protect himself, there was no telling how this mess would turn out. If he killed Bo and Cash, even if they broke into his apartment, his life would never be the same. And mine wouldn't be either. I couldn't imagine how something like that would affect Daddy. My mind was spinning with all kinds of outrageous thoughts about how I could save Curtis. I even considered telling him I was pregnant with his baby and that we needed to run off somewhere together. That way, I wouldn't have to tell him about his pending murder. But no matter where we went, we'd never be happy if he knew what I knew. He would keep in touch with his clingy mama, and sooner or later, he'd tell her too much, and she'd blow the whistle on us. There was only one thing left for me to do. I'd be in Curtis's apartment when Bo and Curtis busted in to kill him. And since they couldn't leave any witnesses... They'd have to kill me, too. In death, Curtis and I could be together. 
I couldn't think of any other way to end this mess. Chapter 60 Vera When I called up Ricky the next morning, I didn't even have to tell him why I was calling. He answered the question I was going to ask him right away. Vera, I got you a gun like you asked me to, a Glock. It's real easy to use and nobody can trace it. It, uh, my contact told me it fell off a truck in Oakland, so it's never been registered. Good word. You will get a major bonus for this. There's only one thing about this gun. I couldn't get my hands on no silencer like you wanted. Oh, well, that's really not a big deal. I wasn't going to worry about a little thing like not having a silencer. The sound of gunfire wouldn't even phase those idiots in Curtis's neighborhood. Last Saturday, the news reported that three people on his block had died from gunshot wounds in three separate incidents on the same day. Several people had witnessed the shootings, but so far nobody had come forward and probably wouldn't. For once, I was glad that the people in the ghetto didn't like to talk to the cops. There was a strong possibility that even if somebody saw Bo and Cash lurking around Curtis's place, before and after the shooting, they still would not blab to the cops. Now that we had the gun, it was going to be smooth sailing from this point on. However, I still couldn't afford to get too sloppy by telling Ricky too much. Baby, I know you told me not to ask no questions, but in case you want to tell me more, I'm listening. You can stop listening. This does not concern you. You trusted me enough to ask me to get you a gun. Why can't you trust me enough to tell me what's going on? Even though I had convinced myself that killing Curtis and getting away with it was going to be as easy and simple as a walk in Golden Gate Park, I knew it was in my best interest to be careful who I discussed it with. Other than Bowen Cash, nobody else needed to know. Ricky certainly didn't. For all I knew, he could get into more trouble and cut a deal with the authorities by ratting me out. Don't ask any more questions, I said firmly. I'll see you in a bit. I hung up fast. I still had things to do to make sure this project went well. I had never committed a crime before, and I prayed that our getting rid of Curtis would be the first and last one. This involved more work than I had expected. I drove to Mission Street, one of the roughest, seediest areas in San Francisco. Hopeless-looking people in this predominantly Hispanic neighborhood meandered about like lost sheep, babbling in machine-gun Spanish and broken English. The smell of urine, vomit, stale rice, greasy tacos, and fried bananas seemed to be everywhere. I could smell it all, even though every window in my car was closed. I parked on the street and checked my purse to make sure my can of mace was easy to reach. It was a good thing I was paying attention, or I would have stepped into a pile of shit on the ground as soon as I stepped out of my car. I strolled down the street, walking with caution, like I was afraid I'd step on a crack or stumble upon another pile of shit. This part of town was just as filthy, primitive, and gloomy as the one that Curtis lived in, so I knew I wouldn't run into anybody I knew. I headed to a Goodwill store two blocks from where I'd parked. I had to step over two bums lying on the ground near the entrance. I shook my head. I couldn't believe that Sarah was willing to give up a life of luxury to move into a neighborhood with the same crap as this one. The people inside the Goodwill looked and smelled just as gruesome as the ones outside. I didn't want to spend any more time in a hole like this than I had to. I quickly picked up some tattered jeans, plaid shirts with patches on each elbow, and some black hooded sweatshirts for Bo and Cash. I couldn't find any beaten up old tennis shoes for them to wear at Goodwill, but I found some at another nearby thrift store. 
I had never purchased ski masks before in my life and wasn't sure where to find them. I checked in three different stores and didn't find any. Just as I was about to give up and have Bo and Cash wear a pair of my old stockings on their faces, I came across a sporting goods store that sold ski masks. I had no idea that planning a crime could be so complicated. That damn Sarah had caused me so much trouble, I was going to enjoy watching her mourn the death of her lover. About an hour after I'd left the mission district, I called the hospital to check on Kenneth. His nurse was giving him a bath, so I told her to let him know that I'd be coming to see him within the hour. When I arrived at the hospital, Kenneth was sitting up in bed. Boy, did he look bad. I'd just seen him the day before, and he'd looked bad then. But now he'd look like he had aged ten years. I was surprised that he was still alive. Hi, baby, I said, leaning over his bed. He didn't react when I kissed his forehead. He smelled like sweat and liniment. So kissing him was not a pleasant experience for me. Not that it ever was anyway. He also looked like he'd lost about ten pounds in the past week. His face looked drawn and emaciated, and as dry and tough as old leather. His eyes looked like two black holes that somebody had poked into his face. He hadn't shaved since he'd been admitted. His brittle whiskers irritated my face and smudged my makeup when I kissed him. I'm glad to see you looking so good, honey. Hello, Vera, he mumbled, looking at me like he was seeing me for the first time. I couldn't wait to get back here, baby. I'm so lonely, I lied, giving him one of my biggest smiles. Hmm, I bet. Kenneth reared his head back on his pillow and gave me a look that made me nervous. I was confident that he didn't know about me and Ricky or any of the other dozen or more boy toys I'd spent time with over the years. I'd always been discreet. Whenever I even thought that somebody was getting suspicious of my activities, I slowed down until the heat was off. That little issue with the fibroids and my outpatient surgery had been a blessing in disguise. Had that not happened, I may have gotten careless. Ricky had been pushing my buttons and licking my pussy so well, I'd been acting like a love-starved teenager, and I'd done a few stupid things. One night, when I thought I was in the house alone, that nosy-ass bitch Colette almost caught me giving Ricky some phone sex. And then there was a time that Bo noticed bite marks on my thigh when he and I both happened to show up at the gym at the same time. I was a lot more careful now. I'd never been busted before in my life because I was too slick, and I knew when to slow down. And anyway, if Bo Cash or Colette had proof of my affairs, I was not worried about them exposing me. They wouldn't dare. I was the one who had made it possible for them to live the lifestyle of the rich and famous. That's why I couldn't imagine why Kenneth had given me such a guarded look. What do you mean by that, honey? I asked. My heart was racing and my blood pressure was rising like a tide. Since I'd found out about Kenneth and his affair with Sarah's mother, he'd been too afraid to approach another woman. He knew how much he'd hurt me and had promised that he would spend the rest of his life making up for that. He didn't want to do, say, or even think about anything else that would hurt me again and jeopardize our marriage. With all of that in mind, I couldn't imagine him even thinking that I was cheating. However, I was still nervous. Don't worry about it, Vera, he responded, his eyes on mine. He had replaced the guarded look with a scowl. That made me even more nervous. Was he mad at me about something? I wondered. If so, what? Uh, everything and everybody is well, I told him, trying to sound upbeat, hoping it would cheer him up a bit. Bo's got everything under control at the store. Kenneth let out a loud rattle of a breath and blinked. How is my daughter? 
I was disappointed that he'd not asked me how I was doing, but I managed to give him a smile anyway. I had never known a man who got so giddy when it came to his daughter. You would have thought that heifer was the Queen of Sheba. Sarah? Oh, she's fine. Bo told me he's going to take her out to dinner this evening, but first he's going to bring her to see you. I pray to God she doesn't leave Bo. She broke down and told me she's in love with Curtis and is going to move in with him. I don't know if I believe her, though. The girl is going through a phase. She's depressed and confused. But I suspect she's got just a mild crush on Curtis because he came to her assistance in the parking lot the day she lost the baby. Kenneth began to talk so fast he had to slow down and catch his breath. I wish I could talk some sense into her head. He paused and shook his head. In all the years that I'd known this man, I'd never seen him look so hurt. I was glad that I wasn't the one who was causing him so much pain. So she's still at the house? Oh, yes. And to be honest with you, I don't believe she's going to do what she said. I had a little talk with her yesterday, and I think she's given it a lot of thought. I don't believe she's stupid enough to move from a palace to that flop house Curtis lives in. What if she does? She sounded real serious to me, Kenneth said, coughing. The longer I stood over his bed, the worse he looked. Now his lips were so dry they looked like metal. Sweat and dead skin had formed a necklace around his neck. Well, even if she does, I don't think she'll be gone too long, I declared. Kenneth nodded, so what I just said must have been what he wanted to hear. Once she sees just how bad off she'd be shacking up with that security guard, she'll come running back home so fast it'll make your head spin. Kenneth nodded again. I hope you're right. As long as Sarah hasn't carried out her threat to leave, there's still some hope. We just might get lucky and Curtis will be removed from our lives somehow. You mean one of the people he ratted out to the cops might finally kill him? Vera, that's not what I meant. I thought that maybe he'd meet another girl or move away to Detroit like he said his mama was talking about doing. Hmm. Moving away would be nice, but I don't think that's going to happen. At least not in time to keep Sarah from making a huge mistake. I honestly feel that Curtis's life is in danger. From what he told us at the dinner table, his name is on more than one hit list. I didn't think it would hurt to remind Kenneth about the danger Curtis faced every day. So when he got what he had coming, Kenneth wouldn't be surprised. Oh, I don't believe those guys are serious. The ones who threaten Curtis are probably just a bunch of teenagers trying to flex their muscles. Why do you think that? You know how dangerous that part of town is. And the young gangsters nowadays are even more dangerous than the OGs were back in the day, Kenneth. That's the point. If a real gangster wanted to get rid of somebody, they wouldn't put it off. Curtis isn't in hiding. So if somebody wanted him dead, they'd know where to find him, and he would have been dead long before now. I was glad to hear Kenneth chuckle. I just hope that Sarah will see how little Curtis has to offer her and what a potentially dangerous situation she'll be putting herself in. He paused and let out a great sigh. However, despite what he's done, I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to the boy. After all, he's, he's only a man, and his only crime is falling in love with Sarah. I hope nothing bad happens to him either, I said, sounding like I meant it. Kenneth closed his eyes. I took a deep breath, folded my arms, and remained silent. When he didn't open his eyes after several seconds had passed, I realized he had dozed off. I went to the window and looked out, wondering what 
things would be like if Sarah had not invaded our lives. One thing I knew for sure, I wouldn't be conspiring to have a man murdered. Five minutes later, when I returned to the side of the bed, Kenneth was snoring like an ox. Had he not been snoring, with his chest rising with each breath, I would have sworn that he was dead. It was almost over. I had a late lunch downtown at a popular Italian restaurant called Buca di Beppo on Howard Street. It was a cheap establishment with outlandish Italian decor and black and white poster-sized pictures of every Italian entertainer from Frank Sinatra to Sophia Loren on the walls. But the food was delicious, and so were some of the male servers. This was where I'd met my first boy toy many years ago, an Italian stallion named Mario. His dick was not that long, but it was as thick as a baseball bat. I had to dump him a year later when I found out he was swinging his baseball bat at gay men on a regular basis. After I'd gulped down three glasses of Chardonnay, a salad, and a lunch-sized pasta plate, I headed to the next stop on my itinerary, Bloomingdale's a few blocks away. The brisk walk helped me digest my lunch, and since I hadn't been to the gym all week, I needed the exercise. The clerks in the women's department, the makeup and perfume counter, and the purse and shoe department knew me well. This was one of my favorite stores. As soon as I entered the men's clothing department for the first time in my life, a grinning, slick-haired, hawk-nosed clerk who looked like somebody straight out of the Sopranos approached me. How can I help Madam today? The clerk asked, grinning so hard his teeth looked like they were trying to escape. I need to purchase a dark suit for my husband, I told him. Armani will do if you have something in stock in my husband's size. Very good, Armani. And will this suit be for a special occasion? Something like that. My husband is going to be buried in it, I said without hesitation. Chapter 61 Kenneth It amazed me how suddenly things could change. I had loved Vera with all my heart since the day I first laid eyes on her. I couldn't stand the sight of her now. It was hard to believe that she was the same woman I had loved so unconditionally for so many years. But the woman that I had loved had existed only in my eyes. The truth was, she was two different people. She had a dark side, and that was her true personality. One thing I knew for sure was that Ricky was not her first lover. I had no evidence but just based on what Tim had told me, I knew that cheating was something she was comfortable doing. The thought of her attending movies and going out to eat with that Ricky punk in public made my skin crawl. How stupid can a woman be? She obviously wasn't afraid that somebody who knew us would see her. I'd always believed that if a person was going to be unfaithful, do it right. Don't be seen out in public with your lover, especially in the city you live in. Don't run off at the mouth about your affairs to your friends. Be a smart cheater. Unfortunately, even smart cheaters like me still slip up and get caught anyway. Had I gotten Sarah's mother pregnant, Vera would have never known about that affair. It pleased me to know that she wasn't aware of all the others. The main thing that had eased the burden of my guilt was the fact that since I told Vera about Sarah's mother and me, I had not even looked at another woman. Vera must have decided to cheat on me to get back at me. It didn't matter now. All that did matter was that my wife was in a full-blown relationship with another man at a time when I needed her full attention the most. I was probably on my deathbed, and here she was, going out to dinner and movies 
with a lover young enough to be her grandson. I had no idea how long she'd been with this Ricky person or how much of my money she'd spent on him. And I didn't want to know. I knew all I needed to know. But there was much more. A few hours later, around five, Tim called me up. I know I've hit you with a lot lately. And I know you told me you had the information you needed. But I found out something else that you really need to know about, Tim told me. Is it about my wife? I'm afraid so. I'll come over in about an hour if you feel up to having a visitor. Not really, old man. I'm really tired, and I need to get some sleep. The truth of the matter was, I was feeling so rotten, it felt like any breath could be my last. I honestly didn't know if I'd still be alive an hour later. The only thing that kept me going was the fact that Sarah had just called me up and told me she'd be coming to see me in the morning. You can tell me over the phone. Your wife recently visited the neighborhood where your daughter's lover lives. She posed as some kind of promotions individual. What the hell did she do that for? I guess she figured it was the only way she could get the information on this Curtis Thompson for whatever reason she needs it for. Maybe she's putting together a dossier on the fella. One that would help her convince your daughter that this man is nothing but a loser and that she'd have a shit future with him. Anyway, she passed out several Walmart gift certificates and Curtis's neighbors told her everything she wanted to know. When she ran out of those documents, she bought one lucky fella a chicken dinner. Hmm, that's interesting, Tim. But it doesn't matter why Vera was gathering information on Curtis. Even if she succeeded in convincing Sarah to sever her relationship with him, that wouldn't help Vera. Her goose is already cooked. She's an even bigger whore than my daughter. I will deal with Vera when the time is right. In the meantime, I wonder why she would check up on Curtis and not tell me about it. I'm here to help you as much as I can, buddy. But I can't answer that question. I want you to keep an eye on Vera until I get up out of this hospital. The more dirt I have on her, the deeper the hole I can bury her in, and I'd like to throw a snake in behind her. There's just one more thing. What? At her request, her lover procured a gun for her. That piece of information felt like a brick going upside my head. The throbbing was so painful, I had to shake my head and rub it. A gun? A real gun? I didn't realize just how dumb my last question sounded until it had slid out of my mouth. As real and as deadly as they come, a Glock. Tim, you're a damn good man at what you do. How in the world did you find out about my wife getting a gun? Tim chuckled softly. Because I am damn good at what I do. But a good investigator never reveals his sources. Even though you and I are friends, I still have to remain professional, right? I will tell you this much, though. One of my associates is an expert hacker. She can access anything, phone lines, computers, even bank accounts. I had her tap into Ricky's home phone and use a recording device that can't be detected or traced. Unfortunately, by then, your wife had already initiated her request for a gun, so I don't have all. The details. Why would Vera need a gun? Now that I don't know. If you'd like to hear the recording, I'd be happy to oblige. No, I don't need to hear that right now. What else did they discuss? It was a brief conversation. Neither one of them mentioned names or what the gun will be used for. But something tells me we will find out soon enough. The device is still on Ricky's phone, so if they resume that particular conversation, I'll let you know. All I can tell you at this point is that your wife's lover has picked up a gun that your wife requested. She sounded very eager to get her hands on it, so she's probably picked it up by now. Vera hates guns. She's afraid of guns. That may be true, 
but apparently none of that stopped her from requesting one. If she needs a gun for protection, she could have come to me about that. I have an extensive gun collection, and she knows about it. Excuse me for saying this, but I doubt if she would want to use one of your guns for whatever it is she's planning. What makes you so sure of that? Well, for one thing, the gun she got is unregistered. Unregistered? Why in the world? I was so dumbfounded, I couldn't even finish my sentence. There's only one reason in the world I can think of. If a crime is committed with this particular firearm, it won't be traceable. I held a telephone in front of my face, and I looked at it. Mike Tim's words had just scorched my ear. A crime? I started talking again before the phone was even back up to my ear. Are you telling me that my wife is planning to commit a crime with a gun? I don't know what she's planning to do, but that would be a good guess. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, buddy. Damn! She couldn't be thinking about... Thinking about what? I've got to hurry and get up out of this hospital. My life has fallen apart all around me. Something I didn't want to think about stormed my mind. Vera's been looking depressed lately. Real depressed. Lord, I hope that woman's not thinking about ending at all. Suicide? You think she's depressed enough to consider something that extreme? Tim snorted. No way, my man. If your wife is considering taking her own life, she wouldn't care if the gun was registered or not. And from what I know about women, especially elegant, vain women like your bride, they like to take themselves out in style. Typically, they slip into their favorite negligee and overdose on sleeping pills. Or they loop nooses around their dainty necks. They wouldn't want to be remembered as a bloody, mangled mess. Not even in death. Therefore, they don't go for guns, knives, jumping in front of trains, or diving off the Golden Gate Bridge. But let's not jump to conclusions. For all we know, Vera could have requested that weapon for someone else to use. I had not expected the disturbing news that Tim had just delivered. But I had a feeling that news even worse than this was in the making. Thanks, Tim. I've heard enough for now. You can expect a nice bonus from me for this one. I'm glad you want me to keep an eye on your wife, especially now that we know about the gun. Tim, I know all I want to know. Are you sure you don't want to know what she's planning to do with that gun? Well, tell me now. Can you think of anybody your wife would want to do harm? Not really. I sucked on my teeth and gave Tim's question a little more consideration. Now that you ask, she dislikes a few people, my daughter's lover especially. But as long as I've known Vera, she's never even heard a fly. I don't think she hates Curtis enough to shoot him. Dude, there's a first time for everything. Yeah, I know there is. Tim, I'm feeling like hell right now, so I really need to get off this phone. Call me again tomorrow morning and I'll let you know what to do next. I had no idea that this would be my last conversation with Tim. Chapter 62, Sarah The next morning, I got up earlier than usual. Everybody else was still in bed when I left the house. Last night, after Bo had been asleep for a couple of hours, I tiptoed into the bathroom with my cell phone and dialed Curtis's number. He didn't answer, so I left him a voicemail. Curtis, as soon as you get my message, call me on my cell phone. I'm going to leave it on all night. If it's not convenient for me to talk when you call me back, I'll pretend you've called the wrong number, and then I'll call you back as soon as I can. I told him. It's really important. I wanted to add, it's a matter of life and death, but there was no need for me to tell him that. He'd find that out soon enough. It was Thursday. He had one more day to live, and so did I. 
Knowing that my time was running out, I was determined to do everything I needed to do. My bucket list was so short, I had only one item on it. And that was, I had to see my daddy one last time. Before I went to the hospital, I cruised around the city, looking at some of my favorite spots. I drove to the graffiti-covered apartment building where I had lived with my mother until she got married and dumped me on Grandma Lily. The building had not changed at all. Several generations of bitter-looking people still occupied the porches, the balconies, and the street in front of it. As usual, most of them were drinking beer and hard liquor straight out of cans, bottles, and mayonnaise jars. Discarded furniture, dog shit, and other litter covered various sections of the ground like an ugly, unfinished patchwork quilt. Next, I drove to the building where I had lived with Grandma Lily. I was pleasantly surprised to see that the owner had at least painted it from a dull shade of gray to a light blue. I didn't see any of my old friends, and that saddened me. Had there been more time, I would have tracked down some of my former homegirls. I knew they would have appreciated inheriting my designer outfits, my top-of-the-line electronics, and my Jaguar. I would have even greased their palms with a few thousand dollars, but in a way, it was a good thing I didn't have time to do any of that. People would have started asking me questions as to why I was giving my stuff away, and I wouldn't have been able to tell them. But there was another reason why I was glad I didn't have a lot of time left. I was afraid that if I really thought about what I was going to do, I'd change my mind, and I didn't want to back out now. With Curtis dead, my life would not be worth living. I didn't realize how long I had been driving around, until I glanced at my gas gauge and saw that I was almost empty. By the time I gassed up my car and stopped for a cup of coffee at a Starbucks across the street from the gas station, it was almost ten. Before I finished my coffee, I called Daddy's hospital room. I wanted to come see you this morning, I told him as soon as he answered. Do you feel like having company? I'd love to see you, honey, but I'm not doing too well right now. I had a really rough night. Oh? They tell me I had a mild stroke a couple of hours ago. They hadn't even noticed something else was wrong until they had poked and prodded me for a while. You had a stroke? I'm definitely coming over there. I'm fine now, sugar. If you do come today, wait at least a couple of hours. By then, they'll have finished running a few tests and poking and prodding me some more. As a matter of fact, I doubt if they'll let you in if you come now anyway. Daddy, I'm family. I don't know much about hospital rules, but I think you need to have a family member present in case, in case your situation gets worse. I don't want you to die alone. I immediately regretted my last sentence. I didn't mean that, I said quickly. For a woman who had only one more day to live, I didn't understand why it was so important to me now what I said about death. Honey, I know you didn't mean that, and that's not going to happen. Daddy snorted. He suddenly sounded like he was as strong as a bull. I told Vera the same thing a little while ago when she called. Oh? What else did she say? Not much. I told her the same thing I told you. Call me or come see me later in the day, like around noon or so. All right, Daddy. I hung up and ordered another cup of coffee, this one to go. I was just about to leave when my cell phone rang. It was Curtis. I'm sorry I'm just getting back to you, honey. My mama and one of her friends went to one of those Indian casinos near Sacramento and had car trouble. I had to go pick them up. You know what a rat trap I drive. By the time I got up there, it had conked out and had to be towed. I had to call around to find somebody to come pick us up. I just got home a few minutes ago. I'm so glad you called. I was going crazy, I said in a shaky voice. 
I guess you know I got fired for coming in late too often. Had that been the real reason, everybody else would have been fired by now. Bo didn't say anything about you and me, but everybody at the store knows. You know how Cash and Colette like to spread gossip. Anyway, Bo gave me my pink slip, and he had two other security guards escort me off the premises. They even checked my backpack to make sure I wasn't walking out of there with any unpaid-for merchandise. I'm not surprised he fired you, but I'm surprised he hasn't done it before now. Besides, the way things have been going, you would have had to quit soon anyway. I sighed. Things have been so tense in our house lately, I can barely breathe. I didn't realize until now just how sick and tired I am of everybody I live with trying to control me, including my daddy. Well, you won't have to put up with that too much longer. You know I won't try to control you. I'm going to treat you like an equal partner, not like a child like everybody else has been doing. When will you be moving out? Uh, real soon. I've already packed up some of my stuff. My buddy downstairs has a truck. Oh, I don't need a truck. I'm only bringing some of my clothes, and I can fit them in my car. Besides, I don't think you should be coming over here with a truck to help me move. That would be pretty stupid. Well, we've done some pretty stupid shit already. I know that. Uh, I want to come see you tomorrow night. That's cool. What time are you coming? I'll come after your mama leaves for work. She is going to work tomorrow night, right? She is as far as I know. Listen, I've been meaning to talk to you about her. My mama knows everything about us. I know you think she's not the friendliest person in the world, but she is pretty cool. Once you get to know her, you'll see what I mean. Curtis laughed. And by the way, the same buddy downstairs with the truck... He manages that body shop I've been doing piece work for now and then. He's going to let me work full time, starting next week. That's nice, honey. And Mama said she could help you get on at that warehouse where she works. You don't have to work if you don't want to, though. But if we want to get our own place eventually and in a much better neighborhood, we'll both have to be bringing in some money. Mama's got her a new man friend, and I have a feeling she's anxious for me to leave so she can move into his place with him. Curtis laughed again. I'll come over around eight tomorrow night. Do you want me to bring something? A six-pack of Miller Lite and some smothered chicken from that place on Harrison Street like you brought the last time. I hope you can stay more than a few hours this time. I will be staying a lot longer than a few hours, I said. I had to force myself not to cry. Chapter 63 Vera Bo entered my bedroom without knocking, but I didn't mind. He only did that when he had something important to tell me or ask me. Well, it's official, he started. He paused and began to pound his fist repeatedly into the palm of his other hand. Sarah just told me with a straight face that she's leaving me for Curtis. He then turned with his fist poised to pound the wall facing my bed, but he didn't. He told me that when Gladys told him she was leaving him for another man, he punched a hole in their bedroom wall. I made Bo promise me that day he'd never do something that childish in my house. I'm sorry, he said in a small voice. I almost forgot where I was. Then he smiled. How did you react when Sarah told you she was leaving you? I called her a few choice names, and I raised my hand to slap her, but I didn't took a few deep breaths, and told her we'd talk about it tonight when I come home. I also told her I wouldn't be home until around ten or so. Curtis will be dead by then, or he should be. Uh-huh, he will. Before I left my bedroom, 
I called the hospital to see how Kenneth was doing. Vera, I'm doing just fine, he told me. He sounded tired and impatient, and I didn't really want to prolong the call anyway. I'm praying for you every hour on the hour, baby, I said in my sweetest voice. You keep doing that. Kenneth hung up before I could say another word. I knew that he belonged in the hospital and that he was on all kinds of medication. But it had affected his behavior in the strangest way. His whole personality had changed. He had never talked to me the way he'd been talking to me lately. I told myself that it was nothing to worry about. After all, he was a confused and elderly man, so he didn't know any better. However, something in the back of my mind kept nagging at me. Tim Larkin, the private investigator. Had Kenneth hired him to check up on me? I wondered. I didn't want to believe that he had. I'd been so careful, so Kenneth had no reason to think I was doing anything inappropriate with another man. And with Kenneth being so close to death's door, what good would it do for him to find out about Ricky and me now? At the end of the day, as long as I ended up with a few million dollars and stayed out of jail, it was all good. I took a quick shower, got dressed, and pranced downstairs to the kitchen for breakfast, where everybody except Sarah was already at the table enjoying Delia's homemade pancakes. As soon as I approached the breakfast table, everybody stopped talking. I knew that Bo and Cash hadn't told Colette anything about what we were planning to do, but I was still paranoid, especially when she gave me one of her sly looks like she was doing now. What do you have planned for today, Vera? she asked. I noticed how she nudged Cash with her elbow as she stared at me, blinking like a damn night creature. I cleared my throat and gave her one of my most annoyed looks. Other than a hair appointment this afternoon, I don't have anything planned. Why do you ask? You've been real jumpy these last few days, Colette noticed. I wanted to slap that smirk off her face. The woman's husband is in critical condition. If it was me in that hospital bed, you'd be jumpy too, Cash said. For him to be such a nitwit, he occasionally said something smart. Then he turned to me and said one of the stupidest things he ever said. Cuz, did you rent that car? I stopped breathing for a few seconds. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Bo give Cash a look that was so full of contempt, I was surprised Cash didn't turn to stone. What car? Bo asked. Yeah, what car? With all of the vehicles here, why would Vera need to rent one? Colette wanted to know. I thought I heard you telling Kenneth over the phone this morning that your car was acting up and you were going to rent one for the weekend. Cash replied, his tongue snapping clumsily over each word. You heard wrong, I said casually. I sat down in the chair directly across from Bo. There's not a thing wrong with my car. I looked up at Bo, and he must have read my mind. I think my fan belt needs to be tightened up. Can you give me a ride to the store after you eat, Vera? Bo said, winking. Why can't you ride with Cash and me? Colette asked, wiping bits of poached egg off her lips and chin at the same time. We're all going to the same place, but we won't be leaving for at least an hour, though. Bo looked at his watch and frowned. I can't wait that long. Then he looked at me, still frowning. Some buyers from a couple of high schools are coming by this morning. That's a whole lot of computer sales. I need to be there in case they show up early. He rose, not taking his eyes off of me. I was glad the frown was no longer on his face, but now he looked nervous. Oh, uh, yeah, let me get my keys. I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought, so I'll nibble on something later. 
as soon as I drove out of our garage, with Bo in the passenger seat. I turned my head just enough to look at the side of his face. I don't think it's a good idea for me to rent that car now. How are we supposed to get to Curtis's place and back tonight? On the bus? Or should we take a cab and have some sharp-ass cabbie finger us? Calm down, cuz, I replied, my eyes back on the road in front of me. I'll have Cash tell Colette he has to work late, so she'll have to get one of her co-workers to give her a ride home drive his SUV, and park it a few blocks away from Curtis's place. Or I'll think of something else. If I have to drive you guys over there, I will. I can't rent a car now. I don't trust Colette. She doesn't miss much. If she even thought we were involved, she'll remember a detail like me renting a car on the same day of the crime. And as dumb as Cash is, I don't think we should trust him too much either now. I agree with you on that. Bo slapped the dashboard with the palm of his hand. I wish we hadn't even involved him in our plans. I wish we hadn't either. But up until that stupid comment he made at the table, he was pretty cool. He knows too much now, and if we change our plans, things could fall apart and we might have to postpone our project for a while. I stopped for a red light and turned to Bo again, this time with a pleading look on my face. We can't put it off any longer. We have to get this thing done tonight. Yeah, I know. Sarah's already packed some of her stuff, Bo snarled. If we don't do what we need to do before she moves out, there's no telling what she'll do if she's already moved out after Curtis and her daddy are dead. As long as she's still in the house, we can maintain some level of control. And her daddy is our ace in the hole. If he gets well, heaven forbid, we'll put more pressure on him to talk some sense into her head. If he succeeds in turning her around, she'll behave the way a good wife should, the way she did before she got involved with Curtis. I don't think Kenneth is coming home this time. Thing is, we need to move before Sarah bolts and before Big Daddy goes to meet his maker, Bo said. That little stroke he had last night pushed him a little bit closer. I hope you're getting yourself ready for the lavish funeral you'll have to throw for a prominent big shot like him. I am. I still hated funerals, and I wanted to get Kenneth's over with as soon as possible so I could go on with my life. And at least I was sending him away in style. The Armani suit that I had purchased for him to be buried in was on a hanger in one of my walk-in closets, hidden behind my evening wear. I planned to pick out his casket in a day or so. I had also begun to plan a three-week cruise to the Caribbean for myself and Ricky as part of his payment for helping me out with the gun, and as a way for me to celebrate Curtis's departure, not to mention Kenneth's. But I couldn't finalize my travel arrangements until Kenneth had taken his last breath. I was still looking at Bo. I didn't realize the light had turned green until the motorist behind me blew his horn. I stepped on the gas and resumed the conversation at the same time. Uh, what I will do is drop you and Cash off a couple of blocks from Curtis's place. Then I'll go back home. Sarah will be my alibi. I'll make sure of that. Vera, believe me, nobody will suspect us so we don't really need any alibis, Bo insisted, especially a woman like you. I know, but we can't take anything for granted and get sloppy. So just in case somebody does suspect a woman like me, I want to be accounted for during the time that this, uh, incident takes place. When the cops can't find out who killed Curtis, Sarah just might get the notion in her head that you had something to do with it. She'll recall how mad you got when she told you about him and her and how soon Curtis got killed after that confrontation. Well, the cops won't be able to prove a damn thing, Bo yelled, slapping the dashboard again. I'm just worried about cash. You don't need to be. I'm going to sit his ass down and have a real long talk with him. 
I will tell him in no uncertain terms that if he ever mentions the situation again in any way, he's going to be out of a job and a place to live. And he just might end up in jail holding the bag by himself. Nobody would believe him if he tried to bring us down with him. I was so excited, I didn't notice the next red light in time, and I shot straight through it, thankful that no other cars were close enough to crash into mine. Bo and I panicked at the same time. Once again, he slapped the dashboard. I'm sorry, I hollered. I'll be glad when this is over. I'm going crazy. Just keep your cool, Bo said in a gentle voice. Vera, I just want to thank you for looking out for me. I wouldn't be able to take care of this Curtis problem without you coaching me all the way and getting me that gun. I'm even more grateful to you, and I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. No problem at all, honey. I've had your back since we were kids. I wasn't going to let you get hurt by another woman again, I told him. After this is over and Curtis is six feet under, we won't ever mention it again. I think the sooner we put this mess behind us, the faster you and Sarah can work things out and start your family. I still think that a baby will keep us in the loop forever, especially if something happens to Sarah, too, one of these days. We remained silent until I drove into the parking lot at the store. I'll find an excuse to come by the office this afternoon. I'll drop off the clothes you and Cash need to wear tonight. The gun, too, I told Bo. Thanks again. Bo gave me a quick smile, and then he squeezed my hand. Tomorrow, everything will all be over, and I'll have my wife back to myself. I nodded. You sure will, I agreed. Chapter 64, Sarah it was ten minutes to two that Friday afternoon when I arrived at the hospital. Normally, the cold, antiseptic smell associated with the hospital, the sight of sick people wandering in and out of their rooms, and a grim-faced priest clutching a Bible bothered me. It all reminded me of death. But none of that bothered me this time. I guess it was because this was going to be my last day on earth. I felt numb and detached as I entered Daddy's room. I ignored Vera, hovering over the bed, looking down at Daddy with a blank expression on her face. As soon as she saw me, she suddenly got as animated as a cartoon character. Oh, Sarah, I'm so glad you're here, she sniffed. I couldn't believe she could stand here and say such a thing to me with a straight face. I continued to ignore Vera. When she attempted to hug me, I brushed past her and went over to the bed and grabbed my father's clammy hand. I love you, Daddy, and I'm sorry about everything that's happened. I said, tears flooding my eyes. Everything is going to be all right, Kenneth. Vera cooed. I hated when she used that fake-ass tone of voice. She had become so shallow. I could see through her with my eyes closed. She touched Daddy's shoulder. When you come home, we'll take a nice long vacation. All of us, Cash and Colette included. Uh-huh, I managed. We haven't been to the Caribbean in a while. Maybe we should go there. I had heard the bitch on the telephone yesterday talking to her travel agent. She had already made plans for a cruise for herself and a person she had only identified as a friend. Who the hell was this mysterious friend? I wondered. She had no reason to refer to my daddy as a friend. Now that I knew she was planning a murder, I figured she was capable of doing just about anything. But since I was not going to be around to deal with her after today, I didn't care what she was up to. If she was going to have Curtis killed, 
what would she do to daddy? As much as I loved my daddy, there was only so much I could do to protect him. It was too late anyway. I was not going to let Curtis die alone. But daddy was not stupid. And I didn't think that Vera was stupid enough to do anything to him. I could see her getting away with Curtis's murder, but I honestly didn't think she'd get away with killing my daddy. He had too much money and too many friends in high places for that to happen. The telephone rang, and I answered it. It was Daddy's friend, the private investigator Tim Larkin. Hi, Tim. I'll tell my daddy to call you back when my stepmother and I leave, I said. Hmm, I hope he's doing better. He's about the same. I'm sure he'll be happy to talk to you. That's fine. Just let him know I'll call him later so we can discuss that, uh, issue. He'll know what it's about, Tim said. I will, Tim. Vera wasted no time getting nosy. Her face looked like it was about to crack. Her lips started to move even before she got the first word out. As soon as I placed the telephone back into its cradle, she said, I don't mean to be nosy, but was that Tim Larkin? Uh-huh, Daddy's investigator friend, I replied. I noticed how Vera flinched. I guess he wants to keep up with what's going on with Kenneth's condition. She was trying to smile, but it didn't hide the frightened look on her face now. Is that why he called? I hunched my shoulders and shook my head. He said something about an issue they had already discussed. Why? I'm just curious, that's all. The longer I stayed in the room with Vera, the sicker I felt. It didn't look like she was leaving any time soon. Since this was the last time I'd see my daddy, I didn't care. I wasn't going to leave until I was good and ready. Vera kept glancing at her watch. About 20 minutes later, she suddenly remembered she had a hair appointment. I'll probably grab a bite to eat after I leave the beauty shop, and then I'll swing back by here before I go home, she said. Sarah, I'll see you at the house around seven or so. I don't think so. I was planning to go to the movies tonight, I told her. Oh? She flinched again. Maybe I'll go with you. Uh, I'm going with a girl I went to school with. Oh, she said again. Well, I'll see you when I see you, I guess. I guess you will, I sneered. She gave me a funny look before she left. What was that all about? Daddy asked. Nothing, I sniffed, and then rearranged Daddy's pillows. Daddy, I'll always be with you, even when I'm not. You sure are talking out the side of your mouth today. Is there something you want to talk to me about? I shook my head. No, Daddy. We discussed a few mundane subjects, and every time he steered the conversation back to me, I steered it to another mundane subject. It was after 4 o'clock p.m. when I gave Daddy one last hug and told him I loved him. I kissed his cheek and told him goodbye. Then I cried all the way to the hospital parking lot. As I was leaving, Vera was returning. She didn't notice me, and I did nothing to get her attention. When I got home, I went to my room and looked at some pictures of me as a toddler clinging to my mother's legs, me as a teenager with my grandmother, and me with a bunch of various friends. Then I looked at the pictures I'd taken with Daddy and Bo. I had come such a long way, and I didn't have one single picture of myself with Curtis. But it didn't matter now. We'd spend eternity together, and that would be worth more than a few pictures. I picked up the beer at the first liquor store I came to and the smothered chicken. 
I arrived at Curtis's place a few minutes before eight. A few minutes after nine, we heard heavy footsteps approaching. I froze, but Curtis didn't even react. He was used to people running up and down the hallway outside. When somebody banged on his door, he set his beer down on the scarred coffee table and looked at me with an annoyed look on his face. Who the hell could that be? He chuckled. I hope it ain't that Donaldson woman begging for another beer. He attempted to rise, and I grabbed his arm. What's the matter, baby? Curtis, I love you, I whispered. I'll always love you. I know. His door didn't have a peephole, so Curtis couldn't see who was outside. Who is it? He shouted. Before he could say anything else, somebody kicked the door and it flew open. Two men who stormed into the apartment had on ski masks and dark clothes, but I knew who they were. And as soon as they saw me, it was nothing but chaos. Sarah! Bo yelled. A gun was in his hand, and his hand was shaking like a leaf. Oh, God, no! What the fuck is this? Curtis boomed, looking from me to Bo and back. What's going on, Sarah? I couldn't say a word, and I couldn't take my eyes off that gun in Bo's hand. Oh, shit! Cash hollered. He lifted his mask and stared at me with his mouth open. Girl, you in the wrong place. Then he turned to Bo, who was just standing there looking at me. Bo's ski mask was still covering his face, but it didn't hide the tears rolling out of his eyes. He raised the gun and aimed it at my head. Sarah, I'm sorry. He croaked. Curtis lunged at Bo. There was a lot of cussing and yelling, and all four of us were swinging our arms. The gun went off, and Curtis hit the ground. Then it went off again. I didn't feel a thing. When I hit the ground, everything went black. Chapter 65 Vera I had tried to reach Bo and Cash all evening, but neither one answered his office telephone or cell phone. I wanted them to know that Sarah had plans to go out so she wouldn't be my alibi. Under the circumstances, all I could do now was sit back and wait. I glanced at my watch every few minutes for the next hour. Finally, at exactly 10.45 p.m., Colette flew into my bedroom like a bat out of hell. Vera, you will not believe what I just heard on the news. She sprinted over to the bed where I lay my head propped up on three pillows, waving her arms like she was going crazy. Somebody shot that Curtis, shot him in the head. It was hard for me to remain calm, but I wanted to leap up off the bed and dance a jig. I was so happy to hear that Bo had done exactly what I told him to do. Do they know who did it? I asked, forcing myself to look concerned. The news said it looked like a botched home invasion, but I have a feeling it was probably some of those dudes that's been threatening Curtis, Colette yelled, still waving her arms. And the worst thing, I interrupted Colette. The worst thing is that crimes like that happen over there all the time. I'm surprised they'd have a TV news break about it, though. Curtis is not anybody important. He's just another low life with a lot of enemies. I shook my head and began to fan my face with my hand. I was so excited my face felt like it was on fire. Vera, let me finish. Colette moved closer to the bed. There was a woman with him, and they shot her too. They shot some woman too? He lives with his mama, so it must have been her. Yeah, they shot a woman, too, but it wasn't his mama. The news said something about it being the daughter of a prominent businessman. They couldn't give her name out until her family's been notified. Lord, I hope it wasn't Sarah. That girl got on my last nerve, but I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to her. Kenneth will never get over it. 
Sarah told me she was going to the movies with one of her friends. I whimpered. My head felt like somebody had stuffed it with rocks. I knew it had to be Sarah that Bo had shot. Well, I hope that's where she went, but I got a bad feeling that that it's her. I better try to find Bo, I muttered. I got up and started pacing back and forth like a caged lion. Yeah, and I guess I need to locate Cash. I don't know about you, but I need a highball, Colette said. She was talking so fast, she almost lost her breath. We both need to calm our nerves until we find out what's going on. You want me to fix you a drink too, Vera? God, yes, and make mine a very strong double. Just as Colette and I made it downstairs to the living room, Bo and Cash entered. I was glad to see that they had changed from their thug clothes back into their regular clothes. I was also glad to see that they looked as normal and calm as usual. Oh, I'm so glad you're both here, I yelled, running up to Bo, throwing my arms around his waist. Colette just heard on the news that Curtis got shot. Bo and Cash looked at each other, then back to me. No shit, Cash said in a hoarse voice. I guess those dudes over there meant business. Being a snitch will surely get you killed. Poor Curtis. Oh, he's not dead, Colette hollered from behind the bar. What? Didn't you tell me the news report said he was shot in the head? I asked Colette. Yeah, I did tell you that. But you didn't give me time to tell you everything they said on the news. Curtis and the woman with him were shot, but they're both still alive. Colette trotted from behind the bar without the drinks. Bo, Sarah's not home. She's supposed to be at the movies. But the news said the woman who got shot is the daughter of a prominent businessman, do you think it was her? Bo and Cash looked at each other, and then at me again. I had never seen either one of them look so frightened before. Now they looked like they had just seen their own ghost. But I was even more frightened than they were. If Bo shot Sarah, and she was still alive, she would be able to identify him and Cash. Let's not jump to conclusions. Sarah may have gone to the movies with her friend and then decided to stay out a little later, I said hopefully. But the look on Bo's face said it all. He had shot Sarah, too. Uh, Bo, don't you get too upset. There is no need for us to assume anything until we hear from Sarah. Cash, where you been all evening? I've been trying to get in touch with you for hours, Colette said. We had some real important work to finish up at the store that Kenneth had started, Cash rasped. Then me and Bo went by that little Irish pub downtown on Front Street and had a few drinks, didn't we, Bo? Yeah, Bo mumbled. He looked like he wanted to sink into the floor. What pub? Harrington's is the only Irish pub I know of on Front Street, Colette said. Yeah, that's the one, Cash said quickly. A puzzled look appeared on Colette's face. Since when did you two start going to a place full of white folks? They make some mean Irish coffee, Cash said quickly. The best in town. I couldn't believe Cash could come up with such a flimsy alibi. If they claimed they were in a lily-white bar like Harrington's, everybody would remember them if they had really been there. Lord, I hope we didn't need an alibi. Bo, will you go into the kitchen and get us all something cold to drink? I gave him the sternest look I could manage. I put a few bottles of beer in the refrigerator a few hours ago, and they should be nice and cold by now. Bo gave me a strange look. Since Colette's eyes were on cash, I was able to give Bo the conspiratorial look that told him I needed to talk to him in private. 
Yeah, um, I'd love a cold beer. He stammered with that strange look still on his face. He left the room immediately, headed toward the kitchen. Baby, I just told Vera that I never wanted anything bad to happen to Curtis. If he had left Sarah alone, that would have been enough for me, Colette said, pulling Cash to the couch. He moved like a robot. If she hadn't grabbed his hand and steered him, I think he would have continued to stand in the same spot with a blank expression on his face the rest of the night. While Colette was busy paying attention to Cash, I eased out of the room and headed toward the kitchen. Bo was standing in front of the refrigerator with his hand on the door handle, looking like he was about to faint. You shot Kenneth's daughter? I asked in a whisper. You told me not to leave any witnesses behind, goddammit. You stupid fool, you! I hissed. I didn't tell you to kill my husband's only child. I was so distraught I wanted to kill Bo with my bare hands. What the hell have you gotten yourself into? Correction. Bo shook a finger in my face. What the hell have we gotten ourselves into? Your ass is as deep into this mess as mine. Maybe even deeper because this was your idea. I wrung my hands and gritted my teeth. It's a good thing you wore that mask. Bo gave me a bug-eyed look and shook his head. You didn't wear the mask? He shook his head again. Do you mean to tell me they saw your face? My mask got knocked off during the scuffle. Cash got so confused when he realized Sarah was there, he took off his mask before everything got crazy. The news reported that they're still alive. Why didn't you check to make sure they were dead? I was sick of Bo shaking his head, but he did it again. I could hear folks outside in the hallway, so I panicked. We didn't have time to check their pulses or listen to their hearts, but I aimed for their heads like you told me to. If they didn't die on the spot, they would die soon if they haven't croaked already. Shit, shit, shit. Did you make it look like a robbery? Did you take anything? We didn't have time to look for something to steal. But like we said, with all the enemies after Curtis, the cops will think it was a retaliation thing. I held my hand up and snapped my fingers. We just have to stay cool. And we need to find out if they both died. And if one of them talked before they did. What if one or both of them lives long enough to tell what happened? Don't say that. Don't even think it. I... I don't know what we'd do if one of them talks. I feel like horseshit. Damn, 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 Bo shouted. I, I, when I realized Sarah was there and I had to shoot her too, my mind snapped. I couldn't even think straight at the time. All I knew was we had to get the hell up out that place. Oh, this is a worse mess. I folded my arms and glared at Bo. If, if you shot them in the head in the right spot, they have to be dead. And before I could finish my sentence, Colette burst into the kitchen with a wild-eyed look on her face. The cops are here, she announced. Chapter 66 Sarah when I opened my eyes, a heavy-set Asian doctor with thick white hair was looking down at me. Most of my body felt fine, but the left side of my head felt like somebody had bashed it in with a brick. Good morning. You look a lot better than you did when they brought you two nights ago, and I'm happy to say that you're going to be all right. My head hurts, I mumbled, sitting up. I was so tired and weak I could barely move. It took me a few seconds to realize I was in a hospital bed and there was an IV tube attached to my right arm. I can't hear out of my left ear, I reported. I touched my ear, which had a bandage on it, and it tingled. You were shot, 
The thick, stone-filled earrings you had on saved your life. The bullet ricocheted off of it and only pierced your earlobe. You were very lucky. I don't know about that. I sure don't feel lucky, I muttered. The doctor, whose name tag identified him as Dr. Louis Choi, nodded. You may have some minor problems with hearing for a few days, but other than that, you're going to be good as new. Did Curtis Thompson get shot too, Dr. Choi? I asked. He responded with a weak nod. I looked Dr. Choi in the eyes and said, My husband did this to me, Bohannon Harper. His cousin Cash Booker was with him when he did it. I remember them kicking in my boyfriend's front door and coming into the apartment with a gun. And my stepmother was in on the whole thing. She was the ringleader. They planned to commit murder days ago. I overheard them with my own ears. Call the police so I can tell them everything I know. Dr. Choi gave me a sympathetic look. Ma'am, all three of the perpetrators are in custody, and they've all confessed. What? Oh, my God. I moaned. I wanted to cry, but couldn't. I didn't know what to do now. My life will never be the same again. Just knowing that three people I had lived with for years and had some feelings for were willing to kill a man and me and anybody else who'd been with him was almost more than I could stand. That was bad enough. But the fact that I had known about the crime before it happened and chose to let them do it said a lot about me. Bo, Cash, and Vera not having any regard for human life except their own was one thing. They were heartless monsters. But with me not warning Curtis and then choosing to sacrifice my own life, was the same true of me? Had I lost my way so severely that I no longer had any regard for human life either? Had I died, my poor daddy would have been devastated. You're a healthy and strong young woman. Take life one day at a time. I'll refer you to a good therapist, and after a few sessions, you'll be just fine. Yeah, I'll get over this, but it's going to kill my daddy— Bad news like this is going to be real hard on him, I muttered. I didn't like the sad look on the doctor's face. He's been so sick lately, he's in the hospital too. Does he know about what happened to me? Uh, Mrs. Harper, I am so sorry. What? Tell me. Dr. Choi moaned like a sick man himself. He removed his horn-rimmed glasses and massaged his forehead. When he looked at me again, he shook his head and took a deep breath. I knew that whatever he had to tell me was bad, so I braced myself. I took a deep breath, too. Ma'am, I hate to tell you this, but the sooner you know, the better. You are Kenneth Lomax's daughter. Unfortunately, you no longer have a close relative available to tell you this, but your father didn't make it. Dr. Choi gently patted my arm. When he got the news about what had happened to you... The doctor paused. For a second, I thought he was going to cry. That's how sad he looked. The news was too much for him. He immediately suffered a massive heart attack. We did all we could. My daddy's dead, I mumbled. My daddy's dead! I couldn't hold back my tears any longer. Dr. Choi handed me a tissue. Before I knew it, I was crying and shaking so hard, I wanted to die more than ever now. I was glad that I had visited daddy before I went to Curtis's place to meet my fate. At least I got to say goodbye to him, but I never thought that he'd be the one to die. I stopped crying and blew into the tissue. After taking a few deep breaths, I was able to speak again. I was supposed to die with Curtis. 
I overheard them talking about how they were going to kill him and leave no witnesses. I loved him, and I was going to leave my husband to be with him. I went to Curtis's place because I wanted to die with him. That was the only way we were going to be able to be together. I said, staring at the wall. With all due respect, ma'am, that part of this tragedy is none of my business. But whatever you and Mr. Thompson decide to do now, I wish you all the best. I turned sharply to look at Dr. Choi. Is Curtis really going to make it? Can we be together after all? Yes, he is going to make it, but he's in critical condition. Can I see him? Only relatives are allowed to see him. How is he doing? Is he going to be all right? Mr. Thompson will live, but I predict that he will have some problems in the future. I'd rather not say any more about his condition at this time. Now you get some rest. How in the world could I rest, knowing that Curtis was in the same hospital in critical condition and my daddy was dead? I rested for about an hour. After a nurse with cold hands gave me a sponge bath, I called the hospital operator to get Curtis's room number. I was pleased to hear that he was on the same floor I was on, just four rooms down on the opposite side of the hall. I sat up and carefully removed the IV cord from my arm. I didn't know if I was causing myself any physical harm or not, but under the circumstances, I didn't care if I lived or died. I scrambled out of the bed and didn't bother to try locating my street clothes. It dawned on me that they were probably covered in blood anyway, so even if I had them in the room, I couldn't wear them. I snatched a hospital robe off the hook behind the door and put it on. I was lightheaded, and my legs were kind of wobbly, but I managed to make it to Curtis's room in a couple of minutes. As soon as I got inside, I regretted what I had done. First of all, he looked worse than I expected. They had shaved off all the hair on one side of his head, and a bandage covered his left eye. His other eye was closed, so I assumed he was either in a coma or asleep. A scowling middle-aged black woman with a frizzy wig sitting sideways on her head occupied a chair by the side of the bed. I had never met Curtis's mother before, but I knew that was who she was. I'm, I'm Sarah Harper, I stammered. I know who you is. You Kenneth Lomax's daughter. Mrs. Thompson snarled, folding her arms. You the reason my boy got shot up. I remained by the door in case she got so hostile I had to bolt from the room. She looked like she wanted to wring my neck. Ma'am, I'm so sorry about what happened, but I love your son, and he loves me. I wanted to spend my last moments on earth with him. That's why I was there that night. Mrs. Thompson's jaw dropped, and she gave me an incredulous look. So you knew what was going to go down, huh? Something like that. I had heard my stepmother and my husband plotting to kill Curtis, but there was nothing I could do to stop them, and I figured that if I told Curtis, it would make the situation worse. So you let them niggas shoot my child? You must not have loved him that much. As far as I'm concerned, you just as guilty as the rest of them devils, and your black ass ought to be up in that jailhouse right with their asses. If the police don't arrest you for something, I'm going to hire me a smart-ass Jew lawyer and sue the shit out of your rich ass. What's done is done, and I can't change it. I didn't care if this woman was Curtis's mama or not. I was not going to let her bully me. You can stop talking that shit right now. Right after I stopped talking, Curtis opened his right eye. It was severely bloodshot. A black shadow had formed a ring around it that looked like a bull's eye. He looked at his mother first then at me. From the grimace on his face, I could tell he was still in pain. But he managed a smile anyway. 
Hello, baby, Mrs. Thompson said. She stood up and leaned over the bed. You look better today than you did the other night when they brought you in. Mrs. Thompson had attractive features, and without that scowl on her face now, she was almost pretty. But as soon as I got closer to the bed, she got ugly again. Her evil-looking black eyes glared at me. Her thick lips quivered as she balled up her fists. For a moment, I was afraid that she was going to punch me in the nose. You ain't supposed to be in this room no how, Miss Girl. You ain't even no relative, she yelled. Mama, please, Curtis managed with a weak cough. He shook for a few seconds like he was having a spasm. Then he looked at me with his eye fluttering and pooled with tears. Sarah, you can let your husband know that when I get up out of this hospital, his butt is mine. He told me with a tortured laugh and another cough. Son, you ain't got to worry about that motherfucker. He'll be doing some hard time. Mrs. Thompson shouted with glee, glaring at me some more. And I hope you don't be fool enough to waste any more of your time with this woman. Mama, this is the woman I love, Curtis declared. I was surprised he was able to speak in a much stronger voice this time. If she still wants me, I'm going to be with her. He turned to me with such an endearing look on his face, it made me feel more loved than I'd ever felt before in my life. I love you too, baby. And everything is going to be all right for us now. I assured him. I know it is. He agreed. Chapter 67 Vera The minute they locked that cell door behind me, I regretted every wrong thing I had ever done in my life. Even little things like cheating on a test in high school and sneaking into the movies through a side door so I wouldn't have to pay when I was a teenager. My mother had frequently told me that God don't like ugly, and every time I had heard those words, I'd laughed. I'd laughed because I'd convinced myself that I was too slick to get caught doing anything wrong. Nothing could have prepared me for the mess I'd gotten myself into now, and there was no way out of it. Everything had happened so fast that night, but it was a poorly laid out plan from the beginning. Cash had driven his SUV and parked six blocks from Curtis's building. He and Bo had walked the rest of the way. Wearing the shabby clothes I'd picked up for them, they probably looked just as much like a couple of middle-aged punks as the real ones. I checked out Curtis's unit the same day that I'd visited his neighborhood to gather information about him from his neighbors. His place was exactly what I had expected, dreary and at the end of a long, dark, musty-smelling hallway on the fourth floor. The door to the stairwell was right across the hall from the door to his apartment. I had told Bo and Cash to get off on the floor below Curtis's and then take the stairs up to his floor. I had made it clear to them that they were not to put on their masks until just before they bolted out of the stairwell. After they had accomplished their mission, they were supposed to leave by the stairwell. I had briefed them one last time that afternoon when I made a quick stop at the store and ushered them into one of the storerooms. As soon as you duck back into the stairwell, put the masks and the gun in a plastic bag. Take the stairs all the way to the ground floor. When you exit the building, don't do anything to attract attention. If somebody says something to one of you, ignore them, I said, looking from Bo to Cash. They looked like a couple of scared rabbits, and for a brief moment, I had second thoughts about going through with this crime. But I ignored that thought. We had come too far to back out now. Do not run. Walk back to the car. Bring the plastic bags with the gun and masks to me, and I will dispose of them. I just hope none of them punks over there jump us before we can even get up in that place, 
Cash said. Or after we get back out of the building, Bo added, nervously raking his fingers through his hair. I rolled my eyes in exasperation and gave them an impatient, dismissive wave. Well, if that happens, use a gun on them too, and then run like hell, I snapped. But I wouldn't worry about any of that happening. This job should be as easy as a walk in the park. Curtis won't know what hit him. But Curtis hadn't been an easy target. After Bo and Cash had arrived at his place and kicked in his door, there was a fierce struggle, and Bo dropped his wallet. During the struggle, somebody had inadvertently kicked the wallet under the couch. Bo didn't know he'd dropped it until it was too late. The cops found it, and that was why they had shown up at the house shortly after Bo and Cash had made it back home. From that point on, things fell apart like a straw house in a hurricane. Bo still had the gun in his pocket, and my fingerprints were on it, too. The plastic bag with the ski masks, with Curtis's blood on them, had been found on the floor of Cash's SUV. To this day, I ask myself how I could have been stupid enough to initiate such a serious crime with two stooges like Bo and Cash. And those stooges had left no stone unturned when they made their confessions. They threw my ass under the bus with both hands. I had admitted to the cops that I'd been foolish to orchestrate such a heinous crime. But I tried desperately to minimize my involvement by falling back on the I've been having senior moments lately defense. Women my age do a lot of irrational things. I pointed out, waving my hands and shaking like a lunatic in front of law enforcement officials who had already made up their minds about me. I had even tried to claim that a hormonal imbalance had affected my actions. Unfortunately, that had only made me look even more foolish. The bottom line was, I was going to be held accountable for my actions no matter what. Bo and Cash had been easy to manipulate and it had been their downfall. But for me, plain old greed had destroyed me. My lawyer, Monty Klein, advised me to plead no contest to avoid a nasty trial and possibly get more time if a jury found me guilty. I eagerly took his advice. I was facing some serious jail time, and that was bad enough. But my standing in the community and my reputation were dead in the water, too. For the first time in my life, I regretted not having a support system of my own. I had avoided people who had attempted to cultivate friendships with me. Kenneth's friends had become my friends by default, but under the circumstances, I didn't expect a single one of them to offer me their support. And none of them did. Not even the few women I'd associated with who had probably had way more sinister tendencies than I. However, two days after my arrest, I got a brief visit from Shirley Biddle, the woman I'd given one of my former lovers to as a Christmas gift a few years ago. She had worn dark glasses and a hat pulled down over her head when she came to see me. All she'd had to say was, I'm sorry you're in the mess you're in, but please don't tell anybody anything about me and that boy you gave me or any of my other romantic activities. I don't want to end up losing everything I've worked so hard for. Shirley's desertion didn't even faze me. I was already depressed beyond belief. Despite the hot water I was in, I had at least one cushion to fall back onto. I had a substantial amount of money in my bank account to use until I got whatever Kenneth had left for me in his will. I thought that would make my grim situation a little easier to deal with. My bail was high, but I had enough in my account to cover that and a place to stay when I bailed myself out. I knew I couldn't return to the mansion, so I needed a place to stay until they sentenced me. I'd been behind bars for 12 days, and that was 12 days too many. Just being let out of that dank cell to meet with my attorney in the visiting area was like a breath of fresh air. 
I was going to get myself out of this mess no matter what. If things looked too bad for me, after I'd bailed myself out, I'd bolt. I'd use the rest of my money to relocate to a country that didn't have an extradition treaty with the United States. I was wrong. That plan wasn't even going to get off the ground. Despite the fact that this was the most serious situation I'd ever had to face, I was able to smile at Monty. He didn't smile back. Instead, he gave me a profound look of pity and didn't hesitate to tell me why. What he told me next made my head spin like a top. I hate to tell you this, Vera, but Curtis Thompson has retained an attorney. He'll be filing a massive civil lawsuit against you, and you need to know now that his attorney is a very aggressive one who has never lost a case. Monty could barely look me in the eye as he spoke. Your stepdaughter has canceled all of the credit cards and frozen all of her father's bank accounts. She's the only one who can access them. And I really hate to tell you this, but the personal bank account you opened in your name a few years ago, the court has frozen it pending the lawsuit. What do you mean, frozen? That's my money, I yelled. It's not a joint account with Kenneth or connected to his business. How can the court do that? For the record, it's not just the court. You never filed taxes to report the interest on this account. That interest is considered income. One thing I've learned is that you don't want your name to be added to Uncle Sam's shit list when it comes to money. Some folks get away with it. Some don't. But your name is all over the news these days, and Uncle Sam has eyes and ears everywhere, especially in the banks. I have a client sitting in federal prison right now because he went for years without filing. Just like you. Even if the court releases the freeze, which will only happen if Mr. Thompson stops the lawsuit, Uncle Sam will refreeze it until he gets his piece of the pie. And I'm sure you know how slowly their wheels turn with penalties, fees for late payment, and possibly a charge against you for income tax evasion. It could take years before this issue is resolved. And let's pray that the state doesn't jump on the bandwagon, too. The state? You didn't report your interest income to the state, either. So I'm getting fucked in the ass, huh? Oh, I wouldn't use wording like that. However, you might. I didn't even let Monty finish his sentence. Shit! After all the plotting and planning and scheming I had done to stash away a small fortune of Kenneth's money, it had backfired. What about Kenneth's will? I know he left me something. Monty gave me a pitiful look. I knew what was coming next was bad by the way he shook his head and sighed. Yes, he did. I'll get to the will momentarily, but uh, I'm afraid you're not going to benefit much. Why the hell not? Kenneth's not the one that got shot. He died of natural causes, and I'm still his wife, and in this state, what's his is half mine. I don't expect to get any of the money he had before he met me, but he made millions more after we got married, and I want my share. I was groping for words and trying not to scream my head off. I was too afraid to ask the one question that had almost burned a hole in my brain. Had Kenneth modified his will so that I would get less than I deserved? Well, as long as I got a comfortable amount of money, I'd be somewhat satisfied. The prenup I signed states that I will receive limited funds if Kenneth and I get divorced. And what about his life insurance policy? Yes, Mr. Lomax had a sizable insurance policy as well, Monty said with a gentle sigh. And another $3 million to go to his beneficiary. And I'm the beneficiary. That and the money he left me in his will. I want it. I need it. Monty shook his head again. I'll get to the insurance in a minute. 
but let's discuss another item first. He paused and pulled a three-page document out of his briefcase. He gave me a sad look as he cleared his throat and looked at the document. This is a copy of your prenuptial agreement with your signature. Did you read it before you signed? He asked, waving it in my face. Well, most of it. After I read the part about me getting some money, I just skimmed the rest. But you signed it. Yes, I signed it, damn it. You have the damn thing in your hand and you can see that I signed it. You should have read the whole thing. Your signature confirms that you accepted the terms of this agreement as stated. Such as, despite this being a community property state, you gave up your rights to half of Kenneth's earnings by signing. Do you mean to tell me I'm getting screwed because I didn't read some damn fine print? There was no fine print, Mrs. Lomax. Would you like to go over the prenup you signed? Monty waved that damn prenup in my face again. By now, it was as disgusting as used toilet paper. I shook my head. No. I replied in a very small voice. My heart was beating so hard, I was surprised I was still conscious. The only thing that kept me breathing was the fact that Monty had told me I would still get some money. I was going to need it whenever I got out of jail. If they sentenced me to only seven or eight years, I'd be in my seventies by then. And even if I still looked good, even I didn't think I'd be able to snag another rich husband. Now about the insurance. My heart was beating so hard I could hear it. I was on the edge of my seat, holding my breath, waiting for Monty to continue. Vera, I hate to tell you this, but your husband had recently modified his insurance policy, Monty said. The look on his face told me he had something else to say that I wasn't going to like. Maybe I was going to have to split the three million with that bitch-ass Sarah. All I wanted to know was how much I'd get. I didn't even have to ask him my next question. Monty answered it right away. Kenneth's daughter is the sole beneficiary. I won't get any of it? Monty shook his head. Shit! I covered my face with my hands and sobbed for about a minute. Then I blinked back my tears, wiped my eyes with the back of my hand, and continued. Okay, I said, with a sigh of defeat. I guess I have to be happy with just whatever he left me in his will. I put up with him for a lot of years, so I hope he took that under consideration. You said he left me something but that I wouldn't benefit much. What did he leave me? Was it the mansion, the cabin, or the Davis Street condo? Just a couple million bucks? I was frantic. I'd never felt so alone and helpless in my life. And please don't tell me the court is going to freeze that too. Not exactly. Monty paused. For an excruciatingly long moment, I thought he was going to laugh because of the way his lips were quivering. He cleared his throat and scratched his neck. I couldn't imagine why he was squirming in his seat when I was the one getting screwed. Your late husband left you two dollars. He clearly indicated only enough to cover the bus fare for you to visit Ricky Tate, your current lover. It would have been more if there had been a fair increase at the time of Mr. Lomax's passing. But as of today, the bus fare on the local city bus is $2. If somebody had cracked open my head with a sledgehammer, I wouldn't have felt more pain. My brain felt like it was trying to bust out of my skull. What? He knew about my affair with Ricky? The investigator he had hired was very thorough. I'm so sorry. He had me followed. That son of a bitch!
I hissed. I let out a loud breath and looked at Monty. You orchestrated a very serious crime in which your late husband's only child was almost murdered, and you've admitted your guilt. Even if your husband had left you more than, uh, the two dollars, his daughter and his attorneys and the court probably would have prevented you from profiting from that, too. I can't believe what's happening to me. I, I feel so alone. My own sisters hadn't even come to see me yet, nor had any of my lovers, and I had a feeling none of them would. My head wasn't the only thing spinning now. It seemed like the whole room was. I was so dizzy I was seeing double. Thank you for all your help, Monty, I mumbled, blinking hard at the two images of my lawyer sitting across from me. If it's any consolation, I won't be charging you for my services. Kenneth was a dear friend of mine, and it's the least I can do in his memory. Now, is there anything else you'd like to discuss today? Monty asked. He slid the prenuptial agreement back into his briefcase and snapped it shut before I could even respond. I shook my head. I'll be in touch, he said quickly glancing at his watch. Then he waved to the husky female guard to escort me back to my cell. I didn't even realize I was crying until I felt the salty tears sliding down the sides of my face and onto my lips. Epilogue, Sarah, six weeks later. Curtis was released from the hospital yesterday, the same day that Obama won the election for the second time. I was ecstatic about both. My man was going to live as normal a life as possible for a person with one eye. His mother made a big fuss when he moved into the Davis Street condo I'd inherited, the same one that my daddy had moved me and my grandmother into when he started taking care of us. But after a few weeks, when Mrs. Thompson realized that her ranting and raving was only causing more tension between her and Curtis, she gradually accepted me. I just hope you make my boy happy, she told me, eagerly lapping up the wine I had just handed her. You being rich and all? You'll be able to help me out a little, too, I hope. Mrs. Thompson, you won't ever have to worry about money again, I assured her, and neither will Curtis. My daddy had left me everything, all of his millions, his business, and every piece of property he owned. I sold the mansion right away. It held too many bad memories for me, and I knew that Curtis would not have been willing to live in it. I didn't know the first thing about running a business, but Daddy had a lot of competent, trustworthy advisors on his payroll. They had all assured me that they would keep things afloat. So with their help and Curtis doing the same job that Bo had done, I knew everything was going to be just fine. Vera, the mastermind of this stupid crime that had affected so many people, had been sent to a women's facility near Vacaville. The press described it as a glorified dollhouse, a retired model who had fed her husband a fatal dose of jello laced with antifreeze resided in the same prison. 
And from what I had seen on a TV report about that place, the inmates walked around smiling and all made up like they had just come from a beauty parlor. Vera would be right at home. And it was going to be home to her for a minimum of 12 years. Daddy's faithful servants, Delia and her meek husband, Costa, worked for me now. Delia did the cooking and cleaning, and Costa drove us around when we didn't feel like driving. Curtis's mother loved being chauffeured to her bingo games and her favorite thrift shops two or three times a week. She lived with her new boyfriend now, but she visited us several times a week. Once I got to know her, she didn't seem so mean. I had purchased a two-bedroom unit for my servants in the same building, directly below the one Curtis and I occupied. Delia went to visit Vera yesterday, and I didn't have a problem with that. She was the kind of person who would never turn her back on someone who had been as nice to her as Vera. The report Delia gave to me when she got back to the condo was very bleak. Senora Lomax, she is so very sad— Jesus must be weeping, Delia told me, wiping her tears with the tail of her apron. I had just joined her in the kitchen where she was preparing dinner, barbecued ribs and baked beans. I must pray for her. She looks like strange woman, hair no longer pretty blonde, but with gray roots now and stringy like one of my mops. She don't do nothing to make herself look good no more. And other than me and Costa, nobody else visits her so far. Not the young boyfriend who tell police she make him get her the gun or even her family. She in a very deep hole now. Ay caramba. Yes, Vera was in a very deep hole now. One she dug herself. I was so sorry that I couldn't cover her up in that hole with horse manure. And except for the two dollars my daddy left her in his will, she was broke too. Everything she owned of value, including her jewelry and wardrobe and the new Mercedes she'd purchased a week before the shooting, would be sold. The proceeds would be held in a special account until Curtis settled his lawsuit against her. There was no need for me to sue her too, since Curtis's lawyer was going to pick her clean enough for me. All Bo and Cash had were a few thousand dollars in the bank, but Curtis decided to be a nice guy and not go after them, too. But since Bo's SUV was in my daddy's name, I sold it and all of Bo's possessions and donated the money to the church I used to go to. Vera's possessions are in storage, pending the outcome of the civil lawsuit. A lot of people said that Cash was the lucky one, because he had received the lightest sentence. Because Bo had been the aggressor in the attack, the district attorney had only charged Cash with being an accessory and criminal conspiracy, one of the same charges Bo and Vera got hit with. He had a huge fine to pay, some community service to perform, and an eight-year sentence in a maximum security facility a few miles west of Sacramento. I was sure that Cash didn't feel like the lucky one. In addition to the conspiracy charge, they charged Bo with attempted murder, aggravated assault, and home invasion. He received a sentence of 12 to 16 years in Corcoran, the same prison that housed the mass murderer Charles Manson. As far as I was able to determine, Colette had nothing to do with the conspiracy, and I was surprised that she didn't even call to check on me or visit me in the hospital. When I returned to the house after the hospital released me, she had packed up everything she owned and fled. I heard from the girl who used to braid her hair that she was somewhere in Mexico using an alias. I will be using a different name myself in a few months. As soon as my divorce from Bo is finalized, I will become Mrs. Sarah Thompson. I hope to be Curtis's wife until the day I die. By natural causes, I hope. Our first child will be born next year in August. If it's a boy, I'm going to name him after my daddy. The End 
You've been listening to Family of Lies by Mary Monroe, narrated by Patricia R. Floyd as the voice of Vera, Ezra Knight as Kenneth, and Lisa Smith as Sarah. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Never Say Never by Victoria Christopher Murray, narrated by Amanda Lee Cobb and Karen Pittman. When Miriam's fireman husband, Chauncey, dies while rescuing students from a school fire, Miriam feels like her life is over. How is she going to raise her three children all by herself? How will she survive without the love of her life? Luckily, Miriam's sister friend Emily and Emily's husband Jamal are there to comfort her. Jamal and Chauncey grew up together and were best friends. Jamal and Emily know they will do all they can to support Miriam through her grief. Jamal steps in and helps Miriam with the funeral arrangements and with her children. Plus, he gives her hope that she has a future. But all the time that they spend together, grieving, sharing, and reminiscing, brings the two closer in ways they never planned. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.